All right, good morning, everyone. It is 9.01, we will call this meeting to order. We would ask that folks in attendance please rise if you are both willing and able for the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. The invocation will be given by Pastor Jeff Gagnon of the Chapel Hill United Methodist Church. Pastor, thank you for being here. House member Holhausel, you're on deck. Tyler, can we just roll to the Pledge of Allegiance? All right. Um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Madam Clerk. Approval of the minutes of regular meeting on March 22nd, 2022. As of you remember, I had a chance to review the minutes, and if so, is there a discussion on the minutes? If there is no discussion on the minutes, then I will make a motion to accept the minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members will cast their vote. Having received seven yay votes, that motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Proclamations, Child Abuse Prevention Month. You are here to receive the proclamation for the Child Abuse Prevention Month. Please make your way to the front. Proclamation of the City of Wichita, Kansas, founded in 1870. Whereas, we can build healthier, safer, and thriving communities if we take the same approach to raising families that we do to tending a community garden on a shared piece of land. And whereas, children are locally grown and have the right to be safe and to be provided an opportunity to thrive, learn, and grow. And whereas, Hope and commitment are powerful fertilizers that strengthen and support Kansas families, thus preventing the far-reaching effects of, mal of maltreatment, providing the opportunity for children to develop healthy, trusting family bonds. And whereas, we must come together as partners to nurture, heal, and grow together because prevention happens in partnership. And whereas, by growing a better tomorrow for all children, together we can ensure that Kansas children will grow to their full potential as the next generation of leaders, helping to secure the future of the state and the nation. 
And now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Brandon Whipple, mayor of the city of Wichita, Kansas, along with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim April 2022 as Child Prevention Month. Thank you, Mayor Whipple. Okay, I'm um, Vicki Roper. I'm the Prevent Child Abuse Kansas Director at the Kansas Children's Service League. We're the Prevent Child Abuse America chapter here in Kansas. And I also chair the Wichita Coalition for Child Abuse Prevention. Um, it's a coalition of 60 member agencies who have been in place since 2008 when Wichita experienced a large cluster of child abuse fatalities. Um, we had eight fatalities that year. Um, the city came together and, and really helped us. They gave us some leadership out of, um, out of the police department, Tom Stoltz, and even um, Gene Hogan out of DCF to start that coalition. And our mission became to empower um, organizations across Wichita to come together around child abuse prevention. So if you are here from any of those member agencies, please stand up. So thank you for your leadership and your support. So you can see we have DCF here today and the Child Advocacy Center, the Nonprofit Chamber of Service and Kansas Children's Service League. Did I miss anybody? Okay, so thank you for your leadership. So thank you for signing um, the Child Abuse Prevention Month proclamation this morning. Um, although we know that child abuse um, prevention happens year round, April is sort of a special opportunity to focus on some of the programs and policies and prevention that we know works in this community. The theme of this year's um, April 2022 Child Abuse Prevention Month is a national theme, and it's growing a better tomorrow for all children together, which you probably caught in the proclamation. Throughout Cat Month, we're using that community garden metaphor to reinforce the message that every day we help children and families thrive. So children and families are our greatest natural resource, the best time to plant, um, seeds of support for all children is now. Um, every family needs support sometimes, and adversity is not our destiny. We can build resilience. So you all have packets that have been given to you, um, and they contain information about this year's um, child abuse prevention campaign, a lapel pin, which we hope you'll wear, um, throughout April and beyond, and then a pinwheel. And the pinwheels stand for um, playfulness, joy, and childhoods, and um, they're our symbol, national symbol for prevention. We want to also thank Wichita because City Hall lights are lighting up blue um, during the month of April, and um, many private households and other businesses are I'm turning on blue lights as well. We've got pinwheel gardens that you should see popping up all over the community and across the state. And we are hosting a training a day. Um, I think we're up to 40 now, Melissa. Um, the Child Advocacy Center of Sedgwick County and Kansas Children's Service League um, are combining on that. And they both have all that information on their websites for you to be able to take advantage of. We're going to be talking about Connections Matter, which is kind of one of the latest things in our field. So we're learning how important connections are to building resilience. We'll be talking about resilience, child sexual abuse prevention, and shaken baby syndrome prevention. Um, all of those have become important topics as, we, as we've looked at the data from our child abuse fatalities that have happened um, here in Wichita. And speaking of that, um, Wichita was featured, Wichita Champions for Children, um, after we presented to the National Commission to Eliminate Child Abuse Fatalities as the prevention 
model for the country <laughs> um, in the final report of that um, national commission. Okay, this is um, the third year that Catmanth has um, fallen in the pandemic. And um, what we've learned is we're probably going to move forward a little bit hybrid as we're navigating variants um, with both virtual and in-person events um, with our families and the community. And then we also know that um, the risk to our children during the pandemic has been extremely high as parents and caregivers have lost jobs, they've lost income, they've been experiencing incredible stress. Child care has become a huge need, um, and you know, also teach, learning to teach remotely from home, food insecurity, um, physical distancing has led to unintended consequences of isolation. And so we invite you to support um, expanding family-friendly um, work policies, particularly child care. Child care is the heavy lift. And our um, work group will be here next month to talk to you about that. So please join us on social media this month using the hashtag Growing Better Together. Thank you. On a point of personal privilege, the chair recognizes uh, the presence of the Honorable Senator Aletha Pascado. Thank you for being here, Senator. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Week of the Young Child. If you're here to receive the proclamation for the Week of the Young Child, please uh, come forward. Proclamation of the City of Wichita, Kansas, founded in 1870. Whereas, the Week of the Young Child's purpose is to focus public attention on the needs of young children, their families, and to recognize the early childhood programs and the professionals that meet the needs of children who attend these programs. Whereas, the first five years of a child's life are the period of the most rapid brain development and lays the foundation for all future learning. Children need skilled, educated, competent, and consistent early childhood educators and foster to foster their development. Whereas, high quality early education, early childhood education depends on high quality early childhood educators who ensure that children will support, with support from their families, have the early experiences they need for a strong foundation. Whereas, High quality early childhood programs provide important benefits to children, families, and, other, and our community. In 2021, Wichita and Cedric County had over 600 programs for children birth to five, serving over 13,000 children. Those programs are supported by early childhood professionals who make an impact on the children, the families, and the community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Brandon Whipple, mayor of the city of Wichita, Kansas, along with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim April 4th through the 8th, 2022, as Week of the Young Child in the city of Wichita, Kansas, and declare that early childhood educators should be valued and respected for the important roles that they play in the lives of children in our community. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jillian Hofer. I am the director of the Wichita State Child Development Center and also um, a representative of the Early Childhood Directors Organization and the Early Childhood Professionals Organization here in Wichita. This is my colleague, Janelle Dean. Um, we would just like to thank everyone on behalf of all the organizations, centers, and in homes within and around Sedgwick County um, for this recognition. Uh, we have one of the most crucial jobs in our society. Uh, these professionals lay the foundation for which all other learning is built and upon which schoolhouses sit. 
It's one of the most important times of a child's life because their brains grow at a rapid rate the most between birth and age five. We help to mold young minds and hearts of your future neighbors, spouses, coworkers, and bosses. Our work is of the utmost importance, and we truly are grateful for everyone in the city of Wichita for recognizing the hard work that goes into shaping these children. It's not an easy job, and it's not an easy task, and these professionals work hard at it every single day, um, so it's a great recognition to be had. Thank you. Madam Clerk. National Library Week. For those are, who are here to receive the proclamation for National Library Week, please make your way to the front. You want to get on us, Sean? <laughs> Proclamation of the City of Wichita, Kansas, founded in 1870. Whereas libraries are accessible and inclusive places that foster a sense of connection and build community. Whereas libraries connect people to technology, providing access to broadband internet, computers, and training that are critical for accessing education and employment opportunities. Whereas libraries offer opportunities for everyone to connect with new ideas and become their best selves through access to multimedia content, programs, and classes in addition to books. Whereas libraries strive to develop and maintain programs and collections that are as diverse as the populations they serve to ensure equal access for all. Whereas libraries have a long served as trusted and treasured institutions for all members of the community, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or social economic status. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Brandon Whipple, mayor of the city of Wichita, Kansas, along with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim April 3rd through the 9th, 2022, as National Library Week in the city of Wichita, Kansas, and encourage all residents to connect with the Wichita Public Library by visiting online or in person to access resources and services. Thank you, Mayor Whipple. This year's National Library Week is Connect With Your Library. It's aimed at promoting the idea that libraries are places that connect you to technology by using broadband, computers, and many other resources. Libraries also offer opportunities to connect with media, programs, ideas, facts, classes, in addition to reading for pleasure. Most importantly, libraries also connect community members to each other. At the Wichita Public Library, we create a welcoming and inclusive environment for everybody. The library offers a variety of programs to explore different topics and current events. Through our new Library of Things initiative, we have the absolute pleasure of bringing out-of-the-box materials for customers to borrow and experience like telescopes and radon detectors, and now some early learning backpacks um, that can be checked out. Our always growing collection of books, movies, e-books, e-magazines, and audiobooks reflect the interests of you, our community. And you can also stream some thoughtfully curated slate of movies and documentaries with a new product called Canopy. If you haven't visited your Wichita Public Library in a while, I encourage you to come by um, any of our seven locations throughout the city and we will get you your free library card so you can connect with the world around you. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk. Awards, International Institute of Municipal Clerks Award, Jamie Buster. Jamie, you here. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you make your way to the front? Thank you. 
So I really don't ha have much to say except that uh, Jamie is an amazing employee and someone that we can always count on when it comes to uh, getting information we need or, or performing the task as clerk. Definitely uh, well uh, deserved, and it's from the in International Institute of Municipal Clerks. It's a master's or master municipal clerk upon Jamie Buster. So Jamie. I just want to thank management for um, believing in their employees and allowing for continued education and um, advancement of their careers. And um, there are only 28 MMCs in the state of Kansas. You have two of them here. Mm -hmm. And there are just under 1,400 worldwide. So thank you very much. Madam Clerk. ICMA Performance Management Award. You're here to receive the award for the International City slash County Management Association. Please make way to the front. The budget team. So the plaque reads, the International City County Management Association, this certificate of distinction is presented to the city of Wichita, Kansas, for exemplifying the standards established by the International City slash County Management Association and the appreciation of performance data to local government management, including training, verification, public reporting, planning, and decision-making, networking, and accountability, presented in conjunction with the 107th ICMA annual conference from October 2021. Um, hi, my name is Elizabeth Goldtree. I work in the finance department as the budget officer. Um, we've been involved in the ICMA program since 2009. Um, we could not collect all of this data and earn this award without all the involvement and the participation from departments. I see a lot of you here that are involved in collecting and verifying data every year. Um, I think this was an especially important program for us to have in place and have such a strong program um, when reviewing and collecting data for 2000 and 2001 as well. So I'm really glad that we had that baseline. Um, it's been a tumultuous two years um, for providing services to the community, and I'm grateful that we're able to make those comparisons and move forward. Thank you very much. All right, Madam Clerk. Public Agenda, Heather Gordon, Issues with Section 8 Housing. Rolling into the public agenda is Ms. Heather Gordon here. If not, then we will go on to the Next person on the list, Madam Clerk. Alan Trenary, Community Involvement and Neighborhood Associations. All right, good morning and welcome. As you're making your way to the front, we will ask folks who might be new uh, during public, um, public comments. Uh, the goal is to listen uh, to the person who is presenting. Um, we, as a body, uh, won't interrupt or uh, really even answer questions during your five minutes because those five minutes are yours. Uh, and with that, we ask that folks uh, in the audience also be respectful of the speaker. Um, and by doing so, no auditory uh, comments or, or clapping or, or, or that type of nature so that the speaker feels comfortable getting uh, the information that they wish to uh, get to us uh, across. So with that, you have five minutes. If you go a little over five minutes, um, I'll let you finish your thought, but we ask people to be respectful of the time. Uh, so with that, sir, the floor is yours. 
Okay, well, last week you had Claire here, Claire Willenberg, uh, gave her a reward for working on the Fresh Air Baby Camp. She's the president and leader of my neighborhood association. I walk around and deliver these newsletters that Claire puts together every month, and it's a very rewarding thing to be able to be connected to your neighborhood, to be able to know your neighbors and have your neighbors know who you are. Uh, you know, this guy's a little bit better than that. Give it up. Because I won't. Cause I had dual citizenship between Colorado and Kansas growing up because my grandparents lived here with me. And I just can't begin to express how much this community means to me how much Colorado means to me, how much our nation and the people that I live with mean to me. It's, you know, it's very, you get what you give. It's an important thing to remember that the way you re interact and care for each other comes right back on you. you know, I, my grandfather always used to tell me that when you go like this, that three pointing right back at you. So you need to think about it throwing around, they said he should kind of stuff like that because it's usually just a reflection of your insecurities. <clears throat> like I said, I really enjoy being involved with my neighborhood, being involved with the people that are around me and just, it's important. To me. I, I came back here to look after my mother who's got COPD and emphysema. And dealing with her and the people that she takes her classes with, you know, it really is important for us all to remember that you get what you give. Be nice and people will be nice back to you. Now I'm kind of rambling and a little concerned about the pet crematorium. I work with friends of feral felines and help gather up the feral cats and take them over to the facility where they provide the spay and neutering and trying to keep it from turning into where we have to put the animals down and they have to be incinerated. It's just so disturbing. But as I said, we, we are each other. You know, we need to appreciate the gifts that we have and the gifts that we have really are the community and what we can do for our community. And I've just really come to appreciate it. Come to appreciate the time and the space that we all take up in order to, and then we've got this situation that's going on. I went to the Soviet Union when I was 14 years old, and it just breaks my heart to see what's happening. It's just, went with the, my Russian teacher was uh, Tom Tancredo's wife. I became Tom Tancredo's wife. Tom Tancredo was my brother's sixth grade homeroom teacher in Colorado. And the politically adept people around here will know who Tom Tancredo is. Again, I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for the ability to be able to get up here and speak to you and for you know, just having the ability to be involved in this community. This community is a great place. My grandparents lived up on 2424 Stopper Street, Benjamin Hills, a very short one block, block and a half section. It's the only street named that in the whole city. It's by grace of God, I was given the 
opportunity to be able to be there. I want to thank you all again for your time. Be nice to each other. I have some North Riverside neighborhood newsletters if anybody would be interested. In we can grab some afterwards. Thank you, though. Uh, Madam Clerk. Shirley Starr, Trash Along City Streets. Is Shirley here? Shirley? Just want to remind folks that we have a bit of a limit when it comes to people signing up. It's at five, and right now we have two folks who have signed up and haven't been able to attend, please call us if you haven't been able to attend because if there's someone else who wanted to speak in public forum uh, but was number six, they, they now weren't given that opportunity. So we ask folks that uh, if you call ahead to get on the list to uh, make sure to let us know if you can't be here. Madam Clerk, next name please. Celeste Reset, A. Price Wooded Park and Joan of Arc Statue. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Mayor and City Council members. Celeste Reset, Wichita native, and KU grad. How about them Jayhawks? Whoa, that's a great game. <laughs> that deserves an applause, but we, we already established that <laughs> so we shouldn't do applause. Go Jayhawks, rock job. Breaking okay. the rules. There we go. <laughs> it's working, Sorry. Though. No, you're good. Um, we have a magnificent sculpture in the Century District of downtown Wichita, the statue of Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, the maid of Orléans, France, represents courage and integrity. She is a French martyr who led her country in the fight against oppression and anarchy to a decisive victory over the English in 1429. Some of you may not know the story of how she came to be in Wichita. In World War II, Wichitans and Kansas of the 137th Infantry of the 35th Army Division liberated Orléans, France from Nazi occupation. Because of this close association, the two cities became sister cities, and visits have been made to Orléans, France by World War II veterans and city officials since that time. In 1970, the city of Orléans, France gave this gift to the citizens of Wichita in commemoration of our city's 100th birthday. Joan of Arc is shown in her armored military dress with sword and helmet. She is a gift of gratitude. So where is this magnificent stone statue now? In the basement of Century Two, neglected and forgotten. I hope you find a new home for her. She needs to be where the public can see her free of charge with no admission. Luckily, there is a second statue in the 1990s, a group of dedicated Wichitans made a replica of this stone statue. Project Beauty, along with the friends of the sister cities and the city, gave $11,000 to create a replica that now sits in front of the Brutalist Library at 223 South Main. This replica is itself a work of art. It is one of only two reproductions of a sculpture completed in 1836 by Princess Marie Louise of the House of Orléans. The marble original is in its home at Versailles, and the city of Orléans has its own bronze. Before a copy could even be made, Wichita had to secure the approval from the Louvre Museum in Paris. The craftsman who cast the bronze sculpture, Alessandro de Mont, lived in Rome, and there's an inscription on the statue letting you know it was made in Roma. Last year, with the help of Wichita area sister city France, Save Century 2, city employee Bernadette Bradshaw, and Troy Houtman, director of the Wichita Parks Department, we came together in cooperation. The Joan of Arc flower beds were adopted. 500 red tulips were planted last Veterans Day and are now blooming around the statue. Burning bush, purple coneflower, daisies, and lantana were planted with generous donations from the folks of Wichita. There is now a plaque explaining the statue's history. This month on Earth Day, Friday, April 22nd, and Saturday, April 23rd, with the generous help of Lowe's Home Improvement Stores, more flowers will be planted. Boxwood, Deontis, Heather, and Phlox. Thank you, Lowe's. 
I will email each of you our flyer for this planting event. Everyone is welcome to help, and we will be there from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. And next month, we're doing even more. On May 17th through 18th, Tuesday and Wednesday, we will plant flowers along Century 2, Kennedy Plaza, and A. Price Woodard Park. Lowe's Home Improvement Stores is again partnering with us. They are providing the plants, mulch, soil, tools, and volunteers to beautify this area. Thank you again, Lowe's, for your generosity. And thank you again to the Wichita Parks and Recreation Department. Troy Houtman, Dave McGuire, and staff are replacing rusted railing, fixing the irrigation system, and cleaning out dead shrubs and trees. We will be picking up trash, planting flowers, and spreading mulch. We are asking for volunteers to meet us at A. Price Woodard Park on Tuesday, May 17th, and Wednesday, May 18th to help. Come any time between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. The 50th River Festival will be held this year from June 3rd to 11th. I was there at the first one. Working together with Wichita area sister cities, Lowe's, and the Wichita Parks Department, we can make downtown Wichita shine for the occasion. Anyone listening who wants to sign up for the event can go to our Save Century 2 Facebook page or the Wichita Area Sister City France Facebook page and find our contact information. We have to memorialize those who served in our armed forces. We have to honor our heritage by maintaining this statue. And we have to, above most, respect gifts of gratitude by taking care of them. Wichita has a legacy to be proud of. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you also for organizing a community approach to, to help beautify in our city. That's amazing. Um, Madam Clerk. Jane Burns, sustainability is everybody's responsibility to mitigate climate change. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jane Burns. I live in District 1, and I'm a KU graduate as well. <laughs> Rock chalk. <laughs> Out of, um, on number seven and eight of your new business agenda today, our very good transportation folks will ask you to approve another $5 million for trucks in Wichita. My ask today is instead invest, invest that $5 million in people in Wichita. Every time I visit the Keeper of the Plains, I see large numbers of strollers, runners, cyclists, scooters, seniors, families using that iconic area. Past city councils invested in those iconic amen amen amenities. <laughs> the bridge, the walkways, the statues, even the troll. Why do we neglect amenities now? As climate change continues to warm us, Wichita has lost tree cover at the rate of 5,000 trees each year. Why don't we replace them? Few of the uh, 40 vehicle high crash intersections have street markings. Why don't we paint them? Or paint crosswalks around our children's schools or brighten our few bike lanes. Streets in my hood <laughs> haven't been swept for six months and aren't due to be swept for another two months. Buses are infrequent with few benches or shelters in the areas that really need buses, amenities, and safety and necessities. Will the millions we spend on Top Golf and the Northwest Bypass and trucks on Southwest Street retain our youth? And while Wichita skimps on maintenance, amenities, and safety, we also ignore climate change. Yesterday's report from the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change calls for urgency in how we produce energy and how we conserve it, including transportation. Can we acknowledge that inevitability and mitigate it responsibly, realistically, and quickly? Uh, KDOT, the Kansas Department of Transportation, plans to spend Kansas' share of the 
bipartisan infrastructure bill primarily on more highways. You know, Kansas has now the fourth largest network of roads uh, right behind California, Illinois, and Texas, <laughs> much larger cities. Uh, Wichita does not have to honor KDOT's priorities of trucks, high-speed crashes, and more highways. <laughs> That's backward-looking instead of forward-looking transportation. Um, can you bravely and wisely look forward to enhance the present and prepare for the future? You could budget to play, replace trees, paint markings on streets for pedestrians and bicyclists as a safe transportation alternative, boost bus service, honor more green spaces, lead in the conservation of resources and the transition to renewables. You can make um, the future better for people, for grandchildren, for young talent, and for our planet. You can increase the staffing of our good public works department to adequate levels. You can fund the Wichita Police Department traffic uh, department to pursue the interesting new goal of Vision Zero. You can fund the park department to plant more trees. You can begin your own sustainability department like many other cities have. Today's plan by the very excellent transportation folks is for $5 million, but for trucks. <laughs> Please take that $5 million for people and the planet over trucks. Respectfully, thank you very much for your consideration. All right, Madam Clerk. Consent agenda items 1 through 28. Has every member had a chance to review the consent agenda? And if so, is there any discussion? Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to pull items 15, 16, and 17. Items 15, 16, and 17 will be pulled from the consent agenda and discussed immediately following the consent agenda. Further discussion? If there is no further discussion, then I will make the motion to accept the consent agenda and pass it with the exception of items 15, 16, and 17. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Back on items 15, 16, and 17, the chair recognizes Councilmember Johnson and will accept these items to be handled all as one motion or three separate motions. At your discretion. Let's do one motion. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, due to a personal conflict, I cannot, I have to abstain from items 15, 16, and 17. Please let the clerk note that Councilmember Johnson has abstained from items 15, 16, and 17 on the consent agenda. Is there any more discussion? If there is no more discussion, then I will make a motion to accept items 15, 16, and 17 of the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open the roll. Members cast the vote. I have received seven, six yay votes and one abstention. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Board of Bids and Contracts and Wichita De Airport Authority Board of Bids and Contracts dated April 4th, 2022. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Melinda Walker, Finance Department. Our first item for engineering is water distribution system for to serve Cherise Woods Addition 2 for Apex Excavating, $40,955. For Water Distribution System, SWD, Sanitary Sewer, PAV, Sawmill Creek Addition, Phase 2, Apex Excavating, LLC, Aggregate Total, Bid Total, $857,095. For purchasing, we have a high pressure sewer cleaning with a chemical root. Kemet Control, Elliott Equipment Company, for an aggregate total of $334,414.11. We have a high pressure sewer cleaner mounted on a 56,000 GVW cabin chassis, Elliott Equipment Company, 
for $584,829.15. Earthwork Phase 2 for C&D Cell Construction at Brooks Landfill, Pearson Construction for $616,280. Crematoriums for Animal Shelter, we have FC Industries for $461,209. $37,000 GVWR Refuge Truck, Omaha Truck Center for $171,943. $20,000 GVW Step Van, Omaha Truck Center, Aggregate total, $725,800. We have audiovisual improvements for Watson Park Event Center, Conference Technology, $55,842.47. Phase 1 Environmental Site Assessment for RAD Program, Spectrum Environmental, for $66,150. Tractor with a 25-foot cradle boom, Murphy Tractor and Equipment for $251,882.39. Demolition and Site Clearing, Bradburn Corporation Redirect Award, $49,468.23. For Airport, we have Airport General Aviation Airport. Apron Reconstruction Phase 1, Pearson Construction, $19,665,321. How to do business with the City of Wichita, our open request for proposals and recommendation to approve the bid awards. All right, questions for staff. Councilmember Ballard. I just had some questions about the animal crematorium. I've received lots of emails and been tagged a lot. So I was just wondering if we could get some more information on that. Remember as staff, we would like to answer that question. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor, Council, uh, Dan East, Captain with the Wichita Police Department. I stand for questions. Or do you have a specific question, ma'am? Um, I think um, when I spoke with Emily um, yesterday, she just explained a little bit more about why we need it, why we need two or a bigger one, or um, you know, what all are they used for? If we could just have some clarification. Sure. sure no problem. Um, the, as um, in back in December, when this first uh, came to council, uh, the crematoriums are currently 13 years old. They have a lifespan of 10 years. Our crematoriums are deteriorating, uh, and they're um, not efficient. Um, we are not going. We're not replacing with anything larger. We're going back um, with what we have, and so um, that's kind of the, the history of it. And so they've reached their lifespan. The um, use of the crematoriums, um, not only for um, euthanasia, um, we have also, we have animals that are brought in that are deceased, um, we have a contract um, person that brings in animals that are dece deceased throughout the community, so it's used um, for that purpose. Um, we also um, use the crematoriums. There's certain evidence that the police department has that that's how that evidence has to be destroyed. Um, is in those crematoriums. Councilmember Hallheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was just going to add to what Maggie or Councilmember uh, Ballard said. Uh, my 17-year-old pup went across the Rainbow Bridge a couple days after Christmas, and uh, he went through the crematorium. So um, he's at home sitting on our mantle now, so I thank you guys for that. Um, I did have one question about... Um, I have heard about um, staffing issues down at Animal Control, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on that in terms of do we need more staffing? Is it more positions that need to be filled? Um, yeah, just uh, 
maybe just a quick suggestion or two here. Um, first, let me check. We are currently, um, we have been very lucky. Um, we were down um, last year um, quite with COVID and um, everything. We were down quite a few um, positions, animal control officers and the kennel techs. Currently, we have been able to fill those positions and we are only down one kennel tech position at the animal shelter. Um, so, I mean, uh, we, I am very, very proud of the staff at the animal uh, shelter. They do an incredible job. The men and women that, uh, that work there, they do a phenomenal job. And just, you know, like you with all the emails and everything, doesn't reflect, I mean, the work they do, the partnership um, with the rescues. And, uh, you know, we um, have a great shelter. And, you know, I'm very proud of the live release rate right now. Um, as of, I believe, yesterday, it's a 95% live release rate. And so I'm very proud of that. Thank so you. just to kind of follow up, some of the narratives on the internet that I think myself and other members have been tagged in is this idea that if we were to upgrade uh, the 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 uh, crematorium, that it will lead to more, I guess, uh, killing of adoptable innocent puppies. How would you respond to that? Um, I would say that that is false. Um, we do everything, everyone that works in that shelter, the rescue groups, I have... Uh, Emily Hurst with the Kansas Humane Society here, here um, a phenomenal partner um, with us, and that is not the case at all. Um, it's, that piece of equipment has reached its useful life, and we are replacing that equipment. We, are, um, we still do everything we can um, to adopt out those animals. And just uh, for clarification for folks, and I do see we have a couple on the board again, so we'll give them the, the floor in a moment, but just for clarification, if... If our parks or, or, or public employees pull a, a deer off the side of the road, uh, this crematorium, it, it also applies to uh, discarding the, the uh, bodies of, uh, of um, wild animals, as well as, uh, as was mentioned, if, if the police were to, I guess, find uh, a, a kilo of fentanyl, this is used to dispose of that. Can you kind of explain? Uh, I guess, expand on how these uh, crematoriums are, are utilized beyond just the animal shelter? Um, beyond just the animal shelter um, itself, we, like I said, we have a contract that picks up all deceased animals um, along the side of the road through um, throughout the city. And so it's used um, for disposal of those animals. And then it's also used, um, there's evidence at the police department, um, that's how it has to be destroyed. Okay. Councilmember Ballard. Sorry. Um, I just wondered if Lieutenant Purcell or Emily, if you guys had anything extra to add. I'm going to ask a nonprofit if they wanted the opportunity to speak. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, would you please uh, state your name and also uh, the organization you're with? Yes, it's Emily Hurst, the Kansas Humane Society. Um, so just quick clarification, we have a public-private partnership. The Kansas Humane Society is a nonprofit that is located next to Wichita Animal Services, which is the Wichita Animal Shelter. Um, we do have our own crematorium. You guys have your crematorium. Yours serve a much larger purpose um, than the disposal of pets. Um, ours is spe specifically for shelter animals or owned animals. And, Mike, actually your pet was euthanized, or I'm sorry, your crematorium ashes were through our shelter, because we provide that public service, you guys um, really manage uh, the, like, unknown animals. So animals, deer, dogs, something that would be collected on the side of the road, and then we take anything that is private, and we'll provide cremation services at free of charge um, for the families if they are low income, or at a charge for any individual that might uh, need that service. Did you have any other specific questions um, about the use of the crematoriums? Uh, no, I just um, forwarded the email to you, so I just thought, um, I think most of the things were covered, but yes. I just wanted to make sure that people don't think that we're buying a bigger, better crematorium for, you know, to put down more animals, because I think you guys have an excellent success rate, and um, I just wanted to make sure that we get all of the correct information out to people that are concerned. Right. And I can say just from personal use with our own crematoriums that making sure that you have um, crematoriums that are operating 
due to the radiation, the heat, and the gas is really important. So the, them being past the use of their life, is, it's really critical that those get replaced for all of your needs. Um, you did mention about staffing there, and you guys were talking about social media and people's comments, um, which is fun uh, sometimes. The, the, I really would encourage anybody to come to the shelter. I'm happy to provide them a behind-the-scenes tour. I know Lieutenant Purcell is the same for his shelter, so they can understand all of our data is transparent and made available every single month and every year. Um, their shelters can't operate based off of the empty kennels um, that are there. That's just not how shelter operations work. You also have to account for the staffing time to be able to clean, feed, and provide adequate veterinary care. Um, and a municipal shelter is not the appropriate place to hold an animal for any longer than their stray hold, and that's what the city shelter's purpose is. That's why the Kansas Humane Society built our shelter next to you so that we could process things like adoptions, community resource programs, and things along those lines. So if you guys ever need any clarification or public comment needs clarification on what those specific duties are for, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Council Member Hoheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just like to say that I do appreciate everything you guys do. Um, you have a high, a high success rate as far as um, animals coming out um, and getting rehoused. Um, I'd always like to improve it. That's just my nature there. Um, so I would be open to any suggestions you have as to how we can help aid in um, just taking that survival rate up even higher. So thank you for everything you do. Mr. Manager, off the top of your head, do you know what the general lifespan for the uh, crematoriums that we would be replacing is? I believe that uh, Captain East indicated 10 years. 10 years. So we were three years past the general lifespan uh, of these uh, this equipment. And I guess uh, what is the risk to our staff if we weren't to, to replace these? I'll ask I'll, the staff to respond in terms of safety concerns. As Emily alluded to with um, the gas, the chemicals, the insides, um, the uh, material that lines the insides is cracking and falling off. So it just becomes, it just becomes hazardous to use. So it becomes possibly a work hazard because yes, the, it has met and exceeded its life expectancy. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Further questions for staff? Seeing none, we'll open this up to public comment. The folks who would like to speak to this item on the agenda. See none. We'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on this item? All right. If there is no further discussion, the chair will make a motion to accept staff's recommended action to receive and file the report, approve the contracts, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion is seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Ever received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Petitions for public improvements. Good morning, Director. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council Members. Gary Jansen, Public Works Engineering. Uh, we have not had petitions in front of the Council for several meetings now, so we're going to make up for it today. Uh, the petitions before you represent 100% of the improvement district for each petition and all are valid per Kansas statute. So we have numerous developments with new petitions, including Cedardale addition in District 5, which includes petitions for water, stormwater, and paving improvements. Hawthorne addition, which is in District 2, includes petitions for water, stormwater, and sanitary sewer improvements. Meridian 53 addition, which is in District 6, includes new petitions for drainage and sanitary sewer. South Seneca Estates, which is in District 4, includes improvements, uh, petitions for improvements for water, sanitary, sewer, and paving. And West Breeze Addition, which is in District 6, includes sanitary sewer improvements. And there, uh, we do have one development for revised petitions, Corneo Industrial 2nd Edition in District 6, uh, as we have seen on quite a few areas, including this development, to meet current market conditions, revised petitions are needed for water, sanitary, sewer, and paving improvements. Staff recommend the City Council approve the new and revised petitions and budgets, adopt the many resolutions, and authorize necessary signatures, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. 
Questions for staff? Seeing none, thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on this? If there is no further discussion, then I'll make the motion to approve the new and revised petitions and budgets, adopt the new and amended amending resolutions and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Have received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Unfinished business, repair or removal of dangerous and unsafe structure, 1127 North Broadway Avenue. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Kaylin Nethercott with MABCD. Um, 1127 North Broadway is the property under consideration today. With your permission, I'd like to review. We've got about a dozen pictures on the property. I'd like to look at those first and then present the, the case to you again. The floor is yours. So you'll remember this is a large structure on North Broadway that's been damaged by fire. Again, we'll just take a look at those pictures. Okay, this property is located in District 6. It was originally part of a group of 15 cases that were reviewed by the Board of Code Standards and Appeal on a July 12, 2021. This property was given two deferrals by the BCSA at the property owner's request. On December 7, 2021, Council heard this case for the first time and opted for a 90-day extension to be reviewed on or about May 15th, or excuse me, March 15th. There was no council meeting on March 15th, so given publication deadlines um, and other factors, the 90-day the extension for this property has actually been a 120-day extension. As a review, the primary structure on this property was built in 1900 and has a main level, a second level, and an attic. At some point over the years, the structure was converted into a multifamily dwelling and therefore is currently in a legal but non-conforming use. The secondary structure is a carriage house type structure toward the rear of the property. The primary structure has had an open housing case for over two years and additional housing and nuisance cases dating back to 2002. The current owner, Mr. Don Loebmeyer, has been in the process of buying and subsequently owning the property since 2002. The property was damaged by fire in February 2019 and has been placarded as uninhabitable since that time. The property was not insured at the time of the fire. Water records indicate that there has been no legal water consumption at the property since December 2018. A UCC has been issued and the property has been the subject of environmental court. Taxes are delinquent in the amount of $966.83. Mr. Lobmeyer was present at the July 12th, August 2nd, and September 13th BCSA meetings and also attended the December 7th council meeting. As requested in the December public hearing, MABCD was able to facilitate a structural engineer's evaluation of the property. The evaluation was conducted on December 15, 2021. The report yielded an extensive scope of repairs needed as follows. Fire damage exists to the ceiling of the main level, which is the floor joist of the upper level. A significant number of joists would need to be replaced due to fire damage. The stair framing going to the attic level needs to be replaced. The exterior walls at the windows at the landing of the stairs and at the attic level need to be replaced. In the attic area of the roof at the south gable end, damage exists that would require a number of rafters on both sides of the ridge to be replaced or reinforced. The west valley needs to be replaced. Roof decking near the bottom of the valley on both sides needs to be replaced. The chimney west of the west valley is damaged. Rafters on both sides of the chimney and east of the chimney need to be replaced. The header that frames the south side of the chimney needs to be replaced. Multiple layers of shingles have been applied to the roof over the years and would need to be removed to the decking. New OSB sheathing would need to be installed over the existing decking with new rafters being in place first. 
Mr. Courtney Capello, chief building official for Wichita and Cedric County, conducted an interior inspection on this property and noted the following. The house is being used extensively for storage. Any structural repair must be done by a licensed general contractor under a valid building permit. The current electrical wiring system throughout the house is outdated and we would need to be completely replaced to current code standards. The plumbing system throughout the house is outdated and would need to be completely replaced to current code standards. HVA systems throughout the home are obsolete and not repairable. These would also need to be replaced to current code standards. Each system repair would require a trades permit with the work to be done by a licensed contractor specific to the trade. As you saw from the pictures, no repairs or changes have occurred with the primary structure. No building permits, trade permits, nor wrecking permits have been applied for or obtained by any contractor. No viable plan for repair or removal, nor plan for the sale of the property has been presented for consideration. Chris Labram, MABC director, and Courtney Capello met on site at the property with Mr. Lobmeyer yesterday. Both are available should mayor or council have any additional questions that they would be able to answer. At this time, MABCD is recommending moving forward with condemning and removing the primary structure at 1127 North Broadway. Questions for staff. Councilmember Fry. Thank you, and I appreciate the presentation, Catalan. Thank you. Um, with the inspection report that Mr. Capello did, were there any pictures taken of that as well? Do you have anything to offer so we can yeah. see? I do, actually. Some of the description that uh, you reported. Yes. Councilmember Fry, are you retaining the floor? Uh, no, I just wanted to, uh, I'd heard reports that it was devastating and looking at these pictures, this looks beyond repairable, in my opinion. I'm not qualified to make that decision, but it sounds like from the report that Mr. Capello made, he agrees. We would agree. Thank you. Councilmember Ballard. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, yes. I just wanted to, we had briefly talked about um, the carriage house, mm -hmm. if if we condemn the front part, are we able to leave the back part where he could still live there? And I think you said there is power, but there wouldn't be water. Can you just clarify some of the? I can, and I might, recall, I might call Courtney up to back me up on this. Um, there would be some modifications required to the carriage house to make it fully habitable due to some shared systems that it has in place. Um, I believe electricity is there in place, but the water meter is not. Um, Courtney, what else? Where are you? I'm up here, my little friend. <laughs> he did this evaluation yesterday. It's his area of expertise and not mine. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, council members. Courtney Capella with MABCD, building official, assistant director for the city of Wichita, Central County. So with regards to the question that you have with um, any of the utilities that are connected with the main structure, would have to be reverted to uh, the carriage house. It could be done, but there would be a cost. And trade permits would have to be pulled. Further questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Is, does that conclude your presentation? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear uh, public input. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item? Good morning and welcome. Yeah, Don Lopemeyer, the owner. Um, as you can see, you know, from the damage and stuff, and I've been trying to do what I can do. Uh, it's overwhelming, especially after coming back from the deployment 30 days after the, you know, uh, the fire had happened and stuff and coming home to that. Um, and having to go through a lot of mental and physical um, issues after coming back. Um, and so it's been, you say, it's some of the stuff that the reporting is there's, discrepancies on some of that I see but <clears throat> and I was not I don't know why I didn't get a report from Courtney on the stuff as far as what 
was presented on that. Otherwise, I'd know more about after I'd invited him to come look at the house when I was having problems with the structural engineer. So he could see it wasn't as, you know, what I was dealing with as far as all that itself. So that was what I was trying to figure, you know, this is new information I'm getting now. There's some of us kind of talked about the other day, but I don't know why <clears throat> I wasn't present, given any of this information of what his reports were. So it makes it confusing, you know, as far as that. One point of clarification. You were there when Courtney did the interior inspections? Yes. Thank you. Yes, I was there, but I didn't see the reports as far as the general contractor and all this other stuff that he was, he, um, his conclusions as far as what those would be. If I would have known that, then I, it would do, why would I continue fighting trying to do all this, you know, to, to keep the structure and everything else as far as that itself? If I'd known what his extent, his reports were on that, that, you know, that it's more confusing and so. Uh, so it's, you know, that's a lot of stuff that's been brought to light, but you know, like I say, it's um, almost mute because like I say, it's just, um, you know, you, you, it's just, it's just it takes a lot of taxing on that. And of course with <clears throat> DCF here today too, that, that I just pulled records up from that a couple of years ago from when I was uh, removed from my, my mom and stuff. And there's things I just found out. So it's, it's, it's. A little bit emotional too with that. So, um, so Don, are you in agreement that the structure needs to be removed? That's what I sound. It sounds like I'm hearing. Well, that's. <clears throat> I'm just trying to timelines what I've got time to get move whatever I need, do what I need to do otherwise to uh, accommodate that. You know, if that you know, like I say it's if I'd known that was his report in a sense, I would like okay, why sh why continue fighting trying to do all this stuff? you know, get a structural engineer report, you know, that, that was the whole thing. If he, he, this was reported, you know, what was it, uh, October? December. No, was no, saying. October was when I had. Well, we we want to make sure this gentleman has the, the floor to, to give his, his, his full presentation. And so that's why I'd like to say, you know, if I, if that was the case, I would like to say, why, was, why wasn't I given this information on his, his report that he presented to the, you know, city on that itself, so. Then that would make more sense for me to say, okay, why am I continuing to try to continue fighting it? Let's, let's go ahead and get it removed and do what I need to do with it and stuff. So, um, so that's that's you know that's the first time I've ever heard of, heard of anything on this report itself. So, so just just a follow up then, I, I believe December seventh, you, you were here. We we had a discussion on this. It was a ninety day extension. It turned into one hundred and twenty days, and according to our staff, there wasn't one permit pulled during that time to attempt to address uh, any of the issues with structure, with electricity, but, with water. And so it, it, it uh, appears... Yeah, I, I yeah, like I say, it's the part of my processing and not, you know, like you say, you've got the engineer, the structural engineer report. And when I was reading it, it didn't sound, you know, and I went through with him when he did it and it didn't seem like there's just putting more boards up there and just replacing. It's just on that north side, that very top part. Most of it is just uh, the fire damage was just on the on the wall, you know, as far as smoke and you know, as far as that itself. It really wasn't burnt anything as far as most of the stuff. And I had even electrical engineer, electrical person come out from the city before that and tell me this is the only things you got to work on as far as uh, a, you know, a few things, a few places where the fire had affected the electrical area and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so it's it's. <clears throat> The, these pictures indicate that the, and I'm not a carpenter, but my dad is, and I, I've been on sites before. This, these pictures indicate that, in my opinion, and please push back if I'm wrong, that um, it, the near majority of the house would have to be gutted. Right. And then a structure right. fixed and. And that, like I say, that was just, you know, if, um, you know, it, it's just, uh, like I say, it's, it's part of just the process of having to reprogram things and have to be medicated and everything else and stuff that I'm doing and all that. So it's 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 just you know processing the information now. It's just, it, you know it's if I've known more of this what they were talking about, it would make it easier to say, okay, why am I continue trying to put more? You know, I'm stressing myself out more and more trying to do something when I didn't need to be doing that if I knew the information that was. That they, you know, conclusions on it from there itself. So, you know, instead of thinking I could do something about it, 
Mm -hmm. So uh, the fire happened, just trying to set the timeline here. Fire happened in 2019. We discussed this on, or, or there was a meeting on July 12th, 2021. December 7th, 2021, it came to council. We extended 90 days, had 120 days. It's now 100, we're now in 2022. Right, yeah, I know. And yeah. has any, any work been done of well, significance? That, that hasn't been presented? Well, that's, as you've seen, there, that was all boarded up before, if she had put, pulled those pictures up and stuff for that. Um, <clears throat> and you can, they, we pulled all the boards off of there because I put most of the windows back up because I couldn't get a loan on the house until I had windows back in it because they won't insure the house unless there's windows in the house. So I've been working on putting all these windows, you know, rebuilding the window frames and everything else and putting the windows back together, replacing the glass that was broke out by the fire department. Um, they broke out about 30 windows throughout the house. That was not damaged by the the fire itself. It's just because they broke those windows out so they could keep it from spreading and as far as all that. Um, the only window damage that was done was on that upper north part above the staircase, stairwell and stuff for that. <clears throat> so, and that was, that's been, you know, like I say, there's, that was done after. Courtney came through and taught, you know, did all this stuff. So there's all those resources I used to do this stuff that, you know, as far as that. Uh, the other thing that was, you know, it's kind of strange because of the picture that she brought up this time doesn't show previously when I brought it up to when we was at the condemnation board where they came back on the back of the property and was taking a lot of pictures and stuff as far as that. And it was showing that there's no trespassing signs and all that in those pictures. But once I brought that up and they said, that doesn't matter, we can go back to whenever, they came back, you know, they stopped taking and showing those pictures afterwards. So that's why it's kind of a... <clears throat> so, that, yeah, that's just, you know, a lot of people say that's not, you shouldn't be able to just come back on the property and start taking pictures and, and doing, all, you know, trespassing itself. So, it's, you know, it's confliction with what I'm trying to figure out, too, so... Well, uh, Mayor, if you wouldn't mind, Mayor, if we could maybe offer something from a staff standpoint. Sure. Thank you. Our inspectors are allowed to check a building to see if it's secured. So the purpose of that is to make sure that it had remained boarded up and secured. Um, second thing, to answer an earlier question, you mentioned timeline for when something might happen, it would take us at least 60 days before any concrete action would be taken on the ground. More than enough time for uh, Mr. Lobmeyer to remove his things or whatever else he needs to do. It's good to know. Is there any further questions or? Mr. Mayor, if, yes. if it's all right with, um, with Council Member Ballard, I think what we would do is we, during that 60 day period, we would continue to work with him regarding the issue of the other structure on the property, what it would take to make it habitable. And I understand that he also owns another property that possibly could be upgraded uh, for as a residence. And we would continue to work with him on that as well. If that, and that, 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 that I think would be great. I, I, I'm very concerned about this property as particularly since there is a, another property on there which means there's foot traffic there's people going to, to the other property as well and we know that particularly abandoned homes, i'm the only one on that property okay there's well, we know that on that property there um, as i'm back in that carriage house itself so so uh with the uh, process of the wife and i divorced and i was not you know for the last two years i've been over you know, i've been there so okay well we we want to make sure one of the issues when it comes to property that is uninhabitable and is structurally unsafe is, is really bad things can happen in, in, in those homes, um, you know, particularly with, with, with uh, 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 they become spots where, where children can become victims, where, where folks can go in, in there who are unhoused and possibly right. find yep. themselves hurt. Uh, so that's one of the, the, the real concerns, the public safety concern. If, if, if we move, if we didn't follow the, the process and so on, was to go there and get themselves hurt or worse, then you know the the, the council would likely feel right. feel a, a, another I way about understand this. Understand it is you know there's just you know 
the amount of applications I put in for help to do things and stuff like that, that and that's the reason why they're having me reach up to uh, Topeka with Senator Moran with some of the problems I've had with accessing the Army Emergency Relief Funds. They even got another one for the Kansas Relief Fund for military veterans, but there's no application, nothing on there. So it's like, okay, how are you supposed to apply for this stuff? You know, if you can't get an application to get to it, you know, it's, I've got the reports printed up and you can't click on it, nothing. So they're, you know, they keep giving resources, but I keep falling through those cracks. You know, they either want you suicidal, alcoholic, drug addict, homeless, whatever, and stuff on top of that. And, you know, unless I lie about it, then that's the only way I could even get some of the funding for it. And I'm not gonna lie about some of that stuff there for it. So, you know, I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not, not a drug addict, never done it. My mom was, but I chose, you know, that's that's what's saving me today is because I haven't turned to those devices to, to, to go otherwise and stuff, so. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who's here to speak to this item? Good morning and welcome. Good morning, my name is Janice Bradley and uh, I live in District 6, not too far from this structure. I'm well aware of this structure. Uh, and it's, a, it's an historic structure. Uh, it's a sad thing when we lose those, even if they're in that area of North Broadway. But I would just ask, and, and we're in COVID and we've, I mean, I myself as a homeowner, we've had terrible time finding contractors to do work in this period. I mean, there's a big shortage going on. I would just ask that you give this gentleman more time with that in consideration. I know he's had over time. But uh, one of the things that struck me is that if this place is going to be torn down, there's so much material on that house that could be utilized by other homeowners for repairs. I'm talking about this, the wood on those window trim does not deteriorate like the stuff today does. The, some of it's cypress wood. I mean, it, it's just amazing that these things are still usable and valuable to homeowners in, uh, in homes uh, of this age or even, you know, even younger. So I just ask that you uh, give some mercy on this and allow this gentleman a little more time to, to get things in order or to uh, put things up for sale uh, as materials. Thank you. Is there further public input on this item? My name is Sybil Strom. I had the same problem. I had a 1910 home and you people came to my house and destroyed it without my permission. I ended up going by to my, oh, four, four, oh my, my address is 326 North Walnut. My name is Sybil Strum. I had a 1910 home. Yes, there were things wrong with it. There was a little hole in the floor, kitchen. And I was told by the city, I couldn't put a bathroom, you know, a bathroom sink in the bathroom. But then I, I get a contractor I never got to meet. You got, not you, but they got a contractor that I never got to meet. I never got to go down to Fidelity to go get the home loan. You can't do that to people. You cannot sit there and tell people, we're gonna take over your house, we're gonna destroy it. And when I, when I went down I, to see what they did, they said, the house is condemned. And it was, it was heartbreaking because my kid, my kids lived in that house, my grandchild lived in that house, and, and now I have a new house that they gave me 
but they did not let me go see the contractor. It was like, they were the boss, I'm paying the mortgage, but they got by. And the guy, Stringer and Sons in Whitewater, Kansas, the door, the front door of my house lets cold air come in. And I'm really mad about that because if you, you understood, since I'm the one paying the loan, you get it? I should have got to pick the contractor. But instead, they picked the contractor, the housing authority. I ended up never meeting the guy. And I am now paying a substantial loan with Fidelity. And when I do pay the loan, they go, we haven't got the money. You need to go up to whoever the housing authority and the MAACP or whatever they're called and tell them, you have to tell the homeowner who is going to be a contractor. I didn't even know. I ended up calling Brandon Johnson and I called up uh, Becky Tuttle and I told him. I did not know who the contractor was. I never got to meet him. I never once uh, got to meet. I, when you make a loan with a, a bank, you should be able to talk to him. But I never got to talk to him. It was like substantially, I never got to talk to him. And it made me mad because that's why I went to Brandon Johnson and Becky Tuttle because you're giving him all his leniency. To me, you came on my property. I had a no trespassing sign. I didn't even know what was going on. I was like, coming on. The guy goes, I'm from the MAACP. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, that's just MAACP. I never got to know what it meant. But I have a new house, but Stringer did some bad, you know, contracting, and now I had to go get a new contractor. You know, I had to do my own. I have aluminum foil on the bottom of my door because he did a bad job. And you can't do that to people. You cannot tell them that they don't have no rights to get a, a contractor. You cannot tell them that they have no rights. What bank they should go to is the homeowner's part, not their part. Well, thank you very much and have a good blessed day. All of you, I pray for y'all. Thank you. Further input from the public on this item. All right. See none, staff, if you would like to add anything. Just one thing. Um, just to be clear, MABCD will continue to make ourselves available to Mr. Loebmeyer to help him with the carriage house and the processes it would take to um, bring that up to a, a habitable standard. Um, that's not a problem. We'd be happy to consult with that. We've got the right experts in the room to do that. So just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. Um, Further discussion, we'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on this item? If not, the chair recognized council member Ballard for a motion as this resides in District 6. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Manager, could you help me um, with, if we have staff try to help with a carriage house, or Jennifer, um, what that would look like? as far as a motion or what you're suggesting to, to help with. If you could just clarify that, that would be great. Sure. Um, I, there were two things. First of all, to work with him on a timing for demolition. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Janice talked about the possible salvaging of materials. We could talk to him about that as well. I mean, there's a possibility the property could be sold, but I, it's 
not quite sure that he's in a position to do that. But anyway, we can be flexible in terms of when it comes down. But if you'd, the motion is to approve the condemnation, but have staff work with him for proper disposition of materials of the house and also working on the um, uh, making uh, repairs necessary for the carriage house. We something to that effect that at least tells us your intent for us to continue to work with him and provide technical assistance. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, so I guess I would just make a motion to. Um, Close the public. Is that what? Close the public hearing. Adopt a resolution declaring the building to be dangerous and unsafe structure, um, and accept the BBC SA recommended actions to proceed with condemnation. Condemnation allowing ten days to start demolition, um, and ten days to complete removal of the structure, and then have staff come alongside to try to help um, with the carriage house and to make that. Habitable, kind of. Is that, work? is that acceptable guidance? I think it is. It takes care of the legal requirements, but also instructs staff to continue to work with him on uh, options with the house or with the carriage house. Okay. Thank the you. motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk open a roll. Members cast the vote. Have received seven votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. New business. Public hearing and request for a letter of intent to issue industrial revenue bonds, Web Industrial LLC. Good morning, Mayor and Council Welcome. Members. I'm Tim Goodpasture with the <laughs> City's Office of Economic Development for the record. The item before you today is a request for a letter of intent to issue industrial revenue bonds from Web Industrial LLC. Just a little background on the, the speculative industrial policy. This was developed in December of 2017, and the criteria is based on information that we've received from site selectors in terms of what they are looking for from facilities that we typically do not have available. So the minimum requirement is 100,000 square feet that we require that they cannot demise below 25,000 square feet. The idea being we want to encourage large available space. Uh, minimum clear height is 28 foot clear and tilt up concrete is the preferred material for construction. Uh, the developers must start construction within 120 days of council approval and complete the primary structure within 15 months of city council approval. Uh, the developers would be required to use industrial revenue bonds to achieve a 95% abatement in the first five years and a 50% abatement in the second five years if at least 50% of the facility is uh, leased at the five-year mark. There is no abatement for land. Currently, five projects have been uh, completed under this new policy. Uh, Wham Capital, the Michaelis family, constructed 100,000 square feet near 35th Street North and Webb for multiple tenants. That facility is 100% leased. Uh, Jeff Lang, through his Iron Horse Industrial Project at Seneca and MacArthur, built 100,000 square feet, which retained Cosmic Pet here in Wichita. Uh, Web Industrial, which is uh, uh, this partnership between uh, Steve Barrett, Ivan Crossland, and Dave Murfin, constructed 140,000 square feet near 40th and Tobin, uh, which was leased to Amazon. Uh, this, again, Web Industrial uh, constructed 113,000 square feet near 40th and Tobin, which is uh, still under construction. Uh, half of that has been leased to Pella. The other half is under a letter of intent to be leased. And Millennia Productions, Michael Lee, constructed 128,000 square feet near 39th and Tobin, which is 100% uh, leased at this time. Uh, one additional project has been approved that is under construction at this time. That's the ICT-21, uh, which is Ron and Marty Cornejo's project, which is at the northwest corner of 21st Street North and I-135. They are currently constructing 180,000 square feet. Uh, Web Industrial is a partnership between Ivan Crossland Jr., Dave Murfin, and Steve Barrett. Uh, they have previously, as stated, constructed 140,000 square feet near 39th and Webb. 
Uh, another 130, 113,000 square feet, half of which is leased and half of which is under a letter of intent. Uh, Ivan Crossland and Steve Barrett built 250,000 square feet of speculative industrial space under the previous spec policy, which was built near 29th and Ohio. And Steve Barrett and other partners built 140,000 square feet of speculative industrial space in 2008 near Pawnee and Meridian. So a long-standing history of success for these developers with the speculative industrial program. Webb Industrial is intending to build a new 159,000 square feet, uh, square foot warehouse at an approximate cost of 14.5 million near 40th Street North and Webb Road, and is requesting a letter of intent in that amount. In this uh, aerial, you can see Webb Road running from top to bottom, just a little bit right of center. Uh, you can see Jabara Airport on the right side of the aerial. And the area outlined in red is where the new facility would be built near 40th Street and Tobin or near 40th Street and Webb Road. These are some architectural renderings of what the facility would look like. Again, it would be 159,000 square feet with a minimum of 24 dock high doors, uh, 40 foot clear height, and a minimum of 200 parking spaces. The estimated value of one year tax abatement, the 95% tax abatement, would be approximately 437,000, 112,000 of which would be the city's share. A cost benefit analysis was conducted by the Center for Economic Development and Business Research at Wichita State University, which shows an overall ratio of benefits to costs of 1.44 to 1 for the city overall, 1.23 to 1 for the city's general fund, and 2.09 to 1 for the city's debt service fund. Therefore, it's staff's recommendation that the city council close the public hearing, adopt the resolution of intent, and authorize the necessary signatures. Bradley Tiedemann of J.P. Wygand and Sons is here and can answer any questions on behalf of the developer, and I would be happy to answer any questions as well. Councilmember Hoheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, were the other projects that were built in the area by the same uh, company, were those, uh, did they utilize IRBs as well? They did. They utilized this same industrial revenue bond spec industrial program to build the first two that they built in that same area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions for staff? If there's no further questions for staff, we'll open it up to public comment. Is there public comment on this item? If there is no public comment on this item, then we will bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on the item? If there is no further discussion, then the chair recognizes Vice Mayor Tuttle as this resides in District 2. Thank you. I appreciate that. I want to thank staff. Thank you for getting this to us. I appreciate all your time and effort. I um, want to thank Webb Industrial LLC. Um, I appreciate you investing in our community. The Greater Wichita Partnership and our economic development team tell us that these are the type of developments and projects that we need, and it helps us to recruit businesses to the city of Wichita, which will help us grow our economy, which is part of our mission of being an exceptionally well-run city. I had the good fortune to be on a call on Friday with a company from Orlando, Florida, who is considering relocating to our city because of a project similar to this. So with that in mind, I would enthusiastically move that the city council close the public hearing, adopt the resolution and of intent, and authorize the necessary signatures. Motion has been made. I will second the motion. Motion has been made and seconded. Clerk open a roll. Members cast the vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Public hearing and request for letter of intent to issue industrial revenue bonds, Cortera of Wichita, LLC. Again, Mayor and Council Members, Tim Goodpasture with the Office of Economic Development. Uh, the next item is a request for a letter of intent to issue industrial revenue bonds for Cortera of Wichita. Corterra of Wichita is a recently formed limited liability corporation that was formed to develop an inpatient geriatric behavioral health hospitals hospital for seniors who are experiencing uh, disorders related to Alzheimer's or other dementias. The company intends to develop a 21,000 square foot facility with 24 private rooms. Ultimately, it would serve between four and 500 seniors and older adults annually. The facility would be located near K96 and Ridge Road. 
On this aerial, you can see K96 running from left to right, roughly in the middle of the aerial, and Ridge Road running from top to bottom, roughly in the middle of the area. Uh, so you can see south of, of K96 and west of Ridge Road on West Village Circle, the area outlined in red is where the facility would be constructed. This is an architectural rendering of what the facility would look like. The company is requesting a letter of intent to issue industrial revenue bonds in an amount not to exceed $8,850,000, projects that it will create at least 33 new jobs with annual wages of $55,000 a year. They are requesting a 100% ad valorem tax abatement and sales tax exemption on eligible expenses. The company qualifies for 40% uh, property tax abatement based on the 33 new jobs. 50% based on the capital investment of $8,850,000 and 10% for being in a regional growth plan sector, that being health care, which qualifies them for 100% abatement. The estimated value of a 100% property tax abatement is approximately $166,000 with the city's share being approximately $44,000 a year. A cost-benefit analysis was conducted by the Center for Economic Development and Business Research at Wichita State University, which shows an overall ratio of benefits to costs of 1.34 to 1, 1.10 to 1 for the city's general fund, and 2.0 for the city's debt service fund. Therefore, it is staff's recommendation that the city council close the public hearing, adopt the resolution of intent, and authorize the necessary signatures. Eric Hatton and Jordan Anderson from Corterra of Wichita are here and can answer any questions specific to the company, and I would be happy to stand for any questions as well. Um, so, questions for staff. Just can you clarify for folks what industrial revenue bonds are or IRBs, and is the city on a hook for those? I've read some uh, misinformation online where I think folks assume that we are signing a check over to certain people, and uh, my understanding is that's not the case, but could, could you go ahead and, and educate us a on that? Absolutely. On that's a great question. Uh, industrial revenue bonds, generally speaking, are a paper transaction to achieve a property tax abatement and or a sales tax exemption. There is no city money that is actually issued as part of an industrial revenue bond issue. Again, the developers, Corterra in this case, will be going to their bank, getting their own financing, their own amortization, their own interest rate. We will not be involved in, in any of that. Uh, in fact, our all of our uh, uh, documents will be uh, subject to whatever their financing is. So uh, the city is not on the hook for anything. The city is not actually issue, uh, issuing any uh, money on behalf of this project. And um, so we are not on the hook for anything. It is, again, largely a transaction that is a paper transaction to achieve a property tax abatement based on their capital investment and job creation and a sales tax exemption for the project. Further questions for staff? Seeing none, we'll open up to public comment on this topic. Is there any public discussion on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on this item? If there is no further discussion, the chair recognizes Councilmember Fry as this item resides in District 5. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I had the opportunity recently to meet with the Corterra team, and thank you, Tim, for that introduction um, and the presentation. Uh, they shared with me their mission and what they plan to do with this facility. Um, this is something that fills a critical need in our community for seniors, especially those of us that have had family members had issues along these lines. So, and the fact that it's also adding to our medical economic opportunity cluster is a double bonus for us. So I thank you for bringing it to us. Uh, I also learned that the name Coterra is a Latin word meaning heartland. So uh, thank you for beginning the story of Coterra in Wichita, the heartland of the country. So best wishes to your continued success. Look forward to the ribbon cutting and having a full facility. So. With that, I will uh, make the motion that we close the public hearing, adopt the resolution of intent, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. 
Motion has been made and seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. <coughs> Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Notice of a public hearing regarding a proposal amendment to the Delano and Stadium Redevelopment Plan, West Bank Redevelopment District. Good morning, Mayor, members of the City Council. Mark Elder with the Office of Economic Development. Uh, the item before you today is just a request to set a public hearing for April 19th regarding an amendment to the project plan for the Delano and Stadium uh, project. Um, just a little bit of background uh, to get to where we are. So the West Bank Redevelopment District, or the TIF District, was originally established in 2017 uh, to support the new stadium that was being planned and the surrounding uh, redevelopment that was anticipated to occur. Uh, then in 2017, uh, the city council took action to expand that district to include uh, more of the Delano neighborhood to allow for additional improvements to occur in the neighborhood um, as project occur. Um, the project plan that, we're, uh, that will be discussed on April 19th was originally adopted in 2017, but hasn't changed since. Um, so the, this map here depicts the redevelopment district that includes both the original and the expanded area. Um, I'll actually show you a map in a little bit that kind of shows uh, that change that happened in 2019. Um, but there's been a lot of activity that's been happening uh, as a result of the city's investment in the area, including the stadium. Um, you know, first there was the advanced learning library that was completed, uh, following the Delano Catalyst uh, has been recently completed. That's 225 Sycamore Apartments, Home Two Suites, and Mocha's. Um, the Riverfront Stadium is complete, uh, but we also have new projects coming online. So, um, back in 2000, or in December of last year. Uh, City Council adopted MOU with the announced plans for the uh, stadium team and EPC to develop a hotel, office, retail, and a parking garage uh, adjacent to the stadium in the river. But there's also a lot of additional private development. Anytime you di drive down the lane, you're, you see construction uh, occurring with all this additional investment. Um, this map is just to show you the yellow is what was adopted in 2017, and the red area is that expanded district. Uh, that will allow any surplus TIF funds once we pay the bonds to uh, be used to adi uh, do additional investment within Delano. Just wanted to kind of recap uh, the project plan would then be expanded. I'm going to go back real quick. Um, one of the actions that we'll be looking at is the project plan anticipates the entire district. Right now it just covers the 2017, um, but one of the amendments that would be taking place would be to expand to uh, be this entire one. So the project plan mirrors what the district is uh, for future investment. Um, so with the uh, April 19th meeting, there would also be a presentation that goes along with uh, that team and EPC project where uh, we're, we're working on a, a minute development agreement with the team that would be brought forth at the same time with that. So I just want to kind of cover the next, next steps we're looking at for the 19th. Um, but again, this uh, action today is really just requesting a public hearing to discuss the amendment of project plan and the development agreement at that time. Um, with that, I would stand for any questions. Questions for staff? Seeing none. Thank you. The public input on this item. Welcome. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Celeste Reset, I'm concerned about changes to the Delano and Stadium Redevelopment Plan and West Bank Development Plan. What's changed from the original? We're still talking about a covered parking garage. We're still talking about public infrastructure. So I'm not sure why we need to expand the TIF district. And while we're talking about it, the city's already spent, let's review this, 42 million in star bonds. 13 million in CID bonds, 14 million in TIF bonds, and 16 million in GEO bonds. The revenue numbers for this area, as I've said before, were raised by city staff. They took the numbers from the consultants and they raised them to a best case scenario. And then what happened is, Lou passed away, COVID hit, and the worst case scenario we could have incurred on the stadium happened. And we're in a bad situation, so let's talk about that for a minute. In a nutshell, we have bond debt, and remember, star bond debt doesn't show up on the books. Star bond debt is not on the CAFR, but we're paying for it. 
And so if we don't meet the revenue for those bond payments, my question to you today, and I've left messages for staff, is how are we paying for it? What am I talking about? Let me give you some facts. I've got the latest star bond report from 2021. I'm hoping that some of you have read it as well. Ball Stadium revenue was projected to be $1 million, but according to the latest star bond report, it was less than half a million. So what we had to do is we're now tapping funds from a previous star bond district that gave us another $1 million. But it's not enough to meet the debt payment. So my question today is, how are we covering that debt? I'd like an answer from staff. The debt service requirement for 2021 was $1.8 million, and this amount must be paid this year as well. In just a few years, in fact, starting next year, principal payments are going to kick in on that debt, and our bond payments are going to jump up to over $2 million, and by 2026, when that first phase of the star bond we're tapping ends, it's going to be $4 million, and we won't be able to tap the first phase of that star bond district anymore. KSA requires you sunset it after 20 years. So we're going to be in a lot of trouble if we don't come up with some revenue from somewhere to pay for that debt. So that's my second question. How are we going to meet these increased payments? My third question is, how are we meeting CID bond debt payments? It's not published in the CAFR, so I'll be trying to meet with Mark Elder or the economic development staff to see how we're doing on the CID debt. And how are we doing on the TIF bond debt? Because that's difficult to find in the CAFR as well, so I'll be asking them to meet with me on that as well. And like I said, in four years, we won't be able to tag on to phase one revenue. So we're going to have to figure out where we're finding the money for this star bond, CID, TIF, and GEO bond debt that was incurred to build the new ball stadium and the Delano Hotel. One other question I had is, at one point, we were expecting $70 million from Sales Lifestyle Center and Water Walk. What happened to that? I don't remember Jack DeBoer ever coming through with a Sales Lifestyle Center that was going to give us $70 million. And since he didn't build it, did we put a clawback in that 99-year lease agreement on water walk development? That's another question I have. I'm also requesting, because former Mayor Longwell promised me this would be done, but it's not, that CID notices would be put in the front of any business that's tapping CID funds, such as homegrown restaurant down by NASCAR. I walked down there last night. It's been over a year since we had that CID district, and there's not one notice and any of those windows saying those funds are coming from taxpayers. So who's responsible for putting those notices up in the businesses? I'd sure like to ask that question, too. In reading about the Sedgwick County, and I hope you all have read this, too, it's the Economic Development Guidelines for TIF Districts. I'm going to read something that's a requirement of TIFs, and I'll end with this question. Developer will agree to not protest the value assessed by county appraisers during the life of the project unless actual values exceed projected values used in TIF analysis by at least 150%. Well, I'm going to file a CORA because I found out recently that the assessed values at Douglas and Hillside TIF were just dropped by over 50% because they protested. Yet it says you can't do that during the life of the TIF project. So if we're creating TIFs, and we're allowing the developers to protest the assessed values. You're letting taxpayers like me down. I don't get to protest my values. I don't get TIF funds. I think you need to look more carefully about these TIF expansions and look at the star bond numbers. And I want to have a meeting with the economic development staff, so I hope you will facilitate that meeting. Thank you. I'm not sure where to start. Um, Mr. Mayor, I can help if you like. If you could. Uh, there's a lot of <laughs> sure. misinformation sure. and also blending, I think, the last 15 plus years of economic development into that statement. A lot of confusion about what a star bond is, who's on the hook for that. We obviously, as a city, don't pay for star bonds. Could you go ahead and clarify sure. uh, roughly what was just said for the folks watching as we combat, I, I think, um, inaccurate information on Facebook nearly daily? Sure. Sure. Thank, thank you, Mayor. The, the first thing I want to say is um, 
the, the, there's a, the original question about why are we bringing this forward? Why are we looking at a change in a TIF plan? And that is because the development that was planned around the ballpark is actually being proposed on an accelerated basis, which means that we'll have more development quicker than what we had anticipated, which will help with our debt payments for star bonds for CID and TIF. All of that information will be uh, provided to the council uh, at the public hearing, and actually that information will be available prior to the public hearing so that you can assess the appropriateness of what we're gonna bring forward. So if I could stop you, yep. just so I can clarify this point. The expansion of a TIF district isn't actually spending more money, it is gaining more money. And therefore, if you have a argument that we will be in a position where we can't pay, pay, I guess, our uh, liabilities, the expansion of the TIS district is actually increasing the opportunity to pay for those for, for those liabilities. Is that an accurate assumption based right, on what I you just said? I want to be careful on our wording, right? So we're not expanding the district, but what we're doing is accelerating the development within the existing district. Okay. And, and that'll be done by the private so Expanding the development. That's correct, and that's done by the private developer. We, so we will bring to you, uh, in addition to just what uh, will be generated from this project, we'll also revisit for you the star bond pro forma as well as the TIF and CID um, debt pro forma or projections for the future. Um, in terms of uh, star bonds, yes, those are paid by sales tax generated from the project. And um, we will talk to the council about that during the public hearing again, what our obligations are. Uh, because in this star bond project, we did have a, a backstop uh, that was requested by the state uh, at the time that we um, uh, brought this forward for approval. Um, and can you just talk to us about who's on the hook for star bonds and how star bonds works? I think people assume that we're the ones who pay down star bond debt, but my understanding from being in the legislature is actually the legislature. Ms. Rosette is... is um, Correct that it doesn't appear on our books because it is not considered our debt. It is issued, uh, it's state debt, but we do have an obligation to have our all of the sales tax generated in that district to go towards the debt retirement. And then in this case, we do have a backstop so that if we come, if there is a shortfall projected at some point or actually realized at some point, then um, a portion of our sales tax receipts need to go for the payment uh, of that debt. But again, we'll bring those projections and, and uh, we'll look at what the original projections were and where we are now if this development goes forward. And the city will be in a better position as if the council does approve this next, this new phase. All right. For the input from the public. My name is Sybil Strump, <clears throat> 326 North Walnut. That lady is an intelligent person. The speaker. Um, I live in Delano. So I think that you guys need to learn to ask the people what they want done. Don't take it upon yourself to do it. I live in Delano. When you made that big ballpark, I was kind of sad because Lawrence Dumont Stadium had some issues. Yes, the bathrooms were kind of bad, um, but when you built that stadium, you also made people that want to go to the baseball game pay high cost of tickets, and and that's not right. And the traffic is going to be unbearable. I'm already going through it. I'm a pedestrian, and the lights don't work right, but the traffic is going to be more worse than what it is. You're going to have people that are like pedestrians getting almost hit by caught vehicles every day. You got to learn about that. You got to go get your traffic people to go down to Delano and learn about this stuff. And I agree with her. Who is going to pay the taxes? So far, the taxpayers have paid a lot. And I've also don't like that. 
I'm, you know, I'm paying for my house, prop, you know, my loan, uh, my uh, taxes. I don't think businesses should get tax exemption. I think they should have to pay just like the homeowners, pay for their taxes. Yes, I know that it's going to make a lot of employment for Wichita, but you got to learn pedestrians, we're already going through a lot of traffic. You know, on Seneca, West Douglas, I just talked to the, the one, Gary, I think his name is, I told him that this, the pedestrian lights are not going right. And I just, I just think you should reconsider that. Go have one of your traffic people go down to Delano and see really what's going on, you know, because it's bad already. We, we have so much traffic going on every day. I don't know if the 4th District Commissioner knows about it, the city 4th District, but I know about it. I have to go down the streets and it gets really bad. And like she said, she said, the taxpayers have been paid for. So let's just let the businesses pay for their own taxes and pay for the building, the place, and so forth. Thank you. Further input from the public. All right, we'll bring discussion back to the bench. My, I think it's really important that we have public discussions on these complex issues, but I would ask folks that we, we really dig in deep on what these mechanisms are and we stick to the facts. I think it puts us in a very, uh, particularly folks on the bench, in a very difficult situation if someone was to portray a star bond or portray a TIF or portray an IRB or portray some of these more, uh, uh, I, I guess, less known economic uh, uh, tools uh, in a way that, that is actually dishonest. Uh, that, that doesn't actually meet the facts of what those tools are, particularly if people are presenting themselves as subject matter experts. Uh, so it, it, it causes, I think, unnecessary stress and unnecessary uh, drama as we, we discuss these items. So therefore, I do want to, again, invite anyone who's interested in learning more about this topic, uh, learning more about exactly, well, who's on the hook for what based on each one of these, to, to reach out to the council. We've had staff do a tremendous amount of work when it comes to upgrading our website to have very uh, uh, specific definitions uh, explaining the ins and outs of these economic development tool sets uh, in a Kansas way, because a TIF in Kansas might be different than a TIF in another state, uh, or a star bond in Kansas might be different than, frankly, how it was seven years ago, uh, as these continuously uh, uh, change uh, within their methodology because of the legislature. So again, we just want to invite folks to uh, have these honest discussions with us. Some of this, uh, um, I, I think, discussions get into a little bit of these uh, wonky areas. And it's our job as the council to do what we can to really uh, uh, reach out to folks with uh, information so that we can have a higher level discussion on policy uh, and make sure that, that we're all on the same page. We might disagree on the issue, but let's, let's stay on the same page when it comes to the facts on what, we act what this does versus what that does. Uh, so again, we ask folks just to continue to reach out to us so we can continue uh, these conversations. Councilmember Fry. Thank you. Um, just a couple of follow-up questions from the previous speaker, Celestra Set. She asked about the CID notices at businesses in the district and who's responsible for making sure those are posted. And then she also brought up the question about uh, challenging the property value at Douglas and Hillside. And if that is accurate, I'd like an update on that. Thank you. Yep. I already made those notes. Thanks. Council Member Hohasel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this might be something that would be worthy of a workshop one of these days, just go through all of these um, tax issues and just put it out there, get all the information out there so it's clear for the public what exactly does what. And that's an excellent idea, Council Member. I'm wondering if perhaps we could work with staff, perhaps our communication department, in addition to uh, uh, a workshop where we could discuss some of these items, 
um, more in depth, perhaps even uh, producing videos uh, that could really give you kind of that, you know, thousand foot view of the difference between an, I, uh, a, um, an IRB and a TIFF, for instance. I, I think that uh, that will add to our um, commitment to transparency. And again, the goal is to have a higher level discussion about the complex policies that we have uh, so that we can uh, uh, better facilitate that feedback. And I, I think in the best way to do that is to take your suggestion, have more public outreach with these items and actually taking time within our own, um, within our own workshops uh, to go over and discuss some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, tools as well. Further discussion, Vice Mayor Tuttle. Thank you, I was taking notes when Ms. Reset was speaking as well, and the last thing that I got that I just wanted to make sure she said was that um, she wanted us to facilitate a meeting between her and the EcoDevo team. So I don't know who would be responsible for making sure that happens, but can we get that meeting scheduled? Thank you. Further discussion from the bench on this item or any comments germane to this item? Councilmember Ballard. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just had a question. So on the 19th, that'll be an opportunity for the public to come and speak as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Further discussion. If there is no further discussion, and Chair recognize Councilmember Bluebog as this resides in District 4 as well as District 6. However, Councilmember Bluebog has yet to have the floor today. Thank you very much, Mayor. Appreciate that. Um, and, and I do like some of the discussion here about the workshop or getting some more information together especially since, you know, so much has changed since the original plan and, and getting the ballpark out there. And, you know, we were going to have 200 and plus, some plus events. And I realize it's a little bit difficult in this environment to, to get some of the gigs and stuff going, but I think it'd be the opportunity to kind of go back to the drawing board and see where we're at and see, see how we can assist to make it better and, and help fulfill what our original um, vision was there. So I'd like to take staff's recommendation to adopt the resolution setting a public hearing on April 19th, 2022 to reconsider amendments to the Delano and Stadium Redevelopment Plan and West Bank Redevelopment District, authorize necessary signatures and direct staff to publish the resolution two consecutive weeks prior to the date set for the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Have received seven yay votes, that motion does pass. Madam Clerk. 2022 IT data cable replacement. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Tom Bush, deputy CIO for IT. Uh, this particular agenda item is for data cable replacement. This has been a multi-year project that has replaced cable and completed cable replacements on other floors of City Hall. This particular project will be for the first floor. Uh, there is uh, uh, $50,000 in the uh, general obligation bond funding for this, stable, this data uh, cable replacement. And our recommendation is uh, to uh, move forward with the initiation of this particular project. Stand for questions. Are there questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? See none. We'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on this item? If there is no further discussion, and Chair recognizes Councilmember Ballard as City Hall falls into District 6. I'll take the re staff's recommended action to approve this project, adopt the bonding resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. Motion has been made and seconded by Second. Vice Mayor Tuttle. Uh, with that, the clerk will open a roll. Members will cast their vote. We ask the clerk to hold the roll open. Actually, this item doesn't seem very controversial, so let's just move forward with it as six yeas to one absence. Motion does pass. Madam Clerk. 
City Hall Maintenance and Renovation. Hey, good morning, everybody. Ben Nelson, Public Works and Utilities. Uh, with this item, we're recommending approval of $205,000 in CIP budgeted funds to remodel primarily the first floor of City Hall. We have a generally uh, annual recurring line item that helps us uh, modernize our facility, the City Hall facility, make equipment upgrades, uh, reframe rooms, and basically to make programmatic updates and changes to the facility. Um, right now, over the last two years, we've had some temporary arrangements to facilitate uh, customer service primarily on the first floor. This is particularly regarding our Housing and Community Services Department as well as our water utility uh, customer service and what we would use these funds for uh, in working with a multi-departmental team to kind of plan a concept for the first floor is to make permanent changes to the first floor to make sure that customers continue to have a more centralized experience on the first floor. There'd be a new information desk, a new service desk for water and uh, housing community services as well as the necessary support and office spaces. Up here we see the con conceptual design. There'd be the new information desk to greet people as they walk into the lobby uh, before you, they'd get to where the uh, elevator cabs are. And primarily most of the improvements would be on the east side and the north side of the facility, which up to two years ago was mostly unused space where you'd have uh, uh, some new lobby and seating areas for people when they come in, as well as, again, the housing and community services uh, service area, as well as our water service area. All of these funds are budgeted in the CIP. We had $100,000 last year that we were holding off on uh, initiating until we got this concept design finished, and then $105,000 in this year for a combined total of $205,000. Uh, with that, we'd uh, recommend that we approve the project, adopt the bonding resolution, and authorize all the necessary signatures. I can stand for questions. No questions for staff. See none. Thank you. Is there input from the public? on the City Hall Maintenance and Renovation Item 5. Okay, my name is Sybil Strom. I reside at 326 North 1. What is CIP? Could he answer that? It's a capital improvement program there. Huh? It's a capital improvement program. It's the money we put aside to make capital improvements. Okay. Is the taxpayers going to have to pay for that too? I, be I believe this is a debt finance, so yes, it would be paid out of property tax debt service. Well, we're already paying a lot of property tax. My property tax is $986 or 1000 because I just had an appraiser come over to the house. I am not really for this. I mean, I've seen the city hall. I don't, I'm not for it. But if you're for it, that's your decision. But the taxpayers are tired of paying for things to get done. I mean, I was told that back in my, when I was young, you know, I'm told that when you get a house, you pay the taxes or they'll come and seize it. But you guys want the taxpayers to pay for the improvements of City Hall. I've seen City Hall. It's improved well. I mean, you got padded chairs. Back in 1984, I sat in chairs that were not cool, you know, not not comfortable. And then uh, I just don't think I want to pay the taxes for this thing to get done. Because I'm already paying like a thousand or two thousand on my house. I just got it done. And I can't, I'm not going to you guys. I'm not saying, hey, I got a new house. Will you pay my taxes? So you, your businesses have to start paying their own taxes. Stop giving them leeway because it's getting the taxpayers like me angry. I mean, I'm, I'm a peaceful person. Bra Brandon knows. Becky Tuttle knows. 
I'm a peaceful person. Even Fry knows. For, for knows. the record, I also know. I believe you're a yeah, peaceful person. Whip, Mr. Mayor Whipple knows that I'm not going to come down here and say, I don't like this. I don't like this. I've heard people say that. But I'm respectful. But I don't want to pay no more taxes. So thank you. And just a... And thank you for that. We we should um, have a opportunity to explain what what the purpose of this uh, uh, these renovations are because I, I I don't want people to assume that we're getting cushy chairs and getting extra cushy chairs. Well, it was here. nice. The chairs I'm they, for, you know. I I I came down to these meetings in 1984 after I did safety patrol at Franklin Elementary. And boy, that just, that was hard to, to even sit in. But you businesses need to pay your own way. We're paying our way. You need to pay your way. Thank you. Thank you. So Mr. Manager, maybe we can expand on this in the hopes of uh, clarifying to folks who, who might assume that, um, like I said, we're, we're doing more facade type upgrades, or for anyone who, who might assume that we're increasing taxes to do this, could you, could you talk a little bit more about this item and also uh, where, where, where the money comes from? Right. Uh, Mayor, first of all, this project uh, was anticipated in our budget, and so we're not talking about any increases in order to accomplish this as part of our long-range planning. I will tell you, though, that this project has been a little bit accelerated because it reflects the realities of COVID and how people wish to do business with us. So these funds will help create a customer service uh, center on the first floor of City Hall to make it more convenient for people to make payments or to seek information from us from multiple departments that will staff the center. So it's meant to be... Uh, Almost, it won't be completely one-stop shop because we do have some operations in the Reagan building, for instance, that people have to go to. But if you need to do business in City Hall, you'll be able to do it on the first floor in a very, in a much more convenient way than what you do today. Today, it's a, it's cumbersome, and confusing, I think, for our residents, and that that's what we would be doing with these dollars. So, if I was to sum up the the, the statement, basically, we have 13 floors here at City Hall. 14 if you get up to the storage, uh, any department that's really outward facing, that people would come and uh, go to that department uh, to, to try to get services, the goal is to make those more accessible uh, by putting the majority of, of some of our higher uh, um, utilized uh, uh, departments on the first floor uh, to make it not only easier, but also allow people to get in and out faster. And is that a, a decent description? It is. Plus, an information desk would be installed in a manner that would be very convenient so folks could ask for directions or ask how to do business with us, which is much easier than trying to go through a list and trying to guess on, you know, what does the housing department do and, you know, how do I process uh, my paperwork with them. Thank you. Is there further input from the public on this item? All right, we'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on item five from the bench? If not, the chair recognizes council member Ballard as this resides in district six. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate this project. Customer service is really important to me and city hall can be really intimidating in itself. So I think making it as easy and user friendly as possible is uh, helpful for everybody. So um, I would approve the project, adopt the bonding resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members will cast the vote. I've received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Replacement of large water meters. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of uh, City Council. Uh, Don Henry, Public Works and Utilities. The item before you is a capital improvement project that would replace um, aging commercial and industrial water meters. The city has a large number of meters that are greater in, than two inches that uh, serve uh, large flows in commercial and, and industrial facilities. 
Uh, 32 meters larger than six inches have been selected for replacement under this project due to their age and um, condition, functionality, and um, the uh, size of the service and the return on investment. Uh, the, the aged meters um, are a mechanical type meter that has an internal turbine that turns relative to the water that flows through them. As this type of meter ages um, near the end of the useful life, then the uh, turbine slows down. Therefore, the, the readings aren't as accurate. More water is being used than what is being read. And so this project would replace the failing turbine meters with the uh, best available technology. It's an ultrasonic meter that uses a transducer to use um, sound waves that pass through the water to measure the, uh, the flow and volume. And um, as well as replacing the meters, any um, aged um, plumbing and appurtenances would be replaced within the vaults. And we will also be play, uh, constructing bypasses uh, within the vaults to make future meter change outs easier and less disruptive for the customers. Um, we did run a small scale pilot project on eight of these meters over the last couple of years. And um, as anticipated, we saw improvements in the metering uh, measure consumption increased by 24%. Um, the revenue increase due to the uh, more accurate reading uh, was 16%. And if you assume the same type of outcomes under this project, then for these 32 accounts, um, the uh, revenue enhancement would be about um, $400,000 annually. And uh, this has been accounted for in the uh, utilities optimization program. Uh, funds are available in the approved CIP that includes uh, $500,000 remaining in 2021, $100,000 in 2022. Uh, therefore, it is recommended that uh, City Council approve the project, adopt the resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. Stand for any questions that you have at this time. Questions for staff. Councilmember Fry. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation, Don, and um, certainly glad to see we're going to be more efficient with this. My question is, have we shared or prepared our utility customers for this increase? I know we're not adjusting rates, but because it'll be more efficient, their bills will go up. So we should prepare them and let them know that this is happening. Yes, sir. We work very closely with each individual customer one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that, that's something that, you know, through the pilot project on, on the eight large accounts that we worked with, um, it, it worked very well. It, and, and you're right, it is disruptive to the production of these facilities. And so we want to give them heads up so they're able to budget for the change. Um, we want to um, work with them so that we're doing it at, at, at the time that is least um, disruptive for their production. And, and, and we can work that out on an individual basis. Yep. Councilmember Hoheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, where are these meters located? The meters are actually located on private properties. And so it's kind of unique because the vault itself is private property. And so we work with the uh, property owners to gain access to the vault. And then the change outs are done in a combination of staff um, and contract services. Um, a lot of these are pretty straightforward and staff is able to do the change outs ourselves, uh, ourselves. But then where we have the more complex change outs of appurtenances and plumbing, we may need assistance um, to do that. Further questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? Again, this item is about replacement of large water meters so that they now become accurate. My name is Sybil Strom. I reside at 326 North Walnut. Here we go again. Us taxpayers are paying for it. Our water bills are already going up. And you know, Alan King, for a while, the water meter was busted. And we all had to go get bottled water. And boy, that was expensive. You all do not understand. Us taxpayers don't have the money to, to get these water meters up to par. You know, it's getting out of hand. We ought to give the taxpayers a pat on the back. We're doing the stuff that they, they should have done. You know, like the water meter, how it busted. And we ended up getting 
bottled water. I have receipts of that. I'm going to tell Alan King that. We, we ain't got the money. We're barely making it. I mean, I, I'm a low income. I'm a senior citizen. I'm disabled. And I have a disabled son. And I'm already paying a lot. I'm paying, like I said, the property tax is $1,000 for my house, my new house, that I never, ever got to deal with. Um, boy, are we so nice to you all. We pay for everything. I know you pay taxes too. I know you do. But you got to consider there are senior citizens, there are disabled people, there are veterans, there are all kinds of people. They're just making it, barely. I have a daughter that works in an airplane plant, and she is not getting paid worth a darn, and she's having trouble, and she's a single parent. All my kids are out there working. That I've always taught them, go, if you want something, Go work for it. But they're going through a lot because you guys keep saying we our water bill will go up, our electric bill will go up, everything's going up. We don't have the funds all the time to pay for it. But if we don't pay the bill, we get turned off. So think about that too. Thank you. Councilmember Fry. Thank you. Um, Sybil, Ms. Strum. Just, just to be clear, this particular item is for water utility users yeah, and water. hold on, in industrial and commercial applications. Okay. So those water users pay for this increase well, through I hope their so. through their <laughs> bills, not you. I would also like to point out that, and our agenda has an item about three pieces down um, on water conservation efforts, where you as a homeowner can qualify for well, rebates. Well, I do conserve where you can qualify for rebates on items to lower your water bill. So you might want to stick around and pay attention to that one. All right. All right. Thank you. And I think it's important that we get into the details, give people peace of mind. Uh, this is about accurate readings. And again, as Councilmember Fry mentioned, this is on an industrial scale. Um, when we let our equipment become inaccurate, then we actually, or outdated, we actually run the risk of misreading uh, what, what customers uh, actually use and run the risk of actually overcharging customers. Uh, so again, this is not, this is to replace aging equipment and it will particularly affect the in, in industrial side, not the individual side. And I hope that it brings peace to mind to folks who uh, are, are worried that this will cause uh, uh, an increase in everyone's water bill. That's, that's not what this item does. Other input from the public? All right, so now we'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is the further discussion on this item? If there's no further discussion, then I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the project, adopt the resolution, and authorize necessary signatures. For chapter ordinance 211, this item requires a two thirds majority vote, which is five votes in parentheses. Thank you, legal. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members will cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Supplemental design agreement number one and funding for improvements to West Street, MacArthur Road, and 47th Street South. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. Gary Jansen, Public Works Engineering. Uh, the next two items are two separate projects related to improvements to West Street from I-2. 235 South to 47th Street, and I'll talk a little bit about why they're being developed and designed separately and then how we'll uh, logistically make that work for construction uh, to limit the inconvenience to the public. So starting on the first project is from um, MacArthur to 47th Street South. Some history on the project. In January of 2021, the City Council approved funding to develop a con uh, design concept for the project, which is before you for your consideration today. In July of last year, the City Council then approved an agreement with professional engineering consultants for development of that design concept. And in March of this year, the District Advisory Board approved this design concept by a vote of 9-0. Uh, just to show you real quickly where this is at, I mentioned two separate projects. The one in red 
This is what we're talking about first from MacArthur to 47th Street South. This is south of 235 uh, in the southwest quadrant of the city. Uh, we talked about this before um, when, when originally developing the thoughts for these projects. Uh, looking at the community investments plan shows the West Street Corridor uh, as a high growth area for new employment and one of the reasons why these improvements really are needed. Uh, there's a lot happening in this corridor already and, and the timing of this will be such that it will help get ahead of some of that and also we expect to spur additional development. Uh, to show you real quick the entire West Street Corridor and what's happened here starting at Kellogg at the top and going south. The red is improvements from uh, Kellogg to Harry that were completed last year. The green is currently under design as a project that we've talked about with the council before to make improvements to the intersection of West Street, K42, and Pawnee. Uh, a lot of industrial use of that intersection has been something we've looked at for a long time. We expect to get to construction sometime next year. It's turned into a lot bigger project than we had planned, but it's, the improvements definitely are needed. The red circle is the West Street and 235 interchange itself. We partnered with KDOT. Primarily, we tagged along with KDOT. They had a project over the last two years to make some improvements to that interchange. Our part of that included signalization of the ramp terminals. We also made some changes uh, to some of the geometrics and the paving around those ramp terminals to help accommodate some of the larger trucks that are currently using this corridor and expected in the future. And then the blue that you see are the, is the, the two projects that we were talking about today. So there's been a lot happening in this uh, corridor and there's a lot more coming. And again, uh, most of that comes from that community investments plan and the projections of what's, what's already happening here and what more is to come. Looking at uh, this section of West Street, it's similar for this full, just over a mile and a half corridor. Uh, it's, heavily in, it, it's heavy industrial and commercial right now. It's a rural section roadway with ditches for drainage, which I'll talk about more in just a moment. So uh, this is a little bit hard to see, so I'll show you a zoomed in section here in a minute. But starting at the left on the top where that red circle is, is the intersection of 47th Street right now. We don't see that the traffic counts would warrant a traffic signal, but it's something that we'll continue to look at as we go through design. What you see uh, towards the top of each is that the green section, uh, which would be on the west side of West Street, is where we're going to have to leave uh, the ditch in most of those areas. Generally, with these improvements to arterial streets, we try to lower the road and, and provide underground storm sewer such that we can get rid of the ditch sections. There are sections of our community uh, especially as we get to the fringes uh, in areas where the elevations won't allow that. And so we do have to leave some of the dis ditch sections in this area. And so through design, we'll make sure that that's manageable and will help still serve uh, the, the drainage needs. The yellow on the other side is a proposed 10-foot multi-use path. So to show you a little bit closer what this looks like, uh, two different sections. This will be a three-lane roadway, one lane in, in each direction with the center left turn lane which will help accommodate especially the increase in truck traffic in the area. The green on the, on the top, being on the west side again, is the proposed ditch section uh, that needs to stay in place on the west side. And then on the, on the east side is the proposed multi-use path. This project was reviewed with the uh, Wichita Bike Pet Advisory Board, and they were in support of the proposed multi-use path. We're going to struggle to put sidewalk on the west side, so that's why the proposal is here to put a wider path on the east side for the full length of both projects. This just shows uh, at one of the major entrances along West Street. Typically what we do on these arterial corridors is provide a deceleration lane into these developments. Uh, as those development grows and we have more traffic turning into them, it makes sense to provide this lane for uh, adds, adds for safety and gets them out of the main travel way just like the center left turn lane does. One thing I wanted to mention, sorry, I'll go back there. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but if you look um, kind of towards the top side of this, along the west side of the street, you can kind of see a tree row through there. And so I wanted to mention real quick, uh, we have been working staff from Public Works Engineering, Park Department, and City Manager's Office have been working on a draft tree policy. Uh, and what that policy uh, will help us do going forward is to give us uh, a way to be more consistent in how we inventory trees on projects, how we go about evaluating the condition and the age of those trees. Those are some of the things we do now. 
but this plan will really help us, again, be more consistent on all public projects going forward and how we go about doing that and analyzing where we think trees need to be removed, what happens with those trees, uh, uh, looking at whether they can be relocated, and then especially looking at a replanting or replacing policy uh, part of that of what we do uh, relative to the number of trees that are removed. Not every time we'll be able to replace trees on the same project. We get a lot of things happening underground in these arterial corridors that might limit where trees can go back, but the policy contemplates then finding other areas basically to use those credits and plant new trees. It's still in draft policy. What we're going to do with these two projects is apply that draft policy as we move forward, assuming your approval today, uh, with the consultants that we have. It'll give us a really, there's not a lot of trees on this, on this mile and a half corridor, which is probably okay, uh, because it'll give us the opportunity to kind of uh, work our way into the draft policy, work out some of the logistics, and, and figure our way through some of the kinks and some of the questions we've already got. So. I think that'll be a great opportunity for us to work on that. So I wanted to mention that, that we're going to do that on both of these projects. Uh, looking at the financial considerations, the design services fee to date is $95,000. Supplemental agreement before you is $360,000, bringing the total design fee to $455,000. The existing budget was approved in January of 2021. Staff recommends uh, initiating an additional $150,000 available in 2022 in the CIP bringing the total revised budget to $550,000. The project will be returned uh, to the council at a later date for construction funding. Staff recommends City Council approve the supplemental design agreement number one and revised budget, adopt the amending resolution authorizing necessary signatures. Uh, assuming your approval today, we're looking at starting construction probably in 2025. Uh, I mentioned before that there's two separate projects here, and so I might talk about that real quick. The North project that I'm going to talk about next has actually been awarded federal funding uh, through WAMPO, uh, the Wichita Metropolitan Planning Organization. That makes, uh, creates some issues that makes it a little bit easier to design, design the project separately. But we're, what we're going to do with both of these projects is we'll, we will bid for construction and build them such that it looks like one project to the public uh, so that we can create less disruption, uh, a lot less convenience, and get the projects done quicker. I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Questions for staff. Councilmember Hoheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so is this tree assessment policy going to start being enacted uh, with projects that we are currently getting under away with since this one won't be started until 2025? The, um, I, I don't know that I can answer that question. I think there's a desire to look at this tree policy in a workshop with council okay. uh, relatively soon. Uh, what we're looking this is our first opportunity during the initial design phase uh, to try to figure out how best this policy works. Uh, we, I'll, I'll tell you, because of uh, the impacts of COVID uh, and, and what that did to revenue, we don't have a lot of these major projects actually under construction right now. So I think the timing works fairly well. Um, uh, to, but, but to your point, it's not starting until 2025. We will have projects under construction prior to then. And I think we have the opportunity to look at that there too. I just want to mention, particularly for these, we are going to look at this policy, uh, and hopefully we can find a way to get that past the draft and get to a better place that we all feel comfortable with. We've got some other projects that are under design now that we'll try to do the same with. Okay. Another workshop. I, I think we're getting our uh, agenda full on workshops here. Uh, it's scheduled for the April workshop. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further questions for staff? All right, thank you, staff. Is there public input? On, Vice Mayor, I'm sorry, I saw your hand move. Are, are you trying to chime in? Thank you, I was gonna wait until we brought it back, but I'll just mention it real quickly. Um, I know Gary mentioned it on slide 113 of our packet today, but um, we did receive a letter on March 24th from the Wichita Bicycle Pedestrian and Advisory Board. So I just wanted to publicly thank them for their input on this. And they did recommend um, that we approve this because it, they feel it will provide walking and biking, public safety, and more convenient and accessible environment for the community. So I just wanted to thank the Wichita Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board for weighing in and providing their input. Thank you. Of course. Is there uh, input from the public on this item? <coughs> so
Sybil, you're getting your steps in today. <laughs> I'm making y'all laugh. Okay, my name is Sybil Strum. I recited 326 North Walnut. Delano area. Y'all brought that up. Um, who's going to pay for this? Can you tell me? Yeah. Um, so we have a budget each year that we get from taxes that are collected at the local level, um, opportunities from the federal level with grants, uh, money coming in from the state level. Uh, also, we leverage our funds with uh, the county at times. Overall, we have a, a bit of a funding mix uh, that we utilize that we can um, use that money that's set aside in, in our budgets to uh, pay for stuff that we vote on. So we set the budget aside, usually I think it's June or July is when we have our, and we're beginning our budget uh, workshops actually, supposedly today, uh, if we get out here in time. So uh, yeah, the way our system works is usually we, we discuss um, the money that, that we have coming in, those are projections, and then we talk about uh, covering, I, I guess we'd call it, you know, making the, the basics, making trains run on time. And then also uh, we, we talk about uh, making investments into not only our infrastructure, but also programs based on the input we get from the public. Well, I do believe that West Street needs some sidewalks because I've been down West Street. I've been to West Kellogg. On one side of the street, there's no sidewalk. You got to go up a little hill. You know, Gary needs to know that. I'll tell him about that. But I just wanted to know who was going to pay for it. Thank you. Of course. Further input from the public. All right, if there's no further input from the public, then we'll go ahead and pass the floor over to Councilmember Bluebog as this item resides in District 4. Thank you very much, Mayor. And I appreciate everybody's input, and I appreciate staff working with us, um, as well as the, um, the um, bicycle and um, walking authority, because this is, this is something that got brought up to us months ago, is to make sure, that while, while this is key to the industrial area of the city, we wanted to make sure that this was very walkable, and, and, and it is a um, key path for, for people biking or, or um, walking or getting in and out of South Wichita. So, so I, I think it is important that we've been able to work together with that and add that to the plan. So I'd like to take the staff's recommended action to approve the supplemental design agreement number one and revise budget, adopt the amending resolution and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open roll. Members will cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes, that motion does pass. Now, we are going to go into the next item because it's, it's really kind of an addition of the current uh, conversation. But I, I am uh, thinking about if there's no objection after the next item, taking a 10 minute break so folks can get some caffeine, particularly after last night. Uh, I think many of us were watching the game, but also uh, if, if folks need to take a break, we've been going for a little over or we'll be going for about three hours consistently, and we have 13 items left after we get to the next item, eight, and we have people who want to speak. So I uh, just want to kind of put that in the back of folks' minds. Once we get through the next item, if there's no objection, then we can uh, go ahead and, and take a, a quick 10-minute break. Next item, or Madam Clerk. Supplemental design agreement number one and funding for improvements to West Street, I-235 to MacArthur Road. Uh, okay. Mayor, Council Members, Gary Jansen, one more time, and I, I will be quick because quite a bit of the information that's in this was already covered. So this is supplemental design agreement request and for approval of design concept for West Street again, this time from I-235 to MacArthur, the north section of what we talked about. History is, is the same. In January of 2021, the City Council approved funding. In July of 2021, uh, approved an agreement with WSP for design. And on March 7th, the District Advisory Board approved the proposed design concept by a vote of 8 to 1. You saw this slide uh, that shows the, we're, we're talking about the blue project now from MacArthur to 235. I mentioned uh, what's happening in this area, the Community Investments Plan, and again, the recap of all the projects that are happening along West Street. So it's currently a two-lane asphalt mat road, just like uh, the other section, uh, primarily industrial and commercial in nature. I might mention real quick, uh, and, and, and to 
capitalize on what uh, Council Member Blueball mentioned because I wasn't real clear with that, the purpose of that 10-foot trail. There is uh, quite a bit of residential development near 47th Street South and West Street, and, and those are the people we had heard from in that area. To want, they wanted to make sure they had access to and from other areas. So, so we hear this quite often, again, in meeting with the Bike Pit Advisory Board. <laughs> Even in areas that are not primarily residential, there's still a de desire for walkability. Uh, this looks very similar. So looking back towards 235 to the north, again, a lot of... Uh, so, so I will tell you, in looking at traffic counts for this area, we've come up with a little bit different hybrid of how the, uh, the pavement section will work, which I'll show you closely in a minute. This, again, is an overall view on the top left being the intersection of MacArthur, so we'll, we will uh, be constructing a new traffic signal there on the west side of West Street, which is towards the top of this view. Again, the green is, is where we need to leave the ditches in place to accommodate drainage, the yellow being the multi-use path. So what we've decided to do here, based on current traffic counts and traffic projections, there's a lot of traffic going to these businesses southbound from 235 to MacArthur. Uh, accordingly, we're going to provide two lanes southbound because what happens is there's a lot of southbound right turns into those businesses. That allows through traffic to use that inside lane uh, without getting stopped. We do have the space here to make that work and still accommodate the drainage. By the center left turn lane and the northbound traffic will be accommodated by a single lane only. You can see the multi-use path again on the east side and the ditch uh, for drainage on the west. As we get further towards the north end of this project, it does open back up to a five lane roadway. Uh, to tie into the ramp terminal at 235. The design fee to date is just under $120,000. The cost of the supplemental design agreement before you today is $289,820 for a total design fee of just under $410,000. The existing budget was approved by the City Council in January of 2021. Staff recommends initiating $150,000 that's available in 2022 in the adopted CIP for right-of-way acquisition and staff oversight of the project, bringing the t total design budget to $425,000. And again, we will bring the project back at a later date for approval of construction funding. This project, this north section of this project, does include funding, uh, federal funding from WAMPO, um, uh, which always helps offset our, our, uh, our funding, which I want to clarify on both projects. City's funding is local sales tax, which is included in our, uh, currently included in our capital improvement program. Staff recommend City Council approve supplemental design agreement number one, a revised budget, adopt the meeting resolution, authorize the necessary signatures, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilmember Fry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary, um, so looking at the last project and this project, they both seem to be very similar design with um, the concrete ditch and the bike path and so forth, but the previous one was a three lane with the center turn. This is a four lane with the center turn plus a traffic signal, but yet the total design budget is $125,000 less. Why is that? On the, you're saying that this, this section we're looking at the total design budget? It's $125,000 less than the previous one and it's got more complication than the previous one. The, uh, the biggest reason is is because that first project is a, almost a full mile long. This is this is just over a half a mile from 235 to MacArthur, anywhere between half and three. So it's a shorter project. Uh, the traffic signal MacArthur is already there. Uh, so to design upgrades to traffic signal is, is really not that big of an effort. And, and whether you're looking at It'll cost more construction-wise, but the difference between designing even a three-lane roadway and a five-lane roadway, the, the design effort's really not that much different. Were they were the design contracts let out at the same time? Uh, not quite. One of the reasons why this is two separate projects also is because the funding to accommodate uh, the capacity, annual capacity within the CIP, these projects are actually in two different years. Um, and so we, the, the, we solicited for design at the same time. And we felt that it made sense to have two different design consultants to make sure we could stay on track, not knowing when they would be constructed. Uh, so you also see, um, the, and I can get you more details, uh, but, but anything, a little bit like, again, related to construction, design's the same way. The north section is a shorter project in the south. Uh, so from a, a, a time effort, it'll take them less time to design it, too. Okay, well, again, I'm not a... Just a layman here looking at it. It just seemed like this one was 
more complicated, and that's why I didn't understand. They, I don't know that it is. Uh, with the added lane, does not add to any any complication really at all. Uh, the total length of the project really is probably what makes the biggest difference that I'd mentioned. Okay. As far as from a, a, the amount of time it takes them to design it, and the, and the traffic signal itself. Uh, because a lot of these are standard enough, uh, it's not really a tremendous effort. Okay. All right, further questions for staff? Seeing none, thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? <coughs> Seeing none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on this item? If there is no further discussion, then the chair will recognize Councilmember Bluebog as this uh, falls into <laughs> District 4. Thank you very much again, Mayor. I'd like to <clears throat> make the recommended action to approve the supplemental design agreement number one, revised budget, adopt the amending resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Having received seven yay votes, that motion does pass. All right, we will recess until 12.02. Um, so recess for 10 minutes so that council members can uh, take a quick break. We'll come back at 12.02. Thank you.
continue on the agenda, uh, Madam Clerk. Water Conservation 2022 Rebate Program. This is a fun one. <laughs> Welcome. Hey, good morning, Mayor, City Council, Penny Feist, Public Works and Utilities. Here this morning to present um, the item for consideration, the Water Conservation Rebate Program for 2022. And the city has offered a rebate program since 2013. Let me turn up your microphone. I think there's some people talking in the background. Go ahead. And it's uh, designed to encourage residents to install water efficient devices uh, in their homes and around their property. And um, since we've implemented the program, we believe that we've saved more than 450 million gallons um, through participation. And that isn't just good for customers and lowering their water bill. That's good for us as we seek to lower our water demand over time. Um, so for the 2022 program, we are proposing that it be administered in the same fashion as previous years, which includes the allocation of $100,000. And the program would run until that money has been expended or December 31st, whichever comes first. I'm sorry. We're going to ask folks who are gathered in the audience to so please... If you, if you must discuss among yourselves, please whisper. We want to make sure that staff has their um, has the respect they deserve to present this. Uh, so please continue. Thank you. Um, and so the eligibility requirements are again the same, but those include you must be a city of Wichita water customer. And the reason for that is uh, if approved, the rebate is applied to the water account. So therefore you have to be a city of Wichita water customer. Each account is eligible for up to five rebates per year. And then we have our website, which is www.savewichawater.com, which includes a lot of details for the program, including a list of eligible devices. So we'll look at the types of devices that are eligible, but there are specific models and brands that uh, meet the water efficiency criteria. And this site also hosts um, our application that you can complete online, as well as our contact information in case you want to give us a call to ask any questions. Because uh, today's April 5th, and if approved, this program would begin tomorrow, we are proposing that it be retroactive to January 1st so that any customers who have already purchased efficient devices could be considered for the 2022 program. This is the list of the type of devices or appliances that are eligible and the corresponding rebate amount. And like I said before, um, if approved, the rebate amount will be reflected as a credit on the City of Wichita water bill, so customers might be able to forego a water bill payment for a month or two. This is a history of devices purchased over the years, and pretty consistently we see uh, high efficiency toilets and dishwashers being the most popular items. In addition to the rebate program, uh, we conduct public outreach and so social media messaging to let residents know the things that they can do every day to reduce their water use. A lot of information is on the website, and a recent addition to the website is the irrigation estimator, which would allow someone who's using potable water to irrigate their lawn to estimate how many gallons they're actually using and what the impact on their bill might be. I'm not sure that's my recommended action. <laughs> but we, the recommended action is that. Uh, so um, this one is the city council approved the 2022 water conservation rebate program. Excellent. Um, count, um, start that one again. Uh, questions for staff. Council member Fry. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation, Penny. And since we've been doing this since 2013, and we're making this retroactive to January 1st. Do we have an idea of when these funds typically dry up? So um, usually we get a big influx of applications right after the program's authorized in April, um, and then um, we begin to dwindle in about October, and so we start doing some more social media messaging and outreach to let people know that funds are still available. That creates another influx, and then they're usually expended by the end of November. Okay. Thank you. All right, further questions for staff? See none. Is there input from the public on this item? Good morning, City Council. 
although I'm not here to speak on this, but I do want to support this effort. I have a huge bill, but I also did not know that there was a rebate program in place. I do do social media. So I'm speaking on behalf, I'm going to say on behalf of those elders within our community who do not do social media, who do not have electronics in their home to message them. Can we make sure that this information is put in the water bill, but also another way to get to those people who are not within this communication stream? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Further input from the public on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on the water conservation rebate program? If there's no further discussion, then I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the 2022 water conservation rebate program. Is there Second. a second? Seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open roll. Members cast the vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. General <coughs> obligation notes sale. Good morning, Mayor, members of the City Council. Mark Vang of the Department of Finance. Uh, Penny kind of stole my thunder there by showing my recommended action slide, I guess. So, uh, today I want to report the uh, uh, results of our most recent bond sale. Recall that you approved this uh, sale on March 1st. The sale actually occurred on March 31st, and we only had one series of notes in this most recent sale. Just a reminder, we typically sell in uh, March and September, so we typically come before you in April and October of each year. So temporary notes are just used to finance in-progress projects. So projects that are going on right now will we'll borrow money on a very short-term basis to help us uh, pay the cost of those projects. Uh, so these notes will mature in six months in October of 2022. Uh, when they do mature, we'll, we will uh, retire them. We typically do that either by issuing bonds or sometimes we pay them off with cash or sometimes we use other sources. So we issued uh, $27 million, $28 million. Uh, this generally provided for two different things. About half of it was for special assessment projects, and about half of it was for general obligation bond or general obligation projects. Uh, so we'd like to look at the results of our sale, and we'd like to, to try to determine how were those results. Uh, we sold these notes at a rate of 1.36%. So what we do is we look at how many bidders we had, and we had five bids, which is a good number. Uh, we want to have at least three, and we had five, so that means we had a very competitive sale. We also look at rates of other jurisdictions in, in the Midwest and what they're selling at, and this is pretty consistent with what uh, they've sold at recently. This is considerably higher than our last uh, note sale, but as you know, our interest rate environment has been a little, uh, a little uh, under stress for the last uh, year or so. Uh, the bid is uh, recommended to be awarded to B of A Securities. Uh, so with that, we'd recommend that you approve the award of the bid, adopt the note resolu uh, resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Is there questions for staff? See none. Is there input from the public on this item? See none. We'll bring discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on this item? If there is no further discussion, then I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to ratify the award of the bid by the city manager or his designee, appoint the note resolution and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Which has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. I've received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Request for renaming of the Maya Angelou Northeast Branch Library. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Jamie Prother, the Director of Libraries for Wichita Public Library. Um, we received a request from a community member to consider renaming the Maya Angelou Northeast Branch. Um, in honor of um, a local politician who has made a lasting impact on the community. Um, did a little bit of background research related to um, how the Maya Angelou branch was named. Um, there was a naming committee back in 96. And um, at that point, it was determined to um, name the building in honor of Dr. Maya Angelou. So um, this is um, associated with policy 13 
and the law department's affirmed that the policy complies or the request to recommend a naming committee um, is aligned with the policy 13. Um, we did a little bit of research as well and to move towards renaming any of our facilities at, at the neighborhood branch size, it's about $5,000. The recommendation is to um, have city council appoint the library board as a naming committee to determine and review the co or the community members request and make a recommendation regarding um, the request to rename the branch. I'll stand for any questions. Questions on this item. Councilmember Bluebog. Thank you very much, Mayor. Do we have any history of renaming a building actual after a council has voted to go through the naming process and the name of name a building and then we go back and change that? Not for the last 13 years. I'm not sure that we had anything prior to that as well. I, I don't know that this has come up before. Typically, the, the namings, are, are they supposed to be just, do they have a shelf life? Are they only for so long? Or do it, is it open to change the times? How, do you have any other historical knowledge on this? No, but I think the council wanted the flexibility to be able to consider a renaming. For instance, there could be a facility named after someone who has a, a you know, it's discovered has, you know, a, an inappropriate background. Um, and that's that's discovered later after the naming. It gives the council the flexibility to be able to change that name through its normal process. Um, that's not what that's not the circumstances here. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, <coughs> Councilmember Hohheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is my first rodeo in this uh, area. Could you um, just walk me through the process real quick and how much public input would be included in uh, the committee? before they make their recommendations? Sure, this is gonna be my first rodeo too, but from what I understand, the library board would um, receive the request from the community member, um, who I believe is here today, um, and can probably speak a little bit more about interests, but um, the library board would receive it, um, likely engage a broader community engagement effort from the Walters and the Evergreen Libraries. I understand that that was a really large undertaking to understand what the majority of our community was after. Then they would review that, discern, and then make any sort of recommendation. I think also um, in this review they could they could make other determinations, but it would be up to the naming committee to kind of take the facts, assess what's needed, and then carry forward. Councilmember Ballard. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my question is for Councilmember Johnson. I just wondered, since this is in your district, I've seen some pretty heated conversations on social media surrounding this topic, and I just wondered um, if you had talked to anybody or if you had been receiving any input, um, maybe that wasn't on social media for everybody, just for some insight. Before we get to you, well, of course, we'll let Councilmember Johnson re respond to that if he desires. But before we get to discussion on the bench, we want to make sure that we get all the questions out for staff oh, sure, sure. as well. But if Councilmember Johnson wishes to chime in now or, or later, that, of course, is, is his preference. Um, Sorry. Happy to chime in after we ask staff questions. Sure. Is there further questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Uh, we will um, allow for, for Council Member Johnson to come in if, the, if he wishes to make a statement now as another member has, has asked him a question. And then we open it up to public discussion and then we bring discussion back to the bench and that's where we have open discussion. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I guess the strongest sentiments are that uh, disappointment that this is happening, a real feeling of um, divisiveness where there shouldn't be and that not being what Mr. McCray stood for. Um, the first letters of support that I have seen are the ones that were delivered today. Everything else has just been, why are we doing this? And, and as we get into public discussion, I do want to point out today, there is no actionable item to actually rename the North Branch Library. Uh, that's not on the agenda today. What's on the agenda today is uh, possibly uh, sending this to the, to the library board to go through the process which would have public engagement uh, in which would 
have then serve as that board that decides weighing the public engagement if this is something that they would recommend for the council to take on. Uh, so I just want to lay out this process to folks who, who, who are new, frankly, uh, to uh, what we do here on you know, Tuesday mornings when most, most people are at work or in school. Uh, but also, um, I think that some of the discussion online uh, that I've seen over the weekend uh, somewhat overlooks that this isn't being done today, that, that uh, this is uh, beginning a process that began with a member of the community uh, bringing this forward, and this is the process that, uh, how, how it plays out. So I, I do want to make that clear that this right now is not the vote to rename uh, really anything at this time. Uh, so with that, um, we will open up to public comment. Again, we ask folks, if you please stick to the five minutes, please be respectful of others' times. If there is someone who said the, uh, made the point that you, that you, you are wishing to make, uh, please don't feel obligated to come up and make that same point. Uh, we want to be uh, respectful uh, of folks of their time and also uh, ensure that we, um, we, we facilitate a, a good discussion. Oh, and also, uh, of course, we ask folks uh, before your five minutes starts to state your name and your address if you are so comfortable um, stating your address for the record. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and City Council. I'm James Barfield. Uh, I've been before you guys many times, but today I say great pleasure in addressing you all and the public in regards to one of the city's most effective public servants. I'm not going to use the word politician because Billy Q. McRae was above being a politician. As I say, he dedicated his life 37 years, I'm sorry, 27 years in Wichita as a public servant. But before I begin that, I have a couple of things I want to clear up. As you just alluded to, over the last few days on social media, there were several insinuations, there were several rumors, there were several lies that were formed by people that made comments on emotion with the absence of any knowledge of what this proposal contained. They had no idea. They'd never seen the proposal. They didn't know who wrote the proposal. They didn't know who presented the proposal. Didn't know what was in it. So it was all rumors, insinuations, and lies. So what I want to do, first of all, for the benefit of the public that has not had an opportunity to see nor view this proposal. I want to take the opportunity, if you will allow me, to read my proposal. And this proposal was presented to the city manager on January the 20th. Ladies and gentlemen, I am writing this letter today to request a name change for the Maya Angelo Northeast Library. This library branch was built and opened in 1996. It was dedicated to and named in honor of Maya Angelou. At that time, the city had a policy of only naming buildings after deceased individuals. An exception was made in this case, allowing Mrs. Angelou's name to adorn this building, adorned, I'm sorry, to adorn this building for over 25 years. At the dedication, Mrs. Angelo herself mentioned that she had never heard of a library being dedicated to a living person. My request today is to change the name in honor of a man whom I consider as being the most committed, dedicated, African-American public servant for the last century in Wichita. The man I speak of spent over 27 years rep representing Wichita residents of all colors and stripes, black, white, Hispanic, gay, straight, etc. 
in addition to being a dedicated public servant, he was also a committed civil rights champion. His name is Billy Q. McCray. Mr. McCray was born October 29, 1927, near Gary, Oklahoma. He attended Booker T. Washington High School in Dover, Oklahoma, and the University of Colorado, as well as Langston University. In the late 1940s, he joined the U.S. Air Force, where he learned photography. In 1951, he was stationed at McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita. After being discharged from military service, he decided to remain in Wichita. In the 1960s, Mr. McCray became active in the NAACP, speaking out on the need for fair housing regulations. When the 77th District was created in Northeast Wichita, he ran for state legislature as a Democrat, and he won. He served in the House from 1986, I'm sorry, 1966, until he was elected to the Senate. Seven years he served in the House of Representatives. He served in the Senate from 1972 until 1984. In 1984, McCray became the director of the Office of Minority Business in the Kansas Department of Economic Development. He was elected to the Sedgwick County Commission in 1986, where he served until 1993. In addition to politics, Mr. McCray founded the neighborhood newspaper, The Community Voice, as well as McCray and Associates, a consulting firm that helped entrepreneurs land government contracts. Mr. McCray met the love of his life, Yvette Williams in Wichita. The two were married in 1963 and had four children, two boys and two girls. The marriage lasted for 42 years until the untimely death of Yvette in 1995. Billy McCray died June the 2nd, 2012. Among his accomplishments and his contributions to the Wichita, Sedgwick County, and the state of Kansas, he passed the Kansas Fair Housing Law in February of 1970. Now this was after he had been attempted and failed on at least two occasions before him. But this demonstrated the uncanny ability that Mr. McCray had to cross the aisle and work with people who were in a different party than he was. And he accomplished what had been unattainable previously. That was in 1970. He passed the Kansas Small Business Act in 1978. He led the effort to increase the Sedgwick County Commission from three to five. That was in 1981. He helped to establish the Kansas Food Bank. He led the effort to consolidate all state offices in Wichita into the old, formerly vacant, Ennis Building. These are just a few of the major accomplishments and contributions that Mr. Billy McCray made to the city of Wichita and the state of Kansas. Now I want to clear up one other thing. This proposal Nowhere in this proposal does this letter, nor does my intention, dishonor, discredit Maya Angelou. Nowhere in this letter, nowhere in any comments that I've ever made regarding this has any intention of doing that. But that was part of what you, read, or you saw on the news media. I'm sorry, the social media, okay? So emotions is not knowledge. Speaking on emotions without knowledge is not the wisest thing to do. Now, Mr. Mayor, you insinuated that I had played the system or gamed the system. Nothing can be further from the truth. Everything I did from start to finish was according to city policy. I was instructed 
to follow this policy by, I think the lady that just spoke here from the library, from the city manager. I'm going to interrupt for one moment. What I'm sorry? word? What I'm sorry? would make? I, I'm going to interrupt for one moment. Yes. Sir. What would make you assume that I accused you of playing the system? Because I have no recollection of making any. A comment that you made on that very social media platform. Okay. Well, I, you, you said something to the effect, I can't say word for word. You said, we learned today that an individual had learned to use, I can't quote your word. Administrative the process, and once the, it, it triggers what we're going through. Okay, and I just want to clear up as, as we go forward, I meant no indication that you were abusing the system or playing the system. I was more highlighting the fact that this was a community request and not a request coming from, from the council. So I, I do want to apologize to you if you believe uh, that, that my intent was to be, be more of an accusation because that that's not, was not my intent. But okay, please, uh, please continue. Just, just ask you one question. Would you agree with me that that could be interpreted as me gaming the system? I understand. Okay, thank you. All right, now, I want to go and tell you about Policy number, your policy, not mine, your policy number 13, which relates to naming of public buildings. And it says, and as you just mentioned there, in assisting naming public facilities, a naming advisory committee shall be as needed. Each such council member will nominate one person to serve on the committee. Appointing should be residents of the city, okay, and 18 years of age. Now, we skip further down, and it says here, the person being distinguished must be one who has made a significant contribution to the city. I want you to let that sit in for a minute. The person being distinguished must be one who has made a significant contribution or, uh, to the city. And then we go down to this. We'll address what we just discussed. My proposal was sent to your legal department for evaluation. And my proposal was determined to be compliant with city policy. Okay? So we're we're twice the time. I'm so sorry? we're twice the, the normal time for someone to, to give this. So I'm just bringing it to your attention. You can continue. But we, we do have other speakers who, who also have, have come to speak. And uh, I, I think we have at least 10 other items. So normally it's five minutes. You've been... I think for about 10 minutes, so I want to bring it to your attention that uh, we, we are over time, but please finish your thought. My last city policy will address the question that was asked by, I believe, Mr. Bluebaugh. The naming of city-owned facilities shall not be limited to new facilities. Existing facilities may be renamed. Now, you know, I want to tell you something. I want to relate a story to you that was told to me by my father when I was five years old. Charity begins at home and spreads abroad. You know? Now, another thing I think about is I was driving here this morning. I heard on the radio Bill Self and talking about this championship they won last night. And he related a story that he was told by his dad. Nothing is given Everything must be earned. Okay? So what puzzles me and what brought me to write this proposal was the fact that in June we'll be the, celebrate the 10th year of Mr. Billy McRae's death. And in that 10 years, the name Billy McRae, the most comp accomplished, dedicated, committed, and effective African-American public servant in the last 100 years has not been on the name nor the radar of anybody on the, since, since the city council since Billy McRae died in 2012. That, to me, is unbelievable. If I can borrow a word from the gentleman that started this all on social media, I cannot phantom how that could be. A man who has dedicated and contributed so much to this city, this county, and this state can be overlooked 
for 10 years. It's unbelievable. Now, the people, I'm going to try to wrap this up, the people that made those initial posts on social media did not have, as I said, access to this proposal. They didn't know what was in it. So there was all kinds of misinformation or whatever. However, I want to stand here and tell you today, to several of those people, I sent a copy of this to them. And to a T, all of them did a 180. I distributed to you all several letters from people that had seen the letter, read the letter, understood the letter, my proposal, and you will see that reflected in the letters that you have before you. Sir, I'm going to request that you're about four times over the, the time to present. We're not voting on this item today. I think you're, you're making an argument about why we should honor this individual, and I understand that, but again, can we get to the, the other speakers as, as well? We're about 20 minutes in, 15 minutes into your uh, five-minute presentation. Please continue. Okay. Well, the only thing that I'm suggesting here, sir, is that you all do for Mr. Billy McCray what you've done for others before him and give him his proper respect and his proper due and uplift his name as I am doing here this morning. That is my purpose here. Now, Finally, I'll say this to you. I am very disappointed if what is alleged to be true by the Wichita Eagle, the certain members of this council, yes, or not yesterday, on Monday, on Friday, insulted Billy McCray by, and disparaged Billy McCray by calling him Billy the Kid. No, that's not Billy McCray. Nowhere close. And I am disgusted, Mr. Mayor, if you allowed those comments to go unchecked. I'm sorry. Finally, I'm going to say this. Uh, just Mr. McCray, backing up. Did, Mr. McCray. Did, I'm going to back up because that was an accusation to the council. Did... I said it was alleged. I didn't say it. Okay, did, I said, was this, was this true. printed? I'm not sure what we're referring to. You mentioned the Eagle. I haven't seen an article released about this, but I, I'd be interested in learning more about what what that information is. Is there an article printed somewhere that didn't come to my yes, attention? It is. Yes, sir, it is. And of course, if it's someone in, was. It's uh, in today's paper, sir. Okay. It was. I'd have to check. Thank right. you. Now, all I want to say is Mr. McCray, for all of his contributions, gets less respect than Rodney Dangerfield. We have officers of the Wichita Police Department that have circulated text messages denigrating homophobic, misogynistic, and racial text that get more respect than Billy McCray. There's something wrong with that picture. I'll stand for any questions. Are there any questions at this time? So I guess my clarifying question would be, and just as, as we continue this, this community conversation, because I think that we're now having a wider conversation with the community about uh, not just uh, um, uh, McCray, but also about naming uh, 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 businesses, or no, excuse me, uh, naming uh, uh, libraries after leaders in our community. Are is there something specific to the library and with Mr. McCray that makes it so your your request is that particular library uh, versus naming? anything that is appropriate after Mr. McCray. So some of the feedback I've gotten is um, the idea of pretty much removing the name of a national African-American female uh, a leader and then replacing it with a local uh, uh, African-American leader 
is there a very is there a specific reason why the the application is asking to do that, which as was pointed out by the question from my colleague, would be one of the first times we've done that. Because we're essentially reversing an earlier decision that was made by an earlier council in the library board. So I, I just want to know why, why not name something that hasn't been named yet after a leader? Uh, what, what was the thinking, I guess, behind that? Well, the thinking behind that was, as I said, for the 10 years as Mr. McRae has been deceased, He's not been on anybody's radar for anything or any building, any nothing. Of course. That's what I'm talking about. Now, as I said, this policy allowed for a renaming of city-owned buildings. It allows for that. What I did was I rightfully and legally exercised my right, okay, to address uh, what I saw as a void, an ignorance, okay, and a disrespect for one of our city's best known heroes. This gentleman I speak of was the epitome of a, uh, of a hero as a role model, as a citizen. Let me explain to you. Mr. McCray, as a local hero, as such, he wasn't passing through town. Mr. McCray got married in Wichita raised four children in Wichita, bought a home in Wichita, paid city taxes, paid property taxes, and all that. Right. And we have a tradition, a rich tradition in this city of naming, honoring, promoting people that have roots here. Mr. McRae was one of us. So, but my question, and I just want some background on this, would any library would it be okay to name any library hypothetically after Mr. McCray, or is the intent specifically to replace Maya Angelo's name with Mr. McCray's name? It, what what is because that I think there's two there there are two discussions happening. One is honoring Mr. McCray, which I think the overwhelming majority, particularly after the the well thought out and elegant um, uh, statements that you have made about him. That's one that I think a lot of people understand the importance of that. The other question, though, and this is what I'm trying to understand, is the intent to remove uh, uh, Ms. Angelo from, from, from a position of honor in order to replace it with Mr. McRae, or is there the ability to, to, I guess, expand the pie where we can name something else after Mr. McRae that's equally as important. You just hit the nail on the head, sir. Okay. <laughs> okay? You just hit the nail on the head. There, there's not a single person, even those people that might disagree with me on this proposal, there's not a single person that you will talk to, that I have talked to, that will disagree that Billy McRae has earned and deserves a monument in the city of Wichita right. in honor of him. Right. Now, okay. if you've got a better proposal, I'm open. My ears are wide open. And, and that's exactly what I'm asking, is, is if we came up with another proposal that was acceptable, is that something that, that you as the, the uh, community leader who has initiated this conversation, is that something that we can discuss as well? Absolutely. And we find, you know... You, let me the, just say this to you, sir. A win-win instead of a win-lose. I agree with you 100%. If you can give me a specific proposal with a specific time limit, I'm willing to talk and willing to listen. Yes, ma yes sir. Thank okay. you for that. And I appreciate the, the presentation and, uh, of course, the thorough presentation, and, and it's worth giving uh, extra time for, for such a well-prepared presentation. So I appreciate you being here. And it, with your permission, uh, there's no one on the board currently for, for questions. Uh, with your permission, can we move on to, to other folks who, who are here to speak on this? Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. All right. So we are in public discussion. Again, we're asking folks to stick to five minutes, of course. The chair has discretion. Uh, Mr. Barfield has made it clear in the past that uh, uh, he, he's he'll go over a little bit to make his point, and I respect that. And, and in this situation, I think that it's important that we 
stick to the time, but if, if you go a little bit over, that's fine. It's more important that we make uh, our, our points and then, but also be respectful to the people who are here. So, uh, welcome. My name is Sybil Strom. I reside at 326 North Walnut. I think Billy McRae is a great guy. He's the one that got me in politics. He sat down with me in the city hall saying, Sybil, I want you to go after these people that are taking our money. <laughs> and it's really been great for me. I started, I met Billy McRae, I think it was in 1984. And he just kept coming to the city council meetings and he kept elbowing me and saying, get up there and tell them what you think. I think it's a great proposal. I have been to District 1. I have been to barbecues in District 1. I know Levanta, uh, Levanta Williams. I know a lot of people down there. I know Brandon Johnson. I know uh, my friend, I can't remember her name now. She was a Harlem Globetrotter. Lynette Woodard. Yeah. I went to school with Lynette Woodard. And we, we just loved each other. You know, we were just like sisters. And I think it's a great proposal. Let's make it be Billy McRae. Because if it wasn't for Billy McRae, I wouldn't be up here. He sat there and told me, Sybil, you got it. You got to know how. Maybe these people might not think you're smart, but I have the know how. And I think it's a great proposal. Let's change it to Billy McRae. Thank you. So again, I, I just want to stress the fact that we are not voting today to change the name of any building. We are talking about moving this proposal forward to the um, library board. Or if folks have a different uh, uh, board in mind or another way to continue this engagement, we, we should have that conversation as well. Uh, so I, I just want to point out, we're, we're, it's less talking about the proposal as it is talking about the process and what's the appropriate next step forward so we can get community input. Sir, welcome. Hello, I'm Kevin Harrison, 1562 North Kenmore, Wichita, Kansas. I am a assistant professor of social sciences at Wichita State University and the director for the Cohen Honors College there um, for, di for diversity. Um, I'm going to be, thanks for having me, I'm going to be concise out of respect for the other agenda items. And I want to start by saying that my viewpoints are no disrespect to Mr. Barfield or Mr. McRae. I think both are phenomenal individuals. Mr. Barfield has been a great advocate to the community, both um, from the standpoint of an entrepreneurship example as also just promoting civil rights within the community. And um, Mr. McRae has been a mentor for me. I grew up in a church where he was a member. He was even the photographer at my parents' wedding. So I love Mr. McRae. So all the phenomenal things said about him were 100% true. Um, that said, I grew up in the 67219 zip code in predominantly black Matlock Heights neighborhood, just blocks away from the university that currently employs me. During my childhood, however, there was a great divide between the university and that community where I lived to the point that we weren't necessarily embraced by the university. Instead, treated kind of like the, the unwanted uh, ghetto, I guess, for lack of better words, that neighbored it. Um, a ghetto that was created by 1937 redlining lining efforts administered by the FDR administration and executed by the very council that each of you currently serve on. Prior to Dr. George Rogers serving on this very council, very minimal efforts were made from this city to rectify this dilemma. Currently, the black community enjoys a much more inclusive environment as neighbors with the university, and I think some of your efforts are or the reason for some of that. And also the efforts of Dr. Rogers, some of the things that he implemented during his tenure on the council. The Maya Angela Library is one of the byproducts of this legacy. In fact, both the legacy of Dr. Rogers and of Maya Angelo are directly connected to this library. Deeper still, this is a legacy that speaks to the commitment to the community and a commitment to meaningful change. My concern is that while Mr. Cray is beyond worthy of recognition for his great accomplishments, I advise you to find another space to honor his achievements. I go even further and ask why is it that when it comes to people of color, the legacy of one needs to be erased in order for us to 
promote the legacy of another, wouldn't it not be in the best interest to shine the light on two, 10, 50, 1,000 community heroes? Take, for instance, the light bulb that lights this very room. Everyone in here probably knows that Thomas Edison invented it. Very few know the black inventor, Lewis Latimer created the carbon filament inside it that allows it to burn longer than eight to 10 seconds. Um, why is that? Well, probably because we continue to overshadow the accomplishments. So why turn off Maya's light, George Rogers' light, just to turn on Mr. McCray's? Why can't we shine those lights at the same time simultaneously? And so I ask you this, I want you to consider the legacy and the relationship that Maya Angelou has with words, and sometimes we're taught as kids, sticks and stones break bones, but words don't hurt. But tell that to my mother when she heard the word guilty right before my brother went to serve a five-year prison sentence. Tell that to all of the family members who were told, we're sorry, there's nothing we can do to save your loved one. On the flip side, the same way that words have the power to break down, they have the words to uplift. You take a look at the blue state of Georgia that we just witnessed, we take that all the way back to those words of Martin Luther King, free at last, free at last, I thank God Almighty I'm free at last, that led to the legislation in 64 and 65 Civil Rights Act and Voters' Rights Acts that took place in those years. So, I just want you to consider these final thoughts. 1969 was the year I was born. That was also the year that I know why the Cage Bird Sing was published by Maya Angelou. This is words that empowered black girls to, 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 persevere, to persevere through adversity. And so many women have been empowered by that. But then Maya doubled down on that with Phenomenal Woman in, in inviting black girls to just love themselves and, and, and the beauty that's in their blackness. And you have to think about how important that is when we live in an era where music and, 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 and arts and mainstream is so degrading to women, particularly women of color with racial epitaphs and all of these sexual and misogynist things that go on in this music and the lyrics. And then you have these words that say you are phenomenal. You, you can be anything you want to be, and that's not a light that we want to turn off. And then the last thing I just want to say is that Maya was a part of this community. A lot of people don't know this, but she served for a semester at Wichita State as an adjunct, as an adjunct professor. So when you take a look at the libraries, uh, excuse me, uh, how close the library is to Wichita State, and it sits in between a community and a university, and we talk about the power in education, the power in knowledge, and we talk about the library being an epicenter for knowledge, I think it's just really appropriate that we keep her name on there. But at the same time, as you already spoke to, Mayor Whipple, look for some place that, that represents the legacy of Mr. McCray. Um, I think a lot of the things the city council are currently doing, and um, I know I speak to uh, Councilman John Johnson, Johnson fairly regularly, I know that there are some efforts in place to create some, some entrepreneurial hubs for people of color. And, and that's, there's so much empowerment in that. So as you continue to develop those things, I would just ask that you consider that Mr. McCray's name be considered in some of those conversations. And I believe that that's the last thing that I have to say, other than that Maya's legacy speaks to the heart of the black community, speaks to education, and it speaks to the beauty of the black experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. All right, so I understand um, folks being supportive after someone speaks. I will ask that when people are speaking, please not to clap or do anything that could be distracting while people are speaking because I, I, I worry that folks will, will, will again become distracted and we, we want to make sure that we are respectful and hear from everyone. Ma'am, welcome. Good morning once again. My name is Wakila Martinez. I'm an administrator of the African American Council of Elders. We spoke on this at our general meeting um, on Saturday, and um, it's already been said. Our council believes that why is it that we only get one building named after one hero or shero? The history of Maya Angelou in this this city goes back to 1973 when she came and spent a month at Wichita State University um, teaching many of us who were not only in theater but also throughout the entire campus history that we had not heard of. Before she came, we thought this quote, if you, can't, if, if you don't learn from your history, you're doomed to repeat it. 
That has always been told as something that Winston Churchill said. And then there was another man after that. But it was actually said by a servant of one of the popes as he talked about the human bondage and what was going on in the world at that time, long ago. So her presence did several things for us. I happened to be in theater at that time. I happened to be on campus, one of those students who said, we need minority studies, one of those students that started black theater, one of those students that started black student union. The point is this, why is it that we have to go through, African Americans in this city have to go through years of conversation about what we deserve in terms of recognition and memorial. Maya Angelou contributed a great deal to this place. She is a literary shero. The library represents her very well. And when you think about the work of Honorable Billy McCray, he deserves more than a library that sits down. And you, you'll miss it if you don't see now the beautiful mural that's on it and is used by our community. But Billy McCray, Honorable Billy McCray was greater for all of us, state, county, city. Why would you give this man's memorial a la corner in Northeast Wichita for us and our children to see that some of you never, how many of you on city council have been to the Maya Angelou Library other than for a ribbon cutting? How many of you take children there or suggest that children go to that library? How many of you sitting on city council tell people that that is available, it's easy accessibility and so forth? I think that as a whole, the council of elders would like to know why we have to lose one historical name and put another one on there when this man deserves so much more. And by the way, we can all say that we've known and we've lived through great political uh, achievements by people of color. But I'm here to tell you that anybody who is of color, who sits in a political position in this country, in this city, in this state, struggles, fights, and has to go through far more than any of you to contribute to the whole. And I'm not just talking about black folks, I'm talking about how they sit in these rooms, in these positions, and they're called to consider the whole, not just one, but the whole. So please, consider our suggestion, our recommendation is that we go forward and look for an appropriate edifice that represents the impact of this man's work in the state. One of our, I will tell you, and I always like to end with comedy, one of our council members said, well, we should just get them to name the new water building, the new water system, the filtration system. We should just put his name on there and everybody will know who Billy McCray actually was. So I, I mean, I don't consider it to be humorous. I think it's a good idea. But again, there are buildings that deserve this man's name and not just the library. Thank you. And um, Elder, it, it just I would love the conversation to continue as well uh, within leadership within our community about what would be an appropriate uh, uh, either park, building, what, what would be appropriate to honor uh, uh, McRae? Because I think that we have uh, folks who, who, who are interested in moving forward with honoring uh, uh, local leaders, but, but again, uh, I'd love some more input, some more public input, uh, because going to the library board means it's specific to a library. Yeah. We, we rena rename lots of things. So yeah. uh, please continue with these discussions and let's keep that two-way communication open so that we can get that information back to the council uh, to figure out you know, how, how else to move forward with this uh, if it 
uh, goes away for, from the library board. Would you recommend creating a committee? We, I, I think we, we, we might get to that. Okay, thank yes. you. Yes. I, I agree. Thank, thank you. you. Further public comment on this item. All right, we'll bring discussion back to the bench. And we will continue with our public comment. Yes. Uh, my name is Reverend Dale Williams. I'm assistant pastor of the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church. Um, I retired from Bond of 36 years and I knew uh, Senator McCray uh, and his family as well. Uh, the thing is, is I see that you done said now that you would be willing to, you know, put his name on something. It just, I work in the prison ministry as well. I'm a mentor for success. Of, uh, and we have Hutchison Prison as our church that we, you know, minister to. And, and it just, to me, that so many uh, young men now in the street are having too many problems and we're trying to help correct those. It's just good to know that somebody come out of your own, your own area that they can relate to, you know, when you talk to them about uh, changing their life, doing better down here. So one day maybe their name can be put on a, a building or some for the great things that they accomplish in life. Uh, so many of us and myself as well coming up, you know, didn't have a lot of hope. You know, we uh, had people that uh, would say one thing and, and mean something else. But I try to practice what I preach. You know, uh, it was brought to me a man's word is more than this bond, you know, uh, back then they just did a handshake, now you need contracts. But uh, just to add, uh, we'd be willing, whatever, you know, the city council and, and, and y'all approve, because it is honorable to him for his legacy. And, and that's my thoughts as well. Thank you. Thank you. For the public discussion. See now, let's go ahead and bring discussion back to the bench. Again, let's open up discussion here where the recommendation was to have this go through the process that's very specific to the request, which is to have the library board serve as the naming committee. However, as we continue the discussion, if there's other ideas as well where we could have other uh, um, boards or uh, uh, take on this, this conversation, I, I think that's appropriate as well. So. Uh, starting off the discussion, the chair recognizes Councilmember Bluebog. Thank, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, you know, just hearing about Mr. McCray more, I, I would like to, to to know additionally and see if is is there other opportunities. You know, maybe maybe, maybe the library is not the best fit. Maybe if he, if he, it sounds like he did a lot with fair housing. Is is you know is there opportunities with our with you know the growth of our our new affordable housing and stuff, I just um, I, I I at this point I don't know whether sending it to the library board is the appropriate um, avenue to take or or finding out just just lear learning more about him and, and seeing um, where is a good fit. Councilmember Ballard. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm kind of going along the same lines as um, Councilmember Bluebaugh, like is could we get some type of committee together to maybe make a list of options or like get some suggestions because um, I think if we follow the motion that is suggested as just going to the library board and maybe that's something that's on the list as well um, I'm not sure but I think we're just kind of isolating ourselves to to only the library if we choose to go um, that route thank you Further discussion. So I, I, I think moving forward, and I'd appreciate council's help with this, there's a couple things I think we can do, and of course staff's help with this. The process from A to B was a request for a particular name of a library. So it comes from the administration to the bench, 
to the library board who is empowered with the ability to name libraries. However, after the discussion from the public, it feels like there's other op options besides a library that people might be interested in, in, uh, uh, in using as, as, a, as a platform to, um, to promote our, our local leaders. Uh, so I'm wondering if there, and I'm trying to, I'm looking for feedback, I'm trying to thread a, thread a, a needle here, could we allow this to go through the process with the library board, but also perhaps direct staff uh, to bring it up to, let's say, uh, the Diversity and Inclusion and Civil Rights Board and ask if they're interested in being uh, in that discussion about other parks or other streets or other areas, uh, perhaps looking a little deeper into um, uh, Mr. McCray's uh, uh, political achievements. Uh, it was mentioned that he does, uh, has been essential in entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, are there other opportunities to uh, perhaps name it a business center or one of these other, uh, um, I guess have been closer to, to the work that he has done uh, within his public service. And, and I'm just, I don't want to blindside a board by like just sending this work to them. The library board's kind of already, you guys have signed up for this, right? Like we, anything that uh, is a naming of a library comes to the board, they already know this. But there are other boards out there that usually don't handle this type of work, uh, but could we actually empower them to do that before we get to the idea of just assigning an entire new task force? So I'm just opening this up for discussion. That's my thoughts. How do we get a win-win out of this instead of a lose-win? Uh, Council Member Tuttle, oh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Tuttle. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm, kind of, I'm thinking along the same lines of you that I'm not sure that it's appropriate just to send it to the library board for them to have to say yay or nay. No decision has to be made right now. We can take some time to think about this and make sure that this man and this community leader is appropriately respected. And so I also have some apprehension of taking Maya Angelou's name off of the library because in some ways to me it seems disrespectful. Um, so nothing has to be done right now. This isn't a time-bound issue. So what I was thinking was along the same lines as the mayor of maybe we take this to the Diversity and Civil Rights, it's Diversity, Inclusion, Civil Rights Advisory Board. Maybe we have another committee. I'd be interested in speaking with his family to see if they have something that they would recommend he was very passionate about. I heard housing, but there might be other options that would be a more appropriate fit. So um, I... Right now, I'm leaning toward not sending it to the library board so that we can take more time to see if there's a more appropriate way to respect and honor this community leader. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, one, I'm happy to hear this conversation going the way it is. I'll say most of what I was gonna say. Um, I do wanna challenge us though, as although this was presented to us as a city council, uh, Commissioner, State Rep, and State Senator Billy Q. McCray also served on different levels of government. Um, we do know that there's county investment coming. Um, we, we know that there's state investment happening at Wichita State. So if we create a committee, I think we should be reaching out as well to those levels. Uh, and I think that would be deserving uh, of his name as well. And specifically, although our policy says existing buildings, someone of his stature, to me, would be more deserving new facility um, in, in either of those levels. It could be city, but I think we also have to acknowledge how high up he went as well in that consideration. And as we open up the discussion, I, I believe, I'm, I'm trying to think off the top of my head what boards have actually gone through a naming process before, and uh, is there one of our joint boards with the county uh, that has taken this on in, in the past? Uh, who, who might be able to work on this as well, or maybe a new task force is uh, recommended, perhaps even uh, District 1's DAB, maybe combining with a unbunk with uh, uh, the county's DAB uh, that, that overlaps the, the, the boundaries. Uh, you know, let's, let's think about is, 
because when we kind of put this in the in, in a particular department, we are limited by what those departments control. So like the library board's not going to come back and recommend a park. Uh, park board is not going to come back and recommend a building. Uh, so is there a way in which we can create this, the environment for this conversation to continue and to come up with really good and viable options without also artificially eliminating what those options might be, frankly, by sending it to a committee that would be more, or a committee or a board that would be more, um, would be more limited in, in their abilities. So, uh, Mr. Manager, we, we would be interested in your, uh, your advice. Um, Mayor, um, as you know, the uh, naming policy allows for you to appoint a specific committee. It doesn't have to be an existing one. You can uh, create your own. I think based on what Councilmember Johnson said, if you're trying to get l different levels of government involved as well as community representatives, it may be best for the council to appoint a special naming committee with a representation as just as you determine um, so that you have the, the right group of people and then you're not wed to any process. We, I, I, I was trying to think of a group, you know, existing group, and I'm not sure there is one that exists um, that would meet your criteria. And so maybe a special committee appointed by the council would be the best way to go forward. And, and that's, that's also an idea. Um, Vice Mayor Tuttle. Thank you, and, and I was gonna propose the same thing, that's great. I was just gonna ask legal a question. Is there a way that when we do this, and I'm not saying you know how it's gonna, what motion's gonna be made, but I would be apprehensive for this body, and this is just my opinion, to say no, we're not going to send it, like to deny, to, to turn this down or to you know, not have it pass. Instead, a motion of not going to the naming committee, but the actionable item is. So that way the community knows that we have intention and that we plan to do something. And then it also holds us accountable to that. So I, I just want to see if, if, if that's the, I'm hearing that's the direction we're all wanting to go, if there's some guidance on how we do that. Thank you, Jennifer. The, the council has a policy, and I think you have discretion in how to apply that. So I think the discussion today is consistent with that policy. Councilmember Hohheisel. Uh, would it be advisable to maybe just table this for a month until we can come up with a idea as far as a naming board and then revisit, revisit it here the beginning of next month and see which is the best way to go? So, and that's... That's definitely a possibility as we continue the discussion that might be something we do. So for those who are watching, if we were to table an item, we don't bring it back unless it has a motion to untable the item and the intent would be to table an item while having like a plan B uh, in place that would, sounds like we're leaning towards an actual uh, committee appointed uh, for this particular task instead of taking advantage of a board that's already uh, established. So those are the options. Uh, um, that that I, I would only support tabling this item if there was a path forward to continue the uh, the intent of this item, which is to honor a community member. So uh, this is the time to make those to talk about about our options. I think that that is a very good option. Uh, Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, following the lines of Councilmember Hoheisel, uh, rather than table, um, would it be maybe better to defer until? the first Tuesday in May, which is May 3rd, and during that time work with, if he's amenable to it, Mr. Barfield um, and some others to uh, get some names uh, for the council to consider for that committee and maybe make some uh, connections for him to kind of get working on what we could do outside of the library. So, and, and just for those who, who, who are following, the procedural suggestion from Councilmember Johnson that's different from the procedural suggestion from Councilmember Hoheisel is if we vote to defer or delay, it has a date in which it comes back to us without us making a motion to bring it back. It, it somewhat serves as, a, um, as, as an insurance policy in case we don't actually get another council together, then uh, it automatically comes up again on the agenda, uh, which means that by that time we have more information. So that's the two options I think that we're, we're discussing and, um, and we can 
have those, those conversations continue. Uh, Council Member Holhazel. Yeah, I think Johnson, uh, Council Member Johnson's suggestion is is one I would support out of the two. Okay, so if I'm hearing it right, the there may be a motion to defer this item as a item for the renaming of a library to defer it to come back at a later date on the agenda and in the meantime to research uh, who could potentially be on a board focused just for this particular renaming and then we would come back and appoint that board but if for some reason that board isn't appointed or the council decides to go another way, then we're back on the item in which we're discussing today. So plan B is we could still put this to the, the board. Uh, is that an accurate description of, of, of where I think we might be heading? Uh, Councilman Boholheisel is back on the board for additional discussion. Thank you. Um, not to add too much more on here, but would it be advisable to maybe just come up with an outline as far as uh, naming buildings from this point forward? And just have a have some sort of board that meets maybe once a year to look at that and include that in this possible solution. I think that we should discuss that as part of as we we dig in deeper with these boards. And my and so today might in my opinion might not be the time to 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 dive dive into an overarching policy at this point. There are different circumstances when it comes to naming. There are some. Uh, where it's really kind of a no-brainer in the sense that uh, whatever we are renaming really doesn't have much of a name. And then there are situations like this where the person who we are looking to honor has particular work, a body of work, so it's very, uh, how do we pinpoint that? So, and then there, so I, I, I like that the current policy is somewhat flexible in which that you know, we, we, can, we can adapt it to different situations we find ourselves in. Um, so, but, but I think that, that that should also be in the back of our mind as we think about this particular board if that's the way we go. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's good feedback. I'm just not sure if we need to make that decision today because it, it is overarching policy. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yes. I probably know better than to throw myself into the middle of your process. Um, but I'm hearing consensus that you want to create a special naming committee. The council could simply today indicate your, that you could vote on that, that you're going to have a special naming committee, and then the council can make appointments over the next few weeks to that. Instead of deferring, I think you just simply say, we are gonna create it, and the council members will come forward with their individual um, appointments. So I think that's another option, unless the council has some um, you know, ambivalence regarding going that direction. Given that advice, the chair recognizes Councilmember Johnson for discussion, but also for a motion, if, if, <laughs> if so felt. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so my question was procedural, and I haven't written down anything for a motion yet, but if we, if we did what you suggested, Bob, would, that, would the motion include not taking staff's recommended action, but another action instead? So it would be saying no to sending this to the library board, but instead of creating the board that we're talking about. You know, I could let Jennifer jump in if I'm wrong here, but I think, I don't know that you have to reject the staff's recommendation. You just come up with your own motion. We, you do that often, you know, it's, you know, where you go in a different direction than recommended. So the, I, I don't think you have to take that first step. And, and I don't want to overcomplicate things, but the, the request was for the renaming of a particular library if we switch, make a motion to create a new naming committee, um, then the current request is still there technically. Correct. And thus, should we, it gets back to the original procedural conversation, should we uh, defer this item, so this item is now off the agenda and deferred, and then create a new motion. And you can do it all in one motion, but a new, we would handle this item as is, set it aside, and then a motion would be to create a new board for the naming committee as well. 
Right. And well, you wouldn't, I don't think you'd have to do the deferral because you would take this request from Mr. Barfield and that would go to the committee, right? So you'd still have on the table his request for the, to change the name of the library, but you would give them the freedom to look at other facilities. And I think that was the intent of creating the naming okay. committee. Okay. So we can, we can defer from the original request. Okay. Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. I have one question, if the council's okay, for a member of the public. It seems like it's okay. Mr. Barfield, um, would you be okay with this? If you could. Sorry. I would be okay with the naming of a new naming committee if you don't take my original proposal off the table. Now, the other thing I want to say, uh, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned streets and parks. I would say, in talking with the family of Mr. McRae, that would not be appropriate. I think that would not live up to the contributions, the commitment, dedication that Mr. McCray's life, his 27 years of public service, wants more than that. So you believe it has to be a library? No, 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 I didn't say that. Okay. I simply said streets and parks, I think, should be off the table. I'm talking about a monument. I understand. Okay. And I, I think where we're heading is to allow a committee to have a more global look at different opportunities for, for, for naming something. And since it is your proposal, you, you would be involved uh, in that discussion as well. I, I'm, I'm certain if, if you choose to be. Uh, so I, I think that um, we, we might be able to work out the best way to move forward. And of course, your voice would be valued and that type of conversation where this is more appropriate than that, I think we, we would need you at the table uh, to, to help so that there's not the unintended consequence in which we assume that we are honoring someone, but it turns out uh, that the feeling of the family uh, is that they're not being honored. That's something we, of course, want to avoid. Okay. Uh, let me just close by saying this. And this is speaking for me. I'm here today, as you already know, to uplift the name of Billy McCray. Billy McRae made significant, major contributions. I want any building or monument to equal what Mr. Billy McRae contributed to this city and this state. Understood. All right, well, let's... Uh... By the way, we've been here for a long time today, a uh, long meeting, but I do want to point out, this is legislation in action, by the way. Like, I'm really glad that we're having a full-fledged discussion about how to achieve the goal, uh, even if that goal ha has changed um, targets, I guess, through discussion. So I do want to just thank those who are following, those who are still here, who, who might be here waiting to speak on a different item in the council for really diving into this. With that, uh, let's... Uh, it seems like it's the consent of the council, and we'll make a motion make it, to make it uh, official, to adopt a naming committee instead of referring this item to the library board to refer this item to a new naming committee uh, that will be able to look at this request but also brainstorm other opportunities as well. Uh, for possible renaming of facilities. Is that an accurate, is there anyone who would disagree with that assumption? Okay, so with that, I will talk a lot. John, go ahead, uh, Councilmember <laughs> Johnson, if you're interested in making a motion, wordsmithing something. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so I will try this out. Jennifer, let me know if I'm <laughs> off base here. I would move that the Wichita City Council adopt a Billy Q. McRae naming committee to explore opportunities to name a facility for the Honorable Billy Q. McRae at the city, county, and or state levels um, with 
the one requirement that both Mr. Barfield and a family representative specifically be a part of that. And in, in, in this, it's the, with the understanding that every council member will have an appointee to that. Yes. So it would be a seven member, um, it would be a seven member uh, committee at this time. Yep. Seven plus two, the two that he requires. Seven plus two or? We'll this, figure it out. This is why, this is why we, we have these discussions. <laughs> How about seven plus two? Because I don't know which family member would want to be a part of that. And then Mr. Barfield led this, this effort. We'll be given the option to be a part. Yeah. Um, very good. Uh, that's the motion. However, before we get to the second, uh, Councilmember Fry jumped on the board and thus has the floor. Councilmember <clears throat> Fry. Thank you. Um, and this is no disrespect to the life and career of Mr. McCray, but I'm wondering if this then commits us to naming something for him via that motion. I think we've heard evidence today that it's worthy of that, but by virtue of the language that you just put, that commits us to making that happen. And if there is research or due diligence done during the next few weeks that may run counter to that, are we already committed to doing this? I'm afraid that what we've done is we've upended the entire process of how we go about naming. We talked about this on Friday, a little bit about um, how this is a hole in our system, right? And that we've got a naming committee for libraries, we have a naming committee for parks, but when other opportunities are brought to us, we don't have a clear cut policy. And the last hour or however long we've talked about this, We've unpacked a lot of different issues, and I'm afraid we're rushing to something in the spirit of wanting to honor a person who's done great work in our community, but I don't know that we've really thought this out well enough yet. And I appreciate the delay that we may have in order to get this right, but I'm afraid if we take your motion the way it's worded, we're committed to doing that without any unintended consequences. Oh, and I'll chime in. The motion is actually a bit of a rewording of the current staff's recommended action with the motion. And thus to, I guess, assume that the committee to explore options for naming a building after an individual, I would argue, is not the same as committing to naming something after that individual because we are only committing to the committee process of doing that, just like if we pass the motion as is, we are not committing the library board to, we're not, we're not determining an outcome. The motion, the way I interpret it, is determining a process. And there is no such thing as committing the council to an action unless they vote on that action. And thus, the outcome of the committee is not to supersede the vote and the public discussion of the, uh, of the council, which means we are not delegating unlawfully, in that case, our powers as elected officials to an unelected board or appointed board. My interpretation of the motion is to allow that appointed board to make represent, uh, recommendations to the council, but the council would then still have to vote on those recommendations in an open meeting. Uh, so. Could we read the motion back, please? So, uh, of course, and, if, and that is, uh, I think, the intent. So if, if there is any wordage in the motion and legal would like to help us, um, then, uh, uh, of course, we, we, we would want the intent to, to match the, the motion. So. I agree with you. you. Want me to read it back? Please, uh, council member. <laughs> I have chicken scratch, so we'll try it again. All right, I will move that the Wichita City Council adopt a Billy Q. McCray naming committee to explore opportunities to name a facility for the Honorable Billy Q. McCray at the city, county, and or state level with um, two specific positions as Mr. Barfield and a family representative to that committee. And is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Motion has been made and then seconded 
Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Rise to a point of parliament procedure for legal. Does this, um, the creation of a board as we just did, is that immediately take effect? Which means could we appoint uh, during the appointment process today, uh, Mr. Barfield to be on that and, and head that committee or do we need to wait until next meeting? Under the, in the policy 13 says that a council, each council member can create it, you know, you, you can create the naming advisory committee. It does say each council member will nominate one person to serve on the committee. Um, but there's some criteria. They shall be residents. They need to be 18 years of age. Of course. Um, th that kind of thing. But I don't think anything prevents you from making those appointments at any time. Okay. Thank you. Just want to clear that up. Um, so with that, we are now on item 12, Madam Clerk. Funding agreement with Sedgwick County for Housing First program. Good afternoon, Mr. Welcome. Mayor and members of the council. My name is Shelley Hopped and I am a senior housing specialist within the Housing and Community Services Department. I also administer the Housing First program for the city of Wichita. In 2006, the City Council and Sedgwick County Commission authorized the Task Force on Ending Chronic Homelessness. The task force met and conducted research over an 18-month period and presented its recommendation to both elected bodies in March of 2008. One of the task force recommendations was the creation of the Housing First program, which was endorsed by the City Council and the City, excuse me, and the County Commission. The rationale behind the Housing First program is to assist the chronically homeless by placing them directly into permanent housing and then to provide them with case management services for them. The program is designed to provide permanent housing opportunities across the community through rent and utility subsidies. Program participants must meet with the case manager on a weekly basis as well as comply with the lease agreements. Rent and utility subsidies are provided until such time as the participant can live independently of the assistance or some other housing arrangements is deemed to be more appropriate. Historically, the Housing First program costs have been split between the city of Wichita and Sedgwick County with the city administering the program pursuant to a funding agreement. Since the program began in March of 2009, a total of 467 chronically homeless individuals have been placed into housing. As of, de excuse me, as of December 31st, 2021, 50 participants were housed with the assistance provided under the program. Of these pe number of people, 15 of these individuals have remained housed for over one year. A total of 239 per program participants are considered to have successfully exited the program. Over the past several years, the number of chronically homeless individuals identified as having a physically, as having a physical disability have increased. Agencies currently referring to the Housing First program do not provide case management services to those persons with physical disabilities, preventing this population from being served. Last year, the City Council and County Commission approved a change in the program funding structure to include a case manager. After several failed recruitments, ComCare hired the case manager who began work last week on March the 28th. The Housing First case manager will provide services to those clients who do not receive services from current partner agencies. Program clients will receive assistance with life skills as well as referrals for other needed services. The Housing First case manager will also serve as a liaison between property management staff, program staff, and proactively address problematic situations in order to minimize lease terminations. The proposed change will decrease the monthly reimbursements requested from Sedgwick County for rent assistance. However, it is anticipated that many Housing First participants will transition to the city's Housing Choice Voucher Program in order to receive continued rent subsidies. There is no impact to the general fund, and the 2022 adopted budget includes rent and utility assistance in the amount of $382,736, with half of this being contributed by the general fund 
as well as the other half being contributed by Sedgwick County. Of the $191,368 to be contributed by the Sedgwick County, up to $59,404 will be used to fund the dedicated Housing First case manager to be employed by ComCare. Um, the legal department has reviewed and approved the funding agreement as to form. And we are recommending that the city council approve the funding agreement and authorize the necessary signatures. I will now stand for any questions. Questions for staff. Councilmember Holheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it says up here a total of 159 participants are considered to have unsuccessfully exited the program. Um, and 113 were terminated for program violations. Uh, could you expand on that just a little bit so we have a better idea of how to better serve and reach out to some of these populations? So, yes, um, negative exits, as clearly indicated, is when a person violates the term of their lease or they're non-compliant with the program, and then we've had a number of persons that um, are incarcerated. So with the Housing First program, all individuals must have a case manager, and that case manager does meet with them weekly in their home. That is a program requirement. It also allows for me, when speaking with property managers, it's a good selling tool for them to be willing to participate with the program. So one of, um, we do partner with other agencies in the community to provide case management services. Um, however, sometimes due to a, a decrease in staffing, some of those weekly home visits may not have been as productive as what we would like. And that is gonna be one of the nice things about this particular, um, having this dedicated case manager, is that we are hoping to make sure that we have regular conversations with that case manager so that we can try to be more proactive in helping to ensure that persons remain in the unit, um, hopefully ensuring that they do not um, have lease violations and hoping to keep them out of jail. Yeah, would you say that many of these are due to possible mental health issues or drug abuse issues or um, just what are some of the common themes you see in there? I think it's fair to say that it could be a combination of all of those. Um, in order to be considered chronically homeless, we use the 2009 definition, and that means that a person must have been continuously homeless for a year or more, or have had four more episodes of homelessness within the past three years. Additionally, individuals must have a disabling condition. So that could be a mental health issue, substance abuse, physical disability, and or developmental disability. So yes, it could absolutely be all of those. Um, unfortunately, it could just be the fact that someone does not want to comply with the terms of the lease. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Fry. Thank you. Um, just a quick question in regards to the failure rate. Obviously, by putting the case manager in place, we're hoping to improve upon that number. Have we set an expectation or a goal for what we want to find, you know, some measurable results? Um, not really. Um, to be very honest with you, this is a very new program. Um, the, the individual just started last week. Um, I have not actually met with him yet, but we do have an appointment set to meet next week, of which we hope to be able to really identify some more measurable goals and really what we're looking at. Um, he's very familiar with a lot of the processes, a lot of the community agencies. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that exactly. We are hoping that he will be managing 20 to maybe 25 individuals. Um, with the chronically homeless and having the amount of barriers that they do have, we feel that that is an appropriate amount for the, this um, case manager to be able to handle realistically. 20 to 25? Yes, that's correct. Um, it's also important to mention that um, the current partners that we have, the current agencies that are referring to this program, we are not wanting to um, replace those partnerships with them. This is just to enhance the service that we're providing. Mm -hmm. Further discussion on this, or excuse me, further questions for staff. See none, thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? 
All right, seeing none, we'll bring the discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on this item? If there is no further discussion, then I will make a motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the funding agreement and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. As all members cast their vote. With the result of seven yeas, that motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Home program funding for Cerebral Palsy Research Foundation, the Timbers Preservation Project. Good morning, Director Stang. Good afternoon, Mr. I mean, Mayor. afternoon. <laughs> Good evening, whatever time it is. Yes. Better check on that, right, <laughs> at this point. Um, the item I have for you today is a, a contingent commitment with the Cerebral Palsy Research Foundation for home funding for the Timbers um, affordable housing project. So in May of 2021, the council approved our annual action plan, which includes $662,452 in home investment partnership pro program funding for the housing development loan program. Uh, the uh, HDLP is designed to provide housing subsidies for infill housing projects or to support the development of real estate that is idle or underused and to provide needed housing for underserved populations. Uh, HDLP funding is available for nonprofit and for-profit organizations and loans are the loan structure for each project is dependent on the type of project to be financed. Funding requests are received on an open application basis. On de December 20th, 2021, the Housing Department opened applications for housing development loan pr program funding for rental and home ownership projects. As you've seen, several um, projects have come through in the last few meetings for infill development under HDLP. Representatives from the Cerebral Palsy Research Foundation approached the Housing and Community Services staff to discuss the possibility of home funding for a project involving the, truly the reconstruction of the Timbers apartment community at 2021 North Old Manor Road. The Timbers is a 100 unit wheelchair accessible apartment community for individuals with physical disabilities. The Timbers was uh, constructed in 1979 um, using HUD funds, and it was the first apartment of community of its type in the country. Tenants residing in this complex receive monthly rental assistance through a direct contract with HUD. But the buildings comprising the Timbers apartments are aging, they're showing signs of deterioration, and don't meet current standards for accessibility. So the uniform, uh, uh, physical condition standards for accessibility changed in 1992. Following the completion of a needs assessment uh, that the Con Cerebral Palsy Research Foundation staff determined that demolition of the existing building and replacement would be the most cost-effective means uh, to address the overall improvement. It's very, very expensive to remodel existing units to meet uh, accessibility standards the proposed project uh, will involve demolition, this phase of the proposed project, uh, of three six-unit buildings to be replaced with three newly constructed six-unit buildings for a total of 18 one-bedroom units, approximately 790 square feet on the existing campus. Um, the Cerebral Palsy Research Foundation has requested a total of $190,000 in home HDLP financing uh, for this proposed phase of the reconstruction of the complex. The project is consistent with the city's comprehensive housing policy, specifically related to avail the availability component as it relates to persons with disabilities and the affordability component. Persons with disabilities are considered to be special needs population because of the strong likelihood that their housing needs include accessibility features. And a large majority of those persons are low income and often rely on social security payments for income. The project is also consistent with the city's consolidated plan as it will address the top priority need, safe, affordable housing, which includes persons with physical disabilities and persons with developmental disabilities. Housing and Community Service staff um, recommends approval of the funding request and proposes the issuance of a conditional commitment letter subject to securing of all necessary financing and final underwriting. The project is applying for competitive tax credits. This local contribution helps that project score even better in the state competition. 
There is no impact to the general fund. The total project cost is just over $4 million. Other sources of financing include the, a loan from Interest Bank, a uh, housing trust fund loan from Kansas Housing Resource Corporation, and also low-income housing tax credits. The city's home funding is to be provided uh, as an interest-bearing loan at an interest rate of 1%. That's required under tax credits for it actually to be a loan, an interest-bearing loan, in order for the cost to remain in basis to receive tax credits. And a funding agreement would be drafted, approved as to form by the law department, and be placed back on the council agenda for approval at a future date, provided that uh, the Cerebral Policy Research Foundation is successful in obtaining its other sources of financing. So it is recommended that the city council approve the issuance of a conditional commitment letter for home investment partnership program funding for the Timbers Preservation Project and authorize the Director of Housing Design. And I stand for any questions you may have. And Pat Jonas with the Cerebral Palsy Research Foundation is also here to answer any questions you may have. All right, so let's open up questions for staff. See none, thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council. On, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep this very brief, but you need to know how wonderful your staff is here. Sally Stang and um, Mark Stanberry and others, you guys are just awesome. They came to our site, they looked at the existing facility, they looked at a model of what the new one would look like, they kind of steered us in the direction, looked for some additional funding we might turn to, and uh, if you could approve this, uh, we would very much appreciate it. It's over 40 years old and we have to do something and we just don't have the uh, wherewithal to do it independent without some assistance from the community. So your help would be greatly appreciated. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. If not, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, further input from the public on this particular item. Seeing none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench is the discussion among the council on this item. If there is no further discussion, then the chair will recognize Councilmember Johnson as this resides in District 1. Thanks, Mayor. Um, unfortunately, due to the funding uh, source, I have a personal conflict that must abstain from this vote. With that, then I will so the next person who represents District 1. I will make the uh, motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the insurance of a conditional commitment letter for the Home Investment Partnership Program financing in the amount of $190,000 for the Timbers Preservation Project and authorize the Director of Housing and Community Services to sign. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open roll. Members will cast their vote. Have a received seven yay votes with one abstention vote from Councilmember Johnson. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Ordinance amending Chapter 2.10 of the Code of the City of Wichita pertaining to the Wichita Citizens Review Board. Good afternoon, Bob Layton, City Manager. I want to present to you uh, some recommended changes uh, pertaining to the Citizen Review Board. Um, just a reminder of what the role of the Citizen Review Board is. Uh, in the ordinance, uh, there are four major functions. Uh, help the police department with its public outreach efforts to review racial and other uh, bias-based policies and present recommendations to the board. Uh, advise on other policies and practices of the department and then review post-discipline findings of Professional Standards Bureau upon the request of either the chief or the board itself. We've had a number of discussions at the board level regarding uh, what they believe they need to become more effective. I've also heard from some community representatives regarding issues that they have with the board and how they think it could be more effective. And so bringing forward to you today some um, changes that are recommended uh, and have been approved and were endorsed by the Citizen Review Board. The first one would change the makeup of the board, and this is reflecting uh, some concerns expressed by community members about not having um, a, um, 
a, a policy impact, uh, and when I say that, by having the mayor and council um, involved in the appointment process, the feeling that the community would be better represented if, there, uh, if the staff wasn't making all the appointments to the Citizen Review Board. So as a result of that, the recommendation coming from the Citizen Review Board and myself is that the um, total number of the of members on the board would go to 13, the council and the mayor would appoint seven of those members, and then the city manager would retain an appointment of six uh, members. Uh, also, they would um, uh, uh, serve in two-year terms um, with no member serving more than four consecutive full terms. And then the three significant changes were recommended by the board, and again, to improve its effectiveness. The first is that when anyone brings, when the board decides to hear a, a case, they would like uh, to inform the complainant that was involved in a case or a citizen who was involved in the case that they were going to pick this up for review and to provide that op an opportunity for that individual to be able to comment or uh, present to the board. And that can happen either in public session or in executive session uh, if the uh, complainant or the citizen is more comfortable doing it in closed session. So that would be the first, um, uh, and, and that was important to the board so they could hear from the citizen and get their perspective, not just what they, they hear from staff. The second was to allow the board to receive a disciplinary summary for an individual uh, pol uh, police officer that's involved in the case when it comes to them. Uh, and again, a reminder, the cases come to them with um, the uh, identity of the police officer not known, but they, that's, and that's why it was important to the board that they at least have some history on that officer and know that they've been involved in similar um, issues in the past. And then the last uh, item has to do with uh, uh, reporting back to the community uh, when they do an investigation and they think there are some findings or recommendations that merit uh, more than just advice to the chief and to the city manager. And um, the uh, Citizen Review Board is under, uh, reviewing a few cases right now where they believe that's ex extremely important uh, that they be able to report back to the public. And so that would be the third um, uh, a major change requested by the board. Um, I will uh, note that uh, not only have the ordinance amendments been reviewed uh, by the law department, and they were actually involved in the, helping to draft uh, to meet the intent of the Citizen Review Board, but also the, the board has asked for the council to consider giving this both first and second readings, making this the final reading today, so that they uh, could finish the work they're doing on a couple of cases, a few cases right now uh, that are under review, and they'd like to be able to make their uh, findings known publicly and feel that the current ordinance would not allow them to do that. So um, that, that is the reason for a, kind of an extraordinary request. So the recommendation would be to declare an emergency and adopt the ordinance on first reading and authorize the necessary signatures. I'd be glad to answer any questions regarding the proposed uh, uh, changes. So, uh, Mr. Manager, and we got a lot of questions of folks who wanted to ask you questions about this. Uh, just to start off, the situation at hand and the reason why we are hearing this now and emergencying it or the recommendations to emergency it up so that it's in place by tonight is because the board has asked for specific tools so that they can dig deeper into some of their investigations and they want to be able to implement these new set of, of tools uh, to, to, to do their, the investigations that are currently ongoing, including a meeting tonight. Is that an accurate statement? Uh, it, it is accurate. Uh, two of the changes really wouldn't pertain to what they're currently reviewing, but the ability to report out to the public would. Okay, so if we were to, because I, I have, have had people reach out and say, hey, we want you to table this proposal until there is a larger uh, uh, change or uh, framework with this. If we were to do, to follow that advice, that means that the board that is currently meeting tonight, who is currently investigating uh, some of the uh, um, cases that have been widely publicized in the media, they would not have those additional tool sets, particularly the ones for reporting out the, the transparency uh, uh, changes in this. They would not have that uh, to to uh, um, 
to perform the tasks in which they, they're already performing. Is that accurate? Right. They would not be authorized to issue a report. Okay. Uh, they could make recommendations to staff, but they wouldn't be able to issue the public report, which is the next level that they thought was important. Okay. Uh, so with that, again, we do have some folks on the board who, who would like to ask the manager questions. Uh, Councilmember Johnson is first up. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Bob. Yep. Um, just a couple questions. So um, once approved, if approved today, when would the council be able to make appointments? Uh, I believe starting next week. Okay. Um, the other question I have was really technical and um, on page two, number six, um, the changed part that says a board, the board may issue a written report of the board's findings and recommendations of such review uh, of a professional standards investigation. Um, does, does there need to be the word public inserted in that? Because they can write a report, but if it doesn't say that it could be given to the public, could it still be given? So, yeah, I, I, I don't, I think it's their intent that it be public. So if you're saying it, the insertion of that word to clarify, I don't think there would be, I don't believe the board would have any concern with that. Okay. I, I would like it inserted. I just know when it's in black and white. So, and I would just to throw this out there as a point of information based on the current discussion is we will have the amended ordinance up for a vote. And then I know that there are other members, including myself, who want to offer additional amendments or additional clarification on this as well. Uh, so we, we, we do want folks to have, have the ability to, to offer up amendments to make the type of clarifications that I think you, you, you are expressing as well. So uh, just for, because like I said, I got a lit up board here of folks who want to speak to this. Uh, we, we definitely will be having an amendment process uh, for folks who, who want to tighten up this language. Okay. I wasn't, uh, I'll wait till it comes back to council to offer an amendment. I just had a question on that. Then my final technical question is page four, number four, um, a person could not be on here uh, that does not pass the criminal background check in accordance with the criteria set forth in section 2.10.045 of the code of the city of Wichita. And I just wanted to know specifically what that was, what those disqualifiers were. Council member, um, that is under the ordinance that applies to most advisory boards, and I don't know that there is a definition of what the pass is. I'll have to check into that. Okay, I just wanted to, you know, if it was a misdemeanor or, or felony, just because there may be some folks, I don't have a felony, but given what happened to me at 19, I could have potentially had some of that, and someone like me, I think, could be good on there. I just want to make sure we don't have too many barriers for folks to join. I don't believe the ordinance specifies. We'll, we'll get back on that. Okay. Thank you. That was all. Okay. Councilmember Hurlhazel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, page four, section, or number five, or actually just after number five, um, one of the changes is members appointed by the mayor and city council shall be subject to removal by the mayor or city council. Members appointed by the city manager shall be subject to removal by the city manager. Uh, could you walk me through that process as to how we would go about removing people potentially for violations? I'll, I'll let Jennifer supplement what I'm going to say, but it's my understanding that the same rules that apply to all other boards and commissions would apply to this board. So for instance, uh, not attend, or missing meetings and not attending um, uh, three meetings in a row, for instance, that would be a cause for dismissal. Um, there are, it's limited, I think, in terms of what is allowed in terms of removing someone today under the current code. Correct. That is, it is limited currently to at attendance. Okay, so just the, their attendance would not be up to snuff or um, some of these other issues, like they wouldn't complete the racial profiling training. I'm sorry, that's another. Yes, that's unique to this group. If, if they don't, uh, up, if they don't go through the citizen, the police uh, citizens uh, advisory. Well, I'm sorry. What's the? Uh, Forgotten the name. This is police academy. Yeah, police academy. Then yes, if they don't do the training, they could be removed for that reason. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Bluebog. Thank you, Mayor. Can you remind me how, how many other um, 
How many other committees does the manager have appointees on, and specifically why why six on this one? Um, the idea was to give the council, the mayor and council, majority control over this. Um, uh, I'd have to go back and look. I have a number of boards and commissions where I have appointments. Uh, the you know some of them are you know more business related, such as the pension boards. Um, I. Um, I'd have, again, uh, council member, I'd have to go back and think, but there are several that where I do have appointments. But the, the council will be seven and, and you'll, seven united, and you'll have six. Just, I'm just curious if you were foreseeing some kind of issue where maybe mo the majority of the council wouldn't agree with, with your direction or? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, no, there, there's no magic to having six versus, you know, seven for the council other than if, you know, I'm not sure how you divvy it up other than that, right? I mean, without getting an uncontrollable board in terms of its size. I mean, if, if the mayor and council each had two, then we're up at 14. Um, it just, that, I mean, there, that's, there's no rhyme or reason other than that. Thanks. Uh, Vice Mayor Tuttle. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for your presentation and your work on this. So it's an 11 member board now, correct? That's correct. And then it would go to 13 member. Right. So for the folks. By the way, I think it goes, it can go up to 13 today, but we, we haven't gone that high. Okay. So for the folks who are currently serving on this board, are they grandfathered in as far as the four two year terms? How, how will it work with the board that that's in existence? And I understand that maybe not all the positions are full at this point, but tell me, like, how, what happens with them? All, all their terms will expire, and then you have the ability to reappoint them uh, under this ordinance. And so then they could start over with four two-year terms? Or would their past service be considered? I'll jump in. This one says that they'll be eligible for reappointment of no more than two additional two-year okay. terms. Thank you. I missed that, so That's I apologize. Okay. Okay. I probably read it at one time and got it. And then I had the same question about why declare an emergency, so thank you for asking that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So just to sum up it and, and I, I think clarify roughly what, what these changes mean in the past as folks who follow our system of government know the electeds handle policy the city manager and staff handle the implementation of that policy the administration side uh, that includes uh, of course disciplinary um, the the city council is not we're, we're not have have the ability to call in private files for, from um, our employees and, and to shuffle through them. That is all administrative according to our uh, city charter. So this board, the citizen review board has traditionally been a tool of the administration to have additional oversight over uh, disciplinary actions that, that take place. However, with the appointment coming from the council onto this board as well, we are essentially uh, uh, crossing over into the policy and into the administrative uh, these lines and that uh, this board will actually be made up of have a administrative purpose but also a, a bit of a policy purpose as well where our members and as an extension of the council can also come to us with, with possible policy changes uh, if, if that's appropriate so as we move forward with this there is a additional level of transparency and there's additional level of um, of a, a process when we as a body make appointments to boards because our appointees are an extension of the elected officials uh, which means that they fall under our uh, ethics policy they fall under really a, a different I, I think set of uh, guidelines although not contrary set of guidelines than the administrative process of appointees. Uh, so, and it's not so much that I'm asked, because technically I'm supposed to be asking a question, so in the end I'm gonna say, wouldn't you agree? Uh, but, um, but it's also just, because this is a, a, a bit more complex uh, when it comes to uh, how we're trying to approach this, but also uh, it's different unless you're, you're a bit of a local government nerd on, uh, on our process and how this fits into that process. 
You know, it may be helpful just to talk about the history of the Citizen Review Board. It was originally, when I arrived, it was originally just to hear uh, uh, cases that are brought, were brought forward by citizens. And you'd have maybe two or three um, in a year. In some years we had none. And there was a feeling that that wasn't a very effective uh, citizen review process. So we disbanded that group and decided we wanted one that was um, that delved deeper into the uh, policies as well as have the ability to review complaints brought forward. Uh, and so we've operated that way, again, advisory to the chief, and the emphasis went a little bit away from advice to the manager, although there was a connection, but it was more to advise the chief on things that they observed. And the idea was to have representations from, from citizens so we have a, an authentic citizen voice in, in the review of cases, not just the way they're perceived by the department itself or even by administration, as you note. This takes it one step further, and that is some concerns about that process maybe not being fully representative of, the, of citizens and providing an authentic voice. And the feeling was the mayor and council were in a better position to be able to bring forward that uh, citizen representation, and that, that's why we got to the point where we are. Excellent. Um, with that, I, I don't think there's any, okay. anyone on the board for questions, uh, uh, but stand by. Uh, but we appreciate the presentation from staff. We are going to now roll into our public comment uh, on the proposed changes uh, to the Citizen Review Board. The chair recognizes the Honorable uh, Senator Aletha Fascado. Welcome back, Senator. Uh, good afternoon, um, Mayor, um, Vice Mayor Tuttle. Um, Council members Hohauser, Johnson, Bluebaugh, Fry, and Ballard. Uh, Mayor Brandon Whipple, I've enjoyed uh, spending the majority uh, of the day with you. I've uh, been here since 9 a.m. to finally appear before you. And I want to say that I uh, respect what you do. I appreciate what you do, uh, although I don't envy what you do uh, from the bench here. You've got some major decisions to make today on some very important issues. Um, I am here to speak as a member of the Wichita Racial Profiling Board um, established within the law with the passage of the Racial Profiling Law um, and also, as I agree, um, uh, Mayor, with the majority of the comments made by our city manager, uh, Robert Layton, um, although and because of, um, the, to me, part of this Citizens Review Board uh, came about also through the advocacy from the Wichita Racial Profiling Board. Uh, and a lot of the complaints come to the Racial Profiling Board than to the Citizens Review Board. Um, and I do agree with the majority of the recommendations proposed here for this, uh, to expedite this um, ordinance. However, uh, there have been some recommendations made by members of the Wichita Racial Profiling Board. Um, I believe you may have received letters uh, or emails to include some of those recommendations um, before you move forward uh, with this proposal before you today. And I am here today to ask you to strongly um, consider implementing, including those recommendations uh, presented to you by the um, members of the Wichita Racial Profiling Board to help make the Citizens Review Board better. And um, thereby you get the voice of the citizens, uh, kind of a cliche, Citizens Review Board, um, 
I do appreciate that members, that you, our mayor and city council members, will be able to appoint individuals to that board as well. And so, um, believe it or not, that's all I have to say because I, I need lunch. You guys are going to buy me lunch now, right, for <laughs> <laughs> spending the day with you. But if you would strongly consider those recommendations, perhaps you can include them in your discussion today um, and then move forward. And again, I appreciate the time, Mayor Brandon Whipple. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I'll answer a question if you have one or two. At this point, no one's on the board, but thank you. Again, thank you for what you do. All right, next speaker. Welcome back. <laughs> Greetings. Um, Elder Joaquila Martinez. I'll get my address. I hope it doesn't <clears throat> hurt me in the end, but 825 North Area. I'll be back about the trees in my neighborhood later on. But I just want to say this. When you first activate the Citizens Review Board, the Council of Elders said, there's none of us present. And if you know our history and our wisdom, you understand that many of those who belong to the Council of Elders Maybe elders, but they belong to over 60 organizations within our community. So we are going to, I'm going to make the request that when you add these new people, can you please consider elders to be on this review committee, and especially those elders who have been civil rights activists and lawyers in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion from the public. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Mayor, this is uh, an honor to be with you folks. What I've asked the uh, city clerk to do is to pass out the recommendations from the Citizens uh, Racial Profiling Advisory Board so you have an idea of what it is that we're recommending. The whole concept is that haste makes waste. You're in a position today to be trying to approve an amendment to an ordinance that's been around for three and a half years. And we haven't seen any of the recommendations. I don't know if you have from the city. We have tried for the last two or three months to be able to have some input, some meetings with Bob, and have not been successful in getting any meetings set up. So in effort to try to give our input in a timely fashion, it's been silence. And now you're expected to give a decision today about an ordinance you've just seen for the first time. And there's a lot of repercussions to this. Because the bottom line is that the way this Citizen Review Board works right now, it's out of sight, out of mind. They don't get to see any of the information about the particular officer other than what the complaint is. They don't know this officer's name. It's redacted. They haven't until now, with the recommendations that you just received, had any input from the complainant. So you get one side of the story. You never hear from the person that was complaining about the way they were treated at the time of the stop. So it's been totally ineffective. You have mostly people that sit there, don't ask any questions, don't raise any motions to do anything. They sit and listen and go home. We never hear anything about what the results were of any inquiries in executive session. They just come out and say, well, we met and we're adjourning. Now, I understand there's some urgency today. You want to have some public statement given about text messages. Well, those text messages occurred in 2020. The way the ordinance reads, you're not supposed to even look at them if they're a year old. So how did we get to look at ordinance questions about 2020 and in the ordinance it says you're not even supposed to look at it if it's over a year old? Well, I guess there's a lot of embarrassment. 
It should be. But this is just the tip, the very small tip of a very big ice cube. I'm wearing a shirt today for a reason. It says stop the stops. It's specifically there to try to help you understand that we have a culture within the police department that has been going on not only here in Wichita, but across the nation of stopping black people disproportionately to any other race. Now, this is not news to you. We came here in December of 2019. Sheila Officer and I made a presentation to this board of the data that I analyzed for 137,000 citations. Bob approved the disbursement of the data. The chief of police, Gordon Ramsey, he approved it, the law department. It took a year for us to get the data, but finally I got the data for 2016, 17, and 18. It showed that after five specific studies, blacks in this city are still twice as likely to get a traffic citation as any other race. They're three times more likely to be arrested, to be searched, and have a physical altercation with the officer at the time. The bottom line is, and I want you to understand this very clearly, when we compared the data on traffic stops under Gordon Ramsay, it was 42,000 a year. Under the former chief, Norman Williams, is 114,000 a year. So almost two and a half times fewer citations written. The bottom line is there was actually reduction in the number of traffic accidents. There's no correlation that I or Dr. Whipple, you have a number of different groups across the whole country that have done these kinds of analysis. No correlation between writing more citations and having safe streets. People don't run into each other because you gave them a citation or you didn't. We have a lot of these intersections where you have traffic lights with no turn signals given. So there's no one knows who's on first, who's on second, and you get T-boned. That had nothing to do with writing tickets. It had to do with the way you engineered these signals. So this is the tip of the iceberg. These little emails and text messages back and forth that you received are ones that officers sent to each other in frustration after George Floyd's murder. There was a big demonstration up at 21st in Arkansas. You know about that. So these guys are texting each other. I don't condone it. I don't put it off. I just say, okay, that shouldn't be tolerated. But the fact is there's enough evidence now that there is a bias in the way in which policing is done in this city that's gone on for years. The senator just spoke about the racial profiling bill. That was passed in 2005. That bill included the Racial Profiling Advisory Board, which we were, in fact, what the current Wichita Citizen Review Board is. That only changed because that bill has been watered down consistently since we passed it in 2005. So there's no longer anything in the statute as far as what the charges. Is it a misdemeanor? Is it a felony if you profile somebody? Right now, it's taken out completely. It's 4608 in the statute, 22-4608. That was removed because the police didn't want to have anything in there if the court found them guilty of racial profiling. How do I sentence you? What is it? A misdemeanor? A felony? What is it? It's no longer there. Same way with data collection. It said that you were supposed to do data collection in the original bill. Now it says if you don't want to do data collection, you have a citizen review board. But if you don't give the citizen review board any way to actually look at who is it that's abusing, if you will, their badge and profiling people or using excessive force, how do you know who it is? How do you bring anybody to account? So the current board, as we see it, and I've been at every meeting since February of last year, does not have any transparency or accountability. Now, one thing that I want to bring up to you is that that board, you've talked about reporting back to you, right? Somebody needs to not just go through the motions, but be able to say, we did something. Here's what we accomplished. In February of last year, 
That board voted unanimously to have the city police department provide quarterly reports to them. And I'm asking that to go to you as well of the citations that were written in that previous four months. Now, those three months of time, excuse me, quarterly, we're talking about three times four is 12, right? So we got quarterly reports. Do that analysis. See if there's still a disproportionate number of stops. If there are, look at the particular officers that's on the ticket. We know who wrote the ticket and what the infraction is. What we found in the previous analysis was that in 2016 through 19, 50% of the citations given to black drivers were for non-moving violations. So that meant you had to have a pretext to stop in the first place, and now you write them a ticket because they don't have insurance or the tag is expired or something else. It had nothing to do with safe streets. So what we're asking for today is simply, look, let this cake have a chance to bake. Don't put a whole bunch of stuff in the, in the pot and say, all right, now we got it done without giving a proper chance to, to stew and to break and to come back with something we all can agree is making some sense. Have some meat on it. Have some taste. Let me see, if you will, what you propose. I know some of you have good recommendations. We have shared some recommendations. Let's sit at the table. Bring us back on the 12th of April when you have another meeting coming up in a week. Don't rush this through today. Take time to think it out, work with those in the community, and take the good recommendations that Bob has offered, which is to add representatives from each of you, seven new members, that's a great idea. But add the other things we're asking for. I think you'll find you'll have a much better end result and we hope that you will please take that into account today. Table this, bring it up on the 12th. In the meantime, we'll work our tails off to make sure you have something to report back. But to say you have to have a meeting today and a decision today, and then you're gonna have a press conference at four o'clock, what's that about? Is that just another way of saying, well, we want to have something to the community today? So we said we did something. You can wait a week. You can have that press conference then. Thank you very much. So just some follow-up, you're aware that there's not a press conference today, that there's an actual meeting of the Citizen Review Board who is currently reviewing a high-profile case in which the public demands that we're transparent with. I am there, and I understand that. I understand also that they have had that case under review for three or four months. Okay. And what they are able to do with your approval can wait a week. It doesn't have to be done today. They can still make that report. But that meeting today was not announced till yesterday, in my understanding. There was no public notice of that meeting whatsoever. So and it won't be open to the public, other than the fact you're going to have some reporters there. Is that right? Well, it really depends on if we were able to empower the board with the tools in which they have asked for so that they can be more transparent, such as producing a written findings, then this would take place in time for them to meet and be able to do that. If we were to put this off a week, we would either be attempting to put off their investigation another week, or they would continue under the current process in which we didn't give them the tools that they have asked for so that they can be more transparent with it. Which I think puts me, in, it, or it puts the council really at a tough spot and, and I, because again, if we don't make these changes, we can't, first of all, empower the board who's asked us to make these changes, but also uh, really meet the goal that I think you, you want as well, which is more transparency uh, with this. So I, I, I'm just, uh, and, and I, the characterization, characterization that there is a press conference and not an ongoing investigation, I think is disingenuous. It's the idea that we're doing this for show and not for actual results when we are trying to get those results because there is an ongoing uh, oversight of, of a particular case. So I, I just want to expand on that comment and, and to make sure that- I appreciate that, sir. May I respond in this Of way? course. This group has been trying since August 
this group meeting to the city review board to meet with the city manager. We had a couple of meetings, and it's basically a dialogue between the chair of the board, Jay Feller, and the manager. Very few of the members, and I don't recall any of them ever said a word. They met again in December. There was some discussion. We came from the racial profile and advisory board thinking there would be some way for us to have some input. We've tried our, our best to put input in during those meetings. Nothing gets asked, nothing gets done. They never took a vote on any of the recommendations you have in front of you today. Not once was there a vote of that committee, that review board, of the ordinance changes that you're asked to approve right now. So I don't understand why it is that we have to have an, a, an emergency declared and we're going to have a four o'clock meeting and supposedly give up something that is incomplete to start with. We're not still going to get the names, I guess, of some of these people. I don't know. But on that agenda, which I've seen now, it doesn't have time for public comment or input until afterwards. I ask you again, please, take time. Let this sink in a little bit, and you're going to find this is a much better result. I'm sorry, Becky, did you Vice, Vice Mayor Tuttle. I have a question. It's kind of a thought. I'm, so it's been a long day. So I'm, I'm trying to think of how to <laughs> propose this day. in the That's best true. way. But I understand there's some immediate need for today, for the meeting today. And that's why this is what we're considering is a, an emergency. What you gave us today, I just received yesterday. And, and to be honest, I don't know if a week is enough time for me to be able to go through all this and to make sure that I'm digesting it accurately. I also don't think there, there are 10 items that doesn't, I'm assuming it doesn't mean all 10 or none. You know, maybe we like number two and we like number four or whatever. So I'm wondering for the purpose of, and again, just a suggestion I'd love for my colleagues to weigh in and if this is an awful idea, I'll own it. But we move forward with what's proposed today so that the citizen review board can do what they need to do. And then we take some time with a deadline to look at this, but I'm not sure a week is enough. I mean, this is some pretty heavy material that I am gonna need more information on for sure. I, I, again, my voice is the only one I have, but that's just a thought that I have so that we can keep progress going for our community because they are expecting it. Thank you. And just to follow up with my interpretation of similar concerns in the comments for, from Vice Mayor, the racial excuse me, the um, citizen review board, as it is and with these amendments, are more of an oversight board. With the amendments proposed by your group, it becomes more of an investigative mission than an oversight mission. And I understand that, like, and I think we should have some real conversation because that does change the trajectory of the board. However, also, if we are to think of particularly the issues that we're, we're dealing with in this very moment, more globally, uh, we have instructed the city manager to bring in an outside uh, uh, investigative or company to do a deep dive into some of the uh, issues that I think you, you have referred to. Uh, so I, I do wanna put that out that uh, a lot, if I was to code, a lot of the proposals for that, that's in, in, in this document, it's much more investi investigative than oversight, which I think as we start looking forward, we should think about if, if that's the direction we wanna go, but for this particular moment, we are actually bringing in an investigative, uh, uh, high-level investigative organizations who have experience investigating uh, uh, the, these type of, of matters. So uh, if I, I, I just wanna make that clear because I, I also agree with um, Vice Mayor Tuttle's interpretation that this is much heavier and, and by that I mean changes the trajectory a little bit of the board versus the, the proposed changes which still keeps this board more oversight versus investigative. Can, can I? Of course, and you may and have I, a follow-up. I know I'll... you're on the board, but just to follow up so that we don't lose the, the train of thought or the chain of communication that I appreciate, and thank you for reminding the community of the decision that we made that we have an outside investigator or consultant group working on it with us. And so 
that was a really good point to bring up because that makes this even a little bit more challenging to think that in a week it would be interesting to have this as part of, of that somehow in the process. I think this is an outstanding opportunity for us to do this with intention um, and, and to be very thoughtful, to seek input from, from experts who are much more versed than I am, and, and I'm just fearful that a week isn't enough time you to know, gather uh, that. Council so lady, I, you know, Council Lady, I totally agree with you. It takes time for something to come together, doesn't it? And we've been knocking at the door for months, and it hasn't opened. At some point, hopefully, you're going to say as a council, time's up, we're going to work together. We're going to get input from the community. It's not just going to be one or two people talking behind closed doors. We're going to bring something to you. Let's have some meat on it. For example, this proposal that you have today only looks at current, within a year, cases. It needs to include past one year, doesn't it? Post as well as current. You cannot just cut off and say, all right, we're, not, we're going to have a blind eye to this. I'm thinking of the, the monkey thing. Remember, we have hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, right? So if you never know who the officers are we're talking about, then you're in a situation where you say, okay, how's it we're supposed to work this? If we don't have any of the facts, you say a split between investigation and oversight. I think the community would like to know if this officer that you're investigating now with oversight, if you will, is the same one that has been doing this for years, it's important for the community to know that. We have some officers that have 23 complaints against them. The Citizens Review Board didn't know that. They had no idea this officer had been doing the same thing over and over. Now, I'm thinking of Harvey Weinstein. Remember that guy? Somebody said, gosh, that guy is not really treating women very fairly. I'm just wondering why it is he gets to buy with all that kind of sexual harassment. And say, well, who, Harvey Reinstein? Well, he wouldn't do that. Well, then once you get his name out, it's me too. Me three, me four. It happens. How many different women have come forward now? It's the same way with some of these officers. You have a few bad apples, a few, very small number. That is spoiling the whole force. These officers are trying their best to do a good job every day. We honor and respect. Please don't paint them with the same brush. We all need to know that we have respect for our officers, but for those that are out of line, on particularly excessive use of force, racial profiling, and using guns, if you will, or chokeholds, we've had some officers murder people out there on that street. I can give you names. When we have time, we'll go through that. And they'll have a piece of coke in their mouth. They're trying to swallow it. They'll choke them. They die right on the spot. We know the names of some of those officers. They haven't been investigated yet. So at some point, we've got to come to reality, folks. This has to stop. The profiling of blacks in this city needs to stop. Sorry, but it's time. Wait. So give us time to put it all together and make it meaningful. That's what I asked today. There are a couple more people that wanted to testify. I'm sorry I'm taking up so much time. I understand. And there is someone else on the board, and they might have a question for you. But again, I'm confused by the statement that we want, we want the findings to be public, while also simultaneously asking us not to have this document put out today so that the findings of the board in a current investigation can indeed be public. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, and also, like, I, I just want to acknowledge we have the same goals. I think it's just the different, the different steps for getting there. Instead of, you know, I, I'm thinking three different steps, and I think you're thinking one step. And I'm thinking that that board, Citizen Review Board, has been trying since August to get reports like this out to the public. They've been asking the city manager for something that would give them a go-ahead right. since August. Right. What does another week or another month have to do with that? Because they're that meeting tonight. That report today, about three or four text messages among 11 officers, whatever. Sure, that's sensational. But gosh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We need to put some meat on those bones now. And as Becky points out, if we work with the city manager, 
with your permission, I think we can come up with something really meaningful and bring it back to you and you can say, okay, this works. Put your ideas forward. I know some of you had great ideas. We haven't seen them. We put ours on the table. You put yours. Let's work with Bob. Let's come up with something that makes some sense. That's all we ask. Yes. And we thank you. Mr. Mayor, if, if I could. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to get in front of council member. I, I, I just, I'm only a piece of this process, right? Um, I can tell you that the Citizen Review Board disputes the notion that they're ineffective, and I think they would need to be an active participant in the discussions of any additional reforms. Um, and I think there's some honest disagreement regarding their role, and, you know, that's, again, I, just to support what you're saying, that's not going to get resolved in, you know, in a one, even a one-week period of time. I think we're talking about something in terms of a significant discussion from people who have been actively involved in reviewing the actions of the police department um, over the last few years. So. And, and I want to just build upon that. Again, I... I think we would be well served as well to come back to the table after the report of the investigation that we, we are hiring an outside agency to come in to do the invest a professional job of the investigation of the entire department. That information would also add into the overarching discussion about reform. And I, and I believe we could all agree that, um, that's not only valuable, but sadly, we, we won't have that within a week. And so I, I, I just want to, I, I guess, express, and I'm gonna go on to Councilmember Holhiser after this, that I think we're saying roughly the same goals. It's just, I think it's the timeline that we are somewhat in disagreement of. And I think that's really important to point out as your frustration has bled through during your presentation, because you go back years working on this issue, much longer before I've been here. And I, I think that um, there's an opportunity for change now, And uh, but I, I just do want to express that this timeline that we're currently on will allow and should allow, and with the folks holding us accountable, also will enforce um, a, a multiple uh, 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 opportunities for continued reform. So I, I do just want to put that out that I don't disagree with you that we need to continue to adapt this instead of having one meeting today and calling it good, especially when we get some of that more, some of that other deeper level information as a result of, of the uh, investigation that we, we will be having. And I got to get to Councilmember Holheisel. Thank you for, for indulging me, Councilmember, and I apologize. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um... I just want to piggyback on what the vice mayor was saying earlier. This is just the first step in a the process. These, what we have today is a good first step. It's not going to be the only step. And I intend to fully engage with you and the public in general, especially those who are more um, at risk for some of these things and come out with something that we can all get behind, something as strong as we can get to ensure that we are living up to the expectations of the public. So, uh, like I said, this is a good first step for us, but it's not going to be the only step. So. Sir, could it be possible for a two-step to happen? Today you would give authorization for this review board to make their presentation this afternoon. Emergency declaration, you have our permission, but not try to approve the whole ordinance change. Because that means haste makes waste. You're going to build a bunch of stuff in there. I don't know how long it'll take before you ever come back to this item. Becky, I'm concerned as probably you are. You're going to be in a situation, all right, how soon do we have something? When do we bring it back? Is it going to be a month or two or five or six? Is it going to be another three and a half years? I don't know that. I do know that you have emergency right now. You want to have, you know, that board be able to give the results of their investigation. Beautiful. Give them permission to speak. But don't just use that as an excuse to put the whole ordinance in place. That's what we're asking. Would that make sense? It does. I understand what you're saying, yes, sir. Thank you. And just, we got a couple members on, on the board here, and I know we have more members that want to speak. I, I just want to point this out. My colleague, Vice Mayor Tuttle, 
often tells people, just call me Becky. Uh, and that's out of uh, um, uh, just just her personality. As And I understand when people are presenting, uh, we, we go with how we, we normally talk to folks. But let's uh, please refer to her as vice mayor uh, moving forward while we're in an official meeting. Uh, our ordinance. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. And, and I know that I know each of you no, no disrespect was intended, your, but, but it happened twice. That. And I, I just feel like as chair, I have to yeah. make a comment about that. So please, she's a, a vice mayor Tuttle. Vice um, mayor Tuttle. Thank uh, you. So moving forward, and I, I don't mean to embarrass you, vice mayor, um, but moving forward, I, I, I think we have a uh, vice mayor Tuttle on, on the, on the board, actually. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that. Um, and I understand Mr. Chapman's concerns about the, you know, when when would it come back? So, Bob, the the consultant, if you will, I'm not sure that's the right word, but the who we're using to help us externally review, when have we asked them to have a report to us or something back? Is there a deadline? I'm just curious. And if there's not, that's okay. I'm just curious. Um, give, give me just a second here. I just sure. received an update. And then while you're doing that, Bob, if you can think while I'm talking, I'm sorry. But I would be willing if we say, I don't see any harm in passing this today. I think this is, you know, I think moving the board from 11 members appointed by one person to 13 members appointed by eight is, is a good move for the community. I think the changes provide more transparency. To give community some peace, we could say then that we will revisit this in 90 days or in conjunction with this or so many days after that so that you feel assurance that it's not just gonna get kicked down the road and not addressed again. This council of has, has had precedence of delaying things and making them better with a specific timeline. So I, I offer that to you if that brings you some comfort. The, the council discussion um, made me think through the RFP process that we're going through for the police review, right? Looking at the culture of the department and, and practices. It, it's, we could incorporate that into the RFP document. So they're looking at best practices. They're reviewing what we do on citizen review and then they would come back with best practices that would then help with your consideration of next steps with the review board. Um, that's another alternative, um, and I just I offer that as maybe a, a way to get informed input on what's going on around the country in that regard. Um, that's not that was not originally part of the review that I anticipated, but if the council wanted us to go in that direction, that document is is in work in the work right now. I mean, we've got a draft already prepared of that. So, I I think this is. This would be the time to, to take advantage of those type of expertise. If there's no objection, then we, we could direct staff to to also uh, possibly add the addition uh, additional um, information to be reported back to us. So thank you. All right, welcome. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Council. My name is Twyla Purity. Uh, I've been in Wichita now for 15 years. I'm originally from Western Kansas, lived all over the country, and came back here 15 years ago. I'm a medical executive in town. Uh, the last nine and a half years, I'm, um, I'm the CEO of Wichita Urology Group. I'm a member of the Racial Profiling Advisory Board, um, but I'm here uh, because I've attended um, most of the Citizens Review Board meetings uh, since January of 2021. And I wanna share my observations and I can, it's my opinion that the board as it's been running is not effective. It's not meeting the objectives. And I've had a front row seat to that now for uh, since January. I've, um, in 2021, I attended all of the board meetings with the exception of the December one, and that's because I was out of town at a conference. At that time, in November, I uh, went through all the minutes and tallied up you know, the participation of all the board members, and my attendance was better than 75% of people on the board. All right, now in 2022, here again, I've attended all the meetings, the exception was a meeting this past Thursday, another urology conference, and I had to be out of town because I was presenting. 
at those meetings, many of those, because all of this came up, you know, about the text messages came up this year. So at, uh, many of those meetings so far this year have been special meetings, right? And so what does that mean? I bring my Heine down here. I go to the meetings just for them to say we're going into executive session. I leave, sit out in the hall until they call us back in and say that they're adjourning the meetings. So I am involved. I bring that up just so that you know I have seen all the meetings I have attended from beginning to end. I talk at many of them. I propose ideas, and they're never acted upon, although I think they're really great ideas. Um, so, so that's kind of my background. So you know that I have a unique perspective of not being on the Citizens Review Board, although I applied. Every time there's an opening, I uh, send the city manager another email saying, hey, I'm very interested, and I never get appointed. And I, I don't know why that is. Um, anyway, that's another point. So one of the very first questions I asked the CRB um, was, what have you accomplished? There was silence and puzzled looks. And I, you can't make that stuff up. They couldn't tell me, now this was January 2021, they couldn't tell me what they had accomplished. Fast forward to the summer of 2021, one of the members had put together kind of their list of accomplishments. And you can find all this stuff in their meetings. And um, so he had the, it was a list of accomplishments from January of 2018 until June of 2021. So three and a half years here, you know, and this is, you know, a summary, and I encourage you to get that if you can. But um, they commented on six Wichita Police Department policies. And that brings up kind of one of the weaknesses, if you will, in this ordinance. They comment, but there is no, I don't know, feedback that comes back to them, no recourse if their comments and recommendations aren't followed. But they commented on six in um, three and a half years. Um, they interacted with public on just 14 sessions, right? In three and a half years, interacted with the public. 11 individuals addressed the board 25 times. And think of all that's transpired in these three and a half years. One of the suggestions and recommendations I make when I do address the CRB is meeting on Thursdays at 4 does not encourage citizen participation, right? And I believe that's one of their objectives. Um, well, public outreach efforts. I heard the city manager mention that today. And you can't, you know, if people can't get to you because they're working and it's the middle of the week, you know, that's, it's not very effective. It's not effective. I wanna, since we're talking about their Thursday meetings, it seems odd and a little contrived all the meetings have been on Thursdays, even the special meetings. Thursdays, right? But this special meeting is on Tuesday, which I know is just curious. You know, we're trying to ram this through today on a Tuesday. The meeting is Tuesday. Um, and certainly, I don't have, um, you know, the context for everything. Maybe Tuesday is a special, special thing. So anyway, um, at the meetings themselves, it doesn't seem to be that um, there's much um, input from the um, board members, the CRB members, in the agenda. I don't ever see it, right? And I'm there from beginning to end. Agenda is brought forth. It's presented. Uh, the, it kind of follows a cadence of every meeting, a little bit of discussion, and, and then that's kind of it. To speak to kind of the, what, I what I see as the dysfunction I've seen two new members come on. One member came on, he sat down, the uh, um, chairman you know, introduced him, and then they carried on. And the second time this happened, a new member came on, she took her seat, um, she was introduced, and I said, well, I'm in the back, hey, wouldn't you maybe, wouldn't she like to know who all of you are? You know, there was no even like social courtesy of introductions until I brought it up. It's just, again, it's dysfunctional. Now, granted, I don't have history with what happens in civic meetings, right? 
my entire career has been in medicine, in the business of medicine. So maybe that's, maybe you don't interact. And um, if that's the way it works, I apologize for being misinformed. Um, so the members, they don't ask much. They just follow the agenda. There's been important information presented. Uh, Mr. Chapel or Dr. Chapel presented a lot of that. I encourage you just to, you know, um, delve into this a little more. I appreciate kind of the approach I think that you're getting ready to take. I haven't been looking at the time. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I, uh, what I want to, I just want to kind of close here and um, just ask that you not adopt the ordinance. It seems, and, and you've made some good points, but I'm wondering, like, is there not just a way to just, like, give that piece where they can do the public comment and then not kind of mung up the works with the rest of this that really needs some working over. I mean, there's always ways to problem solve things in my business, maybe not in yours. Maybe it's too complex for that. Um, but take the time, and it looks like you're going to, but for further review, but investigation, investigation, investigation. That's what I want to encourage. When you get ready to implement more ordinances or um, change the ordinance, investigate what's been going on. Read those minutes. See Dr. Berzer's report if you didn't see it. And think to yourself, what has the CRB been doing in these three and a half years? Why is it dysfunctional? How can we fix it, right? Appoint the right people. Um, I would make a recommendation that maybe they need a new chairman of the board. And maybe perhaps the sooner the better. Uh, it needs revamping. Thank you. Thank you. You are also very attentive. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I'll just take the blame. When we pulled Bob into our room after it came to light, thanks to the Citizen Review Board, uh, some of the text messages and stuff, and these weren't just text messages, they were worse than that. We instructed the city manager to expedite this, uh, to to speed up the process that we, we have so that uh, we can not only get answers, but also get results. And so I think that some of the comments, and, and I understand because frankly, you guys were in the room when we did this, uh, have been, well, it feels like this is rush. That's my fault, because this, we are stepping on the gas, uh, cruising towards progress and towards results in this particular case, because again, um, it, the details of it see, seem warranted to, to really take this head on. Um, but I, and I do wanna just express, this is one piece of it. Uh, we still have an independent investigator coming in. That's another piece of it. And then of course, we want to keep our ear to the ground when it comes to Groups like 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 the one the folks here who have been working on these issues for 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 a, a long time, so that we can come in a room with the information we get from our private from our investigator, the information that we get for feedback from the board, and also the information we get from the, the folks who, who are speaking now to it. So I, I also just want to express that although this process, when it comes to uh, expediting the, the investigation and the oversight of this particular situation. Uh, we also will, this isn't it. We're gonna keep keep working on it. So I, I, I do wanna point that out as well. But I, I will take full blame for uh, the, uh, and, the, and particularly for the confusion of why is this moving faster. Again, we wanted to get to the bottom of this issue pretty quick. Um, Vice Mayor Tuttle. Thank you, and thank you for being here as one of my constituents. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you being so interested in this topic. I think I have two constituents here today, so I'm, I'm honored to have that happen. I have two comments and then a question, if that's okay. So my first comment is, and I'm making an assumption here, but normally they meet on Tuesday, on Thursday, you said, and this time they're meeting on Tuesday, mm -hmm. just to ensure you that there's nothing nefarious going on. We have our state of the city on Thursday. Okay. The other comment that you made that resonated with me is, you know, Thursday at four. I, I agree. But what we found from this bench and from when I was active in the community, if we have it in the evening, then it's hard for people who have children and have daycare issues. And some people work second and third shifts. So there's no secret sauce for community engagement, though we try. So please know that wasn't lost on me and I appreciate it. But, you know, it's just never a good time for everyone to be there. My question was, and, and I tried to ask it to Dr. 
Chapman, and I'm sorry if it didn't come through, but there seems to be angst with passing this today. And, and I'm not sure why, because I think everybody's kind of in agreement growing the board and having publicly appointed positions from council or electeds is good. I haven't heard any complaints about that. And then the procedural changes are exactly what everybody is saying that should happen. More transparency, outside reporting, allowing you know the community to know more. So I, I just don't know if I understand why not this today with the next step of getting more information, putting some of the pieces of the puzzle together. So if you can answer, and if you don't feel comfortable, that's okay, we can have a sidebar conversation later, but I have yet to have anybody tell me why not this today if we commit to still reviewing the other information. Well, when I prepared my comments, you know, certainly it was before I had the opportunity to hear everything that was going on. I appreciate that this multiple steps, you know, to get to something that uh, everybody is, well, never, not everybody will be happy, but that we're closer, <laughs> right? That we're closer. Um, so, yeah, no, uh, I'm fine with that. Um, I don't speak for the entire board, but I just speak as a citizen who attends, attends the CRBs. Now, there is one word change, and I didn't bring it with me, but it has to do with how um, members are removed from the board. And unless it's been changed, it, a member may be removed instead of shall be removed, missing like three meetings in a row or missing um, half the meetings in a year or something like that. And I, I brought that up when the city manager um, brought this, the revisions to the CRB, um, because there is one member who was appointed in October, and unless she came last Thursday, she hasn't attended a city, a single meeting, right? October until... Um, March, and she hasn't attended a, a single meeting, and if it said shall be removed, then she could be cleared out of the way and the seat opened for someone else. Could I address that really quick, Mayor? Just very quickly. Sure. It, I would have a little bit of angst with shall because people do have life experiences, and I had someone on my DAP who had a severe illness a couple years ago and was a, had to miss several meetings. So there's some technicality there. I mean, nothing is black and white in, in the world. So thank you for your comments. Thank you for being here today. Sure. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Welcome. Hello. Long day. I appreciate everyone taking the time. None of us have had lunch, so I'm sure you're all dehydrated and hungry. Faith Martin, uh, Vice Chair of the Racial Profiling Board, um, Vice Mayor, Mayor, Councilman, City Manager, um, I appreciate you taking the time today. I am not cool enough to not look at my notes, so I'll be looking at my notes a lot. Um, I'm here because we want a strong, effective ordinance, just like all of you. We are not telling you we don't want an ordinance. We we definitely want a strong, effective ordinance. Our community is shocked and outraged by everything that we've heard, just like you are. And, you know, how could this happen? Why are we finding out, finding out about this? Um, what is our city going to do? You know, as these text messages have come out, and these events have unfolded, you know, we found that police misconduct is not just an event. It's a, it's a pattern. And the Racial Profiling Board estimates that the city of Wichita has paid almost $2 million in legal fees in just the past 10 years for police misconduct. So the Racial Profiling Board is paying attention. Long before the crimes in Minneapolis has led to conviction of Derek Chauvin, Wichita, thankfully, saw the need for civilian oversight of police misconduct complaints, and the Citizen Review Board ordinance was passed and the board was formed. The Racial Profiling Board worked di diligently with the city manager and the former chief, deputy chief, many in the WPD. We've also worked with the Fraternal Order of Police, the Citizens Review Board, and PSB, uh, Professional Standards Bureau, to try and expand the authority of the CRB, add members that reflect the community, increase the transparency of the process, and expand the scope of review that allows the CRB to investigate, because we think that citizen oversight includes investigation. Provide regular comprehensive reporting and policy recommendations, because we do want them to include all those things. It's becoming increasingly evident to us that the police cannot police the police. The CRB is not working as expected, and they should be directing the city manager to investigate and improve the inner workings of the WPD. That includes training, protocols, practices, and officer behaviors. So 
when I say we ask that the city council not adopt the ordinance, I don't mean that. I mean, we want you to give us the same thing that the NDO was last year. Give us a time frame for when we can accept it on a second reading. We would love that. Um, you know, we want it tabled for discussion, amendments, you know, a greater, more impactful ordinance that does what we all hope it was designed to do. Dr. Chapel gave you guys 10 recommendations, subpoena power to follow the evidence, no specific officers that are involved in incidents when possible, uh, compel production of video and cell phone devices to hear all the facts, conduct investigations. There's amazing training that's out there from the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. I think it's great that you want to reach out to um, other organizations, but I would love to empower our own citizens to be able to do that without using more taxpayer dollars. Um, the power uh, to conduct that investigation and post those cases um, to follow facts and rely on redacted, redacted information is really important to civilian oversight. Professional training, um, coming from the talent world, I think training, training, training is important. I've actually gone through Citizens Police Academy Great. I honestly am going to do a pitch for it now. I think everyone should go through Citizens Police Academy. Um, check it out. It's really great uh, for uh, civic engagement. Oversight to appeal to the city council when disciplinary actions are needed and they're not implemented by the chief or city manager. I think that's where you guys should come in and, and stick a toe in the water. Those factual reports are really important. Analysis done on those traffic citations, like Dr. Chapel said. You know, those three months of investigations into racial profiling, excessive use of force complaints are really important. Monthly meeting agendas, all the attachments and meeting minutes from previous, previous months like Twyla mentioned, all those detailed case summaries and findings, those should all be available to any citizen that wants to review that uh, when they are making complaints. And I'm not sure where the complaint came from for the text messages, if that was established by a citizen to put it through the citizen review board, or if that came from you guys, because maybe the investigation into this shouldn't be sitting with the Citizen Review Board and should be done investigatively somewhere else. Um, but you know, publishing the names of these officers or any other things, that could be done through the Citizen Review Board if a citizen requested this, or investigations may need to go somewhere else. But all unredacted personnel files on officers that need investigations, that may need to be done through citizen oversight, or that may be needed to handle somewhere else, depending on how the complaints were uh, created. But again, like Twyla said, missing meetings, if new members need to be appointed, we are so happy that this is being expanded to include our city council members. You will each bring in members from your area that will give depth and breadth to this review board that's so important. Independent, strong civilian oversight of police misconduct is essential for effective policing. The Racial Profiling Board has always wanted to create strong ties with our city and our policing. That's one of our mandates as well. You know, we have made many recommendations to the city council and we have worked very diligently with our city manager to try to, to try to create these strong relationships and ties. There's many other cities to benchmark like Austin and Baltimore that have fantastic uh, civilian and citizen oversight with policing. And you know, there, we wanna give this the same due diligence that we're doing with our chief selection or that we do with our fraternal order of police contract. We wanna give this ordinance that same kind of due diligence. I hope that at the end of the day, our goal here is all the same, that we expand civilian oversight of the Wichita Police Department and improve those relationships between the community, the police, and our city government. Because civic engagement is lacking and it's really important that we grow that. I can stand for questions, but honestly, civic engagement is very passionate to me. And like Vice Mayor said, I sit on the DAB2 board and you know I'm just here to make sure that we can all grow those things. Thank you. Okay. we. Thank you. I, I just want to point out that, again, you. I just find it contradictory for people to come to the podium, ask for transparency, while also asking that we don't move forward with a document that will require and allow transparency for the current situation. And I think that we are on the same page as far as goals. But as the discussion continues, I hope that the folks who came here looking to utilize the current, the current, um, uh, the current proposal as pretty much leverage to ensure that they themselves could have 
say within that proposal, that doesn't have to happen. We can move forward with a step forward by adapting this so that tonight, today, the next hour, we can be transparent. We can empower these people with transparency uh, while also coming back at it and building upon the, that, those changes and that success. It doesn't have to be an either or, it can be an and. And I think that it's very important that we, as this discussion keeps going, I would hope that the people who have been presenting will adjust their expectations knowing more information about what our expectations are, that this isn't a one and done. We hope to continue to build on this. And again, this is at this point, not in a, it's an oversight, not investigative. So if we are going to talk about having a difference in trajectory to a more investigative style citizen review board, that's gonna take longer than a week as well. So I, I, I just want to express, I think we're all on the same page where we want to go, but I keep hearing people say, hey, we want you to stop progress tonight so that the next time we have a text issue, the next time we have a big issue, then we'll, we'll have the tools ready to be prepared for that. But I think the council here wants to give those tools today, knowing that it's not enough tools, but at the very least, it lets us get through where we need to be for the particular moment we're in. All right, there's no, no one on the board. So next speaker, please. And again, it, we asked folks, it's been a long day and I've let everyone go over on time. Please try to be respectful of time. Uh, My name is Sybil Strom. I'm, I live at 326 North Wallet. What qualifications do you have to be on a citizen board? Now, I have been an educator. I've also worked on a PTA. I would love to get on that board because I have talked to people that said that they were treated wrongly by the police. So how do I get on that board? That's all I want to say. Short and sweet. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Is there any more input from the public on this issue? Okay. Let's go and bring discussion back to the bench. And let's go through the proposed uh, amendments and then also any other amendments uh, to allow this to, to get to where it needs to be. So with that, page two, uh, staff has prepared an amendment for page two, uh, paragraph six, and it's line two to add, the board may issue a written report of the board's findings and recommendations of such review of professional standards investigation. Is there any discussion on that proposed amendment? Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I would like to add the word public so that it would read, the board may issue a public written report. The board may issue a written... A, a public written report. A public... May issue a, a written... A, a public written report. Yep. The... I will tell you... I will have an amendment following this that says, this written re report shall be considered a public record under the Kansas Open Records Act. That would be the second amendment I will offer, which I think adds to what you are, are requesting. And therefore, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if you, you are interested in holding off on your amendment to this language, and then we can discuss the addition here and decide, do we want to add the word public or add the more clarifying sentence that also gets us to, I think, where you want to go. I will defer to your legislative language. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> so, um, so let's go, and again, we're going to go bam, bam, bam when it comes to these am amendments. We're going through the whole document and adding to it. And, and uh, if you have an amendment that achieves a goal that someone else's amendment might achieve but might be cleaner, let's have the discussion so that we can uh, make sure that we have the best product moving forward. 
uh, Council Member Fry. And again, I've made a motion to accept this sentence that is presented as a um, as a uh, an amendment. Uh, it hasn't been seconded yet, so we're still discussing. Council Member Fry is no longer on the board, so the motion is to accept the amendment that was prepared by prepared by staff. The board may issue a written report of the board's findings and recommendations of such review of a professional standards investigation. Council Member Fry. Sorry, I may have hit that button accidentally to withdraw. I just wanted to know, are we procedurally going to vote on each amendment separately, or are we going to do all the amendments and then vote on it as a whole? So the way we do amendments is we vote on each of them separately, unless you wanted to Thank you. vote on the document as a whole, but it seems like from there, there are some folks who, who want to add to each section. So, And I was waiting to hear how we're going to do it, so I will second your motion. Okay, excellent. So there has been a motion and a second. Again, it is to add the amendment that has been prepared by staff uh, for page two, section six. It's in the packet um, to add the... Second sentence, uh, the board may issue a written report of the board's findings and recommendations of such review of professional standards investigation. Clerk is open to roll, members cast the vote. I've received seven votes, that motion does pass. Now, the I will make a motion to add the sentence, which I think meets the, um, the uh, uh, satisfies the concerns of Councilmember Johnson. The sentence reads, this written report shall be considered a public record under the Kansas Open Records Act. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and second. Any discussion on that amendment? See none with that, the clerk will open up the roll. Members cast the vote. Have received seven yay votes. That is also passed. We're now moving on to page two. Uh, Section 6A, under membership, uh, the amendment proposed by staff uh, strikes, the board shall consist of striking, it strikes no more than three, 13 members appointed by the city manager, that language is removed. So as amended, it would read, the board shall consist of 13 members, the mayor and city council will appoint seven members, six members will be appointed by the city man manager, Members shall be residents of the city of Wichita. So again, if this amendment passes, that is how that section would read. Is there any discussion on that section? Councilmember Bluebog. I'm still kind of, um, I don't quite understand this one since if the Citizen Review Board's gonna be over a Wichita police officer that, I mean, city manager's already over all personnel. So I guess I still don't quite understand why the appointees are coming from, you know, you have the ultimate power in that already. Yeah, this is, and this is the part that actually allows council members to appoint members in, into this position. So uh, we've had some discussion on it, but city manager. If I think council member Bluebaugh's Asking why I have why I have members. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, good question. Yeah. But. Again, it's a continuation of the practice that we had before. Except what I'm doing is recommend is recognizing that the mayor and council should be more actively involved. But I still have a role in implementing the policies that come from this board. I still have a responsibility to make sure it's staffed, and um, it is. Um, I, I don't, you know, again, I have other appointments. I'm, I'm not going to defend it. If the council wants to go in a different direction, it's, that's okay with me. I mean, it's, I was just trying to get a hybrid from where we are today, recognizing the mayor and council should be involved. The, and at this point, particularly where, where we are at with this ordinance, I, I, I support the hybrid model going forward as we continue to dig into this more, maybe it comes up that there has to be a different appointment structure, uh, but it, what this is doing is kind of seems to me straddling that line between the policy branch, which is us, and then also the administration branch, which is the other side of our government as well. So um, just 
throwing that out there, I, I, but, but I understand that as we, we go forward with this, there, there might be a push to, um, to, to change the appointment process. Uh, Councilmember Hoheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I know that some members had been uh, allowed to fall off in anticipation of this. Um, how many board members do we currently have seated? And how are we going to go about um, narrowing the number down further from that to meet your six appointees? Well, under the ordinance that's recommended, all terms would expire and then we we would start with new appointments i i would envision that, that i would recommend some existing members and it would be to each council, council member to make a determination on who they want represented and it could be a carryover it could be a brand new person from your district or from the city so there's no guarantee in terms of continuation um, of members okay thank you thank you all right, uh, further discussion? If not, I will make the motion to accept the, um, the amendment to section A under, excuse me, to A under title membership in section six, which is page two, that shall read after amendment, the board shall consist of 13 members, the mayor and city council will appoint seven members, six members will be appointed by city manager, members shall be residents of the city of Wichita. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members will cast their vote on that particular amendment. Have received seven yay votes. That amendment does pass. Moving on to in legal jump in if I'm missing any. It looks like under terms of office, uh, it's page two still, terms of office, uh, A would read if when amended, members of the board shall serve a term of two years. All board appointees shall begin on April 1st of the year, exceptions uh, as set forth below. No member shall serve more than four consecutive full terms. Any individual serving as an appointed board member on the date of passage of these amendments shall continue to serve until a successor has been duly appointed and qualified. Such individuals shall be eligible for reappointment of no more than two additional two year terms. Members shall be notified in writing uh, as to whether they will be reappointed to the board. So with the amendments, it's striking some language, but also adding some language. That would be how it reads if the amendment passes. So I move to accept the amendments uh, by staff, which would leave that section to read as was read. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and then seconded to accept the amendment presented by staff. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. Having received seven yay votes, that motion does pass. Next is page three uh, under B, and it adds the terms mayor or city council member may appoint a successor to serve an unexpired term. Uh, and this is adding not just, this is adding to the language that says the city manager may make those appointments now. It's also adding the mayor or city council members uh, may appoint a successor to serve the unexpired term. And then it says members appointed by the mayor or city council will be replaced by the mayor or city council. Members appointed by the city manager will be replaced by the city manager. Again, these amendments allow it to function uh, with, with, the, um, with, with the new uh, appointees coming from, from, the, uh, from the council. So that is page three, section B. Is there any discussion on that? I make a motion to accept those changes. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Having received seven yay votes, that motion passes. There are some technical amendments uh, in section C on page three, which um, uh, seem to, to codify some of the changes already made. Uh, it would read, 
a member may be removed from the board for the following reasons. It strikes the words by the city manager, which means the city manager will no longer be the person removing these, but these conditions will be what removes them. So no longer meets the eligibility uh, requirements, misses more than three consecutive board meetings, and that is an amendment from two executive, two meetings now to three, uh, or 50% of board meetings in the last 12 month period. Uh, so again, this is page three, section C. I'll make a motion to accept the amendments uh, of that, that, that have been presented by or prepared by staff. Second. Motion is made and seconded. Clerk, open roll. Having received seven yay votes, that those amendments, all the amendments on page three have, have been accepted. Moving on to page Four, right above the term section four, uh, it's in addition, the language reads, members appointed to by the mayor and city council shall be subject to removal by the mayor or city council. Members appointed by the city manager shall be subject to removal by the city manager. Given the amendments are already made, these look like technical uh, amendments that codify uh, the uh, changes already in the document. Uh, therefore, I'll make a motion to to accept that amendment that has been prepared by staff. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and then seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members will cast the vote. Ever received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Page four, under section 4A, we are adding a line prepared by, uh, a line prepared by staff that says, the board in executive session shall be provided the disciplinary summary of any officers involved in a complaint reviewed by the board. Personal identifiers of the officers will be redacted. Uh, this again is an amendment um, presented by staff. Uh, it goes from page four to page five and it is section four part A. So I'll make a motion to accept that amendment as presented by staff. Second. And seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll, members cast the vote. I will also offer an amendment that says, and it would actually go now between, be, before the Senate's personal identifiers, uh, to say the disciplinary summary shall detail all complaints made against any officers involved, whether the complaint was found or unfounded, and detail any disciplinary administered if there was any discipline. Uh, so what this is doing, it is an amendment to allow uh, past uh, um, history to also be uh, accessible to the board uh, in the disciplinary summary. Uh, so with that, I'll make a motion to put that, and that is uh, section four, part A, um, as the second to last sentence. Is there a second? Councilmember Johnson. Um, can you reread that one more time? The disciplinary summary shall detail all complaints made against any officers involved, whether the complaint was founded or unfounded, in detail any disciplinary administrated if there was any discipline. What this is doing is it's actually, um, and I'll speak to the amendment, uh, what it's doing is it's actually uh, allowing a deeper look back as was presented by the uh, racial profiling board that hey, we want to make sure that officers can look further back than one year to determine if the board is interested in that information, they would have the ability to access that information to determine a pattern of behavior possible. Mr. Mayor. You may provide supporting information, but not debate. Mr. Manager. Thank you. Um, I do believe there could be some legal considerations in, in, in that provision. Um, when we are involved in disciplinary hearings, we're not allowed, there's, there are certain limitations on what we can consider. So I, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not quite sure how, how far this provision goes and whether or not it 
is contrary to what's allowed in terms of consideration of disciplinary action um, of uh, officers. So I, I, again, I'm not quite sure how to, to address that other than I, I, I'm, I think it needs more research. So in your legal opinion, this would need more research. I would add that I think it needs to be discussed what that population of records means because there are a, a voluminous amount of records that it could encompass, but without, this is the first time I've heard it, I, I need to understand what it means in terms of what records exist and what these do encompass and what the intent of the board is, if we could ask for that. I mean, I, I understand that the intent is to provide discipline, but there are, it could be interpreted differently depending on what records we have. So I need, I'd like to look at that. Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I'm not saying this in substitution for what the mayor said, but would it be, um, I guess, cleaner if it was disciplinary history specifically around excessive force, officer-involved shootings, and or um, false or dishonest reports? That, that limits it, but it's not definitive in terms of surrounding or what... But you know, whether a complaint has been made or there's there's a lot of levels of different records. I'm not trying to be an obstacle. I just think it needs to be nailed down exactly what records we're talking about. Well, if it was specifically disciplinary, that means something happened to that officer, not just a complaint. I, I agree with the complaints, but in this case, it would be this officer did something. Um, an officer-involved shooting doesn't always mean wrong. But if there was a shooting, that record is there uh, no matter when it occurred. If there was excessive force, that record would be there and the discipline of it would be there. So that would mean that it rose to the attention of at least PSB and something occurred. Because one of the things I think I've continued to hear from the racial profiling board and other activists is that these things keep happening, but we're only looking at this one situation. Like, that's kind of where the issue would be. I appreciate that it does narrow down the amount of potential records. I mean, I think it's it's helpful. So, and, and I like the possibility of the amendment from the wording and narrowing it further by Councilmember Johnson, adding the word may instead of shall might also allow for some uh, discretion, particularly if legal was to say how to, because legal will eventually talk about how to interpret this in a lawful way. So, and thus, if we have shall, and then we clean it up with what, what Johnson just, I, I would accept that as a friendly, a friendly amendment to my uh, um, original motion. And I think it might actually get us to where we need to be uh, by having the flexibility where if, if something, a situation in which we couldn't legally proceed with it, there wouldn't be a conflict in law. Uh, so um, I, my motion to add is actually the motion to add what Johnson just said. Uh, Vice Mayor Tuttle. Thank you. I, I was just going to lean into legal. And we know that we're going to revisit this again. We, we promised the community we're coming back to this. Is this an item that you, you would recommend we revisit? Or is what's being discussed now okay? I mean, it's a lot to absorb at one time. So I don't want to, I mean, we're we know we're coming back to it. So is it worth waiting to make sure we get it right is the question. Thank you. I think it's, it's something we could revisit, should revisit. But in the meantime, I think we can try to work on an application of, of Council Member Johnson's language. If I could hear that motion again, so I can write it. Um, so Mayor Whipple had the initial wording, but I wanted to know if um, we got specific to disciplinary history, specifically around excessive force, officer-involved shootings, and or false dishonest reports. And of course, the intent is, is may instead of shall, so that it allows the flexibility within certain situations to still, um, to, to still navigate the process uh, in a way that doesn't contradict. 
So with that, that I'll, I will. I'll second your motion. There we go. Yeah, I was going to say it's either it's either I'm seconding you or you're seconding me, Johnson. Uh, so with that, a motion has been made and seconded uh, to add that as the second to last sentence of the um, section four, part A. Clerk will open the roll. Members cast the vote. Has ever received seven yay votes? That motion does pass. We are on page five, um, section C. I make a motion to accept. Uh, all changes uh, by by our by staff. It, uh, it is there are some some changes about changing including to included. Uh, so some technical changes. The main part is adding the language. The individual making the initial complaint to the Professional Standards Bureau shall be notified of the board's review PSB findings. Uh, and may address the board during the executive session portion of the meeting when the board is reviewing that matter. Such individuals will not be allowed to attend the board's deliberation or discussion of the complaint while in executive session. A copy of any written decisions or findings made by the board after its review will be provided to the complaint. So again, this is the amendment that has been vetted and, and reviewed by staff. I will make a motion to accept that language as well as the technical changes uh, in section C. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members will cast the vote. And again, this is page five. Have we received 78 votes? That motion does pass. Getting close, everyone. On to uh, page. Pardon me. Section four, part D, uh, there's an amendment that I, I want to offer that I think clarifies um, the overarching the, the overarching intent of the language changes, but I think it might have been missed by, by our legal staff, and that's adding to part D. Currently reads, the board's review will be for the purpose of reviewing any applicable administrative regulations and advising the chief of police on practices and training relevant to issues or concerns uncovered as part of the investigation. I would like to add the chief of police, comma, city manager, the mayor, and city council. This will allow um, the board's review uh, to be also distributed to the city manager and the council and the mayor who, of course, we're the ones who uh, are all, it's also our appointees. So. I believe that it codifies the intention of this. Uh, so it's just adding, instead of advising the chief of police, also the city manager, the mayor, and the council is the only uh, changes I'm proposing there. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded, and this is part D, page five. Um, is there any discussion? If not, uh, clerk will open a roll, members cast their vote, and we're getting so close to getting through this. Having received seven yay votes, that motion does pass. Section four, part E. Uh, the amendments made by staff uh, indicate all, all deliberations of the board will be confidential. Following such deliberations, the board may issue a written report regarding its findings and recommendations. The report shall uh, not name the officer or officers involved in the professional standings investigation. The individual bringing the initial uh, PSB complaint, uh, the chief of police, professional standards bureau, city manager, and any involved personnel will be notified in writing of the board's decision and receive a copy of any written report issued by the board. That's how it would read after, uh, after this initial amendment that was prepared by staff. Uh, so I'll make a motion to accept the amendments that have been prepared and vetted by staff for section E. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and then seconded. Clerk will open the roll. Members cast the vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Um, I would also make a motion to add the sentence, the second sentence for section E that would say, this written report shall be considered a public record under the Kansas Open Record Act. Again, I think that's um, part of the intentions, but this amendment will clear that up even more. Uh, this would be adding 
the written report shall be considered a public record under the Kansas Open Records Act as, um, as the second sentence to, to uh, paragraph E. Excuse There's, me, Mayor, I'll yes. address that language. The term public record means something different than open record. Public records are not all open records. If the intent of the board is to make it an open record, then we should use the term open record, and we should probably go back to the prior mention of that, if that's the intent. Well, let's use the word open record then. Okay. Let's, let's keep open. it consistent. Open in both places. Yes. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Um, so with that, um, it's just adding that there, or codifying that the report shall be considered an open record under the Kansas Open Record Act so that uh, we can uh, be consistent with the changes made previously. I've made the motion. Is there a second to add that? Second. Motion is made and seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. I've received 78 votes. That motion does pass. At the very last um, section for E, there is, uh, I've reviewed this and want to offer the amendment where right now it says uh, the chief of police, professional standards borough, city manager, I would like to add comma after city manager and insert the language, the mayor and city council as well. So again, we can cognify the intention of this legislation so that we as council members and as mayor also are in a loop when it comes to um, receiving these reports as again, this now is an extension of us with our appointees. Uh, so with that, I am asking to add just the language, the mayor and city council after city manager so that we also are intended to get this information. Uh, with that, I will make that motion. I'm looking for a second. Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Have I received 78 votes? That motion does pass. Madam Clerk, I do have the other amendments here. Um, with that, is there further discussion? Council Member Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, Actually, I have two more, one technical one, one definitely for us to talk about. Let's do it. Um, as we talked about the one-year concern on page four, which I should have said this earlier, section 4A, um, instead of one year, could we change that to five? So page four, section A, review of post-disciplinary administration matters. The... Uh, the they sentence propose. says a request by the board to review post-discipline findings must be made no later than one year from the date of discipline. And I am suggesting five. I am suggesting five because this incident that has uh, garnered attention happened in 2020, discipline happened in 21, had a member of this board not been paying attention and missed that, this wouldn't be talked about, but it's definitely something worth looking at. Um, so that was why I said. I will second the, the uh, motion. So it is replacing the word one with the word five and the word year with the word years. Yes. So with that, a motion has been made and seconded to extend the word one to five. Uh, members will cast the vote. I received seven votes. That amendment does pass. Uh, the floor is yours for additional comments or amendment. Thanks, Mayor. Um Page four, number four, up closer to the top, the question I asked Jennifer earlier about section 2.10.045 of the city code, I would like to add an exception to that. Um, and the exception is B. Uh, Jennifer did send out what that was. B is, uh, or 7B is battery or resist of law enforcement officer. I say that specifically because that was one of the things I was accused of and I was moving because I had pain in my back from an officer's knee and I was told I was resisting. Ultimately, I was able to get that charged move, but oftentimes we see people um, allegedly resisting because they're in pain and just trying to stop the pain and I wouldn't want that to stop somebody uh, from serving on this board. So if we were to... And thank you for the, for the explanation of the amendment. I will second that amendment. Uh, this is page four, number four at the top. Does not pass the criminal background check in accordance with criteria set forth. And it mentions the section of the code of the city of Wichita. And you are, your amendment would add a 
exception, exception, exception. Um, 7B of that code. With the exception of? 7B. 7B yep. of code 210.045. Yep. And is that legal wrote, wrote that down? That section says may not currently be on probation, parole, or participating in a diversion or deferred judgment agreement for any misdemeanor conviction for any of the following offenses. A, possession of controlled substances. B, battery or resist of law enforcement officer, which is what you're yep. describing. And then C, crimes of false, dishonesty or false. This is only for folks, the exclusions are only for people who are on, currently on probation, parole, or diver, diver, diversion or deferred judgment. Excellent. And with this amendment, it means that those who aren't currently on parole would actually be allowed to come back and serve in, in this capacity. So with that, the motion has been made and seconded. It has been clarified by legal as far as the language. Uh, therefore, uh, clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. Ever received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Uh, Councilmember Johnson. Uh, that was all the amendments, but I did want to highlight, because um, this is always asked, um, racial profiling board sent us a number of items. I won't go through all of them, but item 10 on their um, requirements about um, attendance, I think, is addressed in this ordinance, because um, you have three consecutive. You also have missing 50% within a year, so it kind of adds to what they said. Um, number... Seven, I think, is addressed with the city's website. The, the only difference is just making sure that it's up to date. I just looked at it and it said the next meeting is March 24th. So we just need to keep that up to date. But I think seven is addressed by them, uh, by us, which was asking for monthly meeting agenda attachments and minutes. I looked through what we have and I saw attachments and minutes and agendas. Um, my question around number five is could that technically be addressed by a written report that that if we pass this they would have and that speaks to uh, oversight within the power to appeal to city council some of the amendments that we've just made would have reports come to us but also with public reporting we I think that number is addressed and I could be wrong uh, but I just wanted to get those numbers out um, and then on the training piece I don't think this needs to be ordinance, but as they get trained, I would like to make sure that all the members of the Citizen Review Board also know about CPOST. And we could probably reach out to Doug Schrader, who's the director, to give an introduction. I say that because if there are opportunities that the Citizen Review Board may feel warrant action, and maybe our policy does not address that, there is state statute that could be used, whether discipline is given by the department or not, that CPOS could look into. So it would be good to have them know more about CPOS. Good discussion. Are there further proposed amendments to, to this ordinance? If not, then I will, if there's no further discussion from the bench, then I will take the, I, I will make the motion to declare an emergency and adopt the ordinance on first reading and authorize the necessary signatures, excuse me, let me restate that, to declare an emergency and adopt the ordinance as amended on first read and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll, members will cast their vote. Have received 78 votes. That passes unanimously. And thank you, everyone, uh, for that. We will instruct, um, of course, legal, who will have to now get this all together so I can sign up by the end of the day, and thus it's enacted. Or not. But <laughs> I'm here for it. <laughs> I don't know if you have to or not, but I'm whatever process you need. An hour okay, Madam Clerk, minutes. what's next? Planning consent agenda items or non-consent planning items. CON 2021-065, conditional use for nightclub in the city on property zone, limited commercial located one half mile west of North Oliver Avenue and on the north side of East 13th Street North, 3906 East 13th Street North. So Councilmember Tuttle was actually on the board before 
the clerk announce the next item, even though, so we're kind of between items, so I do want to get the floor to uh, Vice Mayor Tuttle, my apologies. No problem, um, and Mr. Chapman, Dr. Chapman's leaving, but we did promise them that we would come back and have like a kind of a time boundary, and I don't think we necessarily did that, um, so I just wanted to make sure we followed through with the commitment that we made that, you know, we were reviewing this now and made these changes for today because we needed to make an emergency adoption but what's the next step with their recommendations and it, and maybe a time boundary. Um, we said we do it, so I just want to make sure we follow through. Thank you. Very, very good. And we will ask the public to continue to hold us accountable. So yes, uh, and we will ask the manager to also help us uh, um, figure out the, the proper time to add this to the next agenda. Um, we're at the point of the day where I'm just gonna call you Scott. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> DAB recommendations are different. There we go. So again, Scott Wadle from the Planning Department here to present this item because we have different recommendations from the DAB and the Planning Commission. Property owner has applied for a conditional use in order to allow for a nightclub in the city, which is the combination of alcohol and entertainment uh, at the property. The property is located at 3906 East 13th Street on the north side of 13th Street, about midway between Hillside and Oliver. You can see it outlined on this map. Here's an aerial image of it. The entire, uh, the property is currently zoned LC Limited Commercial and is developed with a multi-tenant commercial building. The entire property has a conditional use that allows for a tavern or drinking establishment on the site. So that is currently already in place. What they are applying for is a conditional use for nightclubs so that they can also have entertainment as well. In terms of context, uh, the property to the north of the subject site is owned LC, limited commercial, and is vacant. Property to the south, across the street, is McDonald Golf Course. Property to the east of the subject site, across East Vesta Drive, is owned LC, and is likewise developed with a multi-tenant commercial building. Property to the west of the subject site is on the other side of the Red Bud Path, and the street near it is zoned a mix of TF3, two-family residential, and SF5, single-family residential. These properties are developed with a mix of single-family and two-family dwellings, and they're right off the edge of this area. You can see the zoning map here. In terms of review, on January 18th, the DAB reviewed the request and recommended denial of the application 5-0. to zero. Members of the public spoke at this public hearing, voicing opposition to the request. On January 20th, the Planning Commission deferred the application to their February 17th meeting. Uh, the purpose of the deferral was to allow time for the applicant to more clearly define what they were seeking with their application and for the case to be reheard at the DAB at their February 7th meeting. One member of the public spoke uh, at that public hearing, voicing opposition to the request. At that February 7th meeting, the DAB reviewed the request again and recommended approval of the application five to two with some conditions that are listed in the staff report. Those include relocating a wooden fence, uh, adhering to uh, supplementary regulations that are in the zoning code for nightclub in the city, um, prohibiting outdoor entertainment, including outdoor speakers. Uh, let's see, on February 17th, the Planning Commission recommended denial of the application seven to three. No member of the public spoke at that public hearing. Uh, no protests were filed against this case. In terms of actions, uh, it is recommended that the City Council adopt the findings of the MAPC and deny the requested conditional use. This action be, can be approved with a simple majority vote, four of seven votes. The alternatives include the following. You can override the MAPC recommendation, provide alternative findings, and approve the conditional use with conditions as recommended by the DAB. This would require five of seven votes. Likewise, you can also override the MAPC recommendation and approve it with different uh, conditions or modifications to the DAB conditions. That would also require five of seven votes. Or, as always, you can return the case to the MAPC for additional consideration, and that would require a simple majority of four of seven votes. So with that, I will take you through some of the images and then stand for questions. So you've seen the zoning map here. You can see uh, LC zoning 
yeah, of the property and immediately around it. And then you can see the mix of yellow and white, which is residential zoning. Here's a map from the comprehensive plan. It shows the location as industrial and commercial. I believe that that's, uh, I'm not sure where the industrial came from, but obviously the commercial is reflecting what was there previously. Uh, you may be familiar with the site, uh, the, the site and the specific location where the applicant's applying for the nightclub. Uh, conditional use is the old Cedar Saloon. So um, there it is on the image. And in terms of the protests, again, there were no protests that were received for this application. Here's a photo of the site. Uh, this is looking to the east across the street. This is looking to the north and the west, immediately north of the subject site. Uh, this is the golf course to the south. Uh, here's the red bud path immediately to the west. I'm looking at some of the residential houses to the west. And there's the aerial. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Are there questions for staff? See none. Is there input from the public on this particular item? Sir, the city council has a policy. Uh, we don't have to do input from the public. Yes. It's taken at the MAPC meeting. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. I'm sorry. I'm actually starting to, I think, show I'm, I'm tired on this. Uh, this. So there is no input from the public on this, so the discussion comes back to the bench. The chair recognizes Councilmember Johnson as this item resides in District 1 for discussion and or motion. Thanks, Mayor. Might have to get you a Snickers here pretty soon. No kidding. <laughs> Second. Um, this case had really good, lively discussion at the district advisory board. Um, I feel like they really helped uh, clarify where we are. And one of the main points made by one of the gentlemen who actually lives near this area was that if we always say no, uh, we won't see any real change in investment in the area. And it's been a while in that area. Um, so with that said, um, based upon a review of the record, I would hereby move to approve the application for a conditional use to allow the subject property to be a nightclub in the city. I find the following facts as they relate to the golden factors. The property relates to the zoning, uses of character of the neighborhood, and subject property is currently allowed to have a bar by right due to it being zoned LC and the applicant is only asking for approval to have live music on site. Also, the terms and conditions of the Metrop Metropolitan Area Planning Department staff report with the following conditions. The hours shall be up to 10 o'clock p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 1 o'clock a.m. on Friday and Saturday. It is also strongly encouraged for the establishment to provide security on site and that a closing said security direct traffic of the patrons leaving the establishment to exit the premises on 13th Street and not on Vester Street, and, def and do adopt the comments of District Advisory Board 1 relating to this case, wherein it voted to approve this application. Second. Motion has been made and then seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Ever received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Zone 2022-7. Zone change request from two-family residential to multifamily residential for redevelopment on property generally located within one half mile north on West 13th Street North, one block east of North Waco Avenue, 1641 North Fairview. Director Wagle. Scott Wagle again from the planning department. This item is being presented today for two reasons. Uh, there have been valid protests received for this case and that the DAB and Planning Commission recommendations are different. The application is for a rezoning from TF3 two-family zoning to MF29 multifamily zoning. The property is located at 1641 North Fairview. It is, again, TF3 and is a legal non-conforming use because it is developed with two buildings with a total of six dwelling units on the site, although we've had a little bit of a discrepancy on that. Uh, the county records indicate seven dwelling units on the site. So uh, just a quick note about that. In terms of the request, the property owner has intended that they are requesting the rezoning in order to have the zoning match the current development on the site, because again, it's currently a legal non-conforming use, and two, to allow for the addition of more dwelling units on the site. 
The requested MF29 zoning would allow for up to 12 dwelling units on the site. In terms of the context, the properties to the north, south, east, and west of the subject site are zoned TF3 two-family residential and are developed with single-family dwellings. There is a church located northeast of the subject site and there are multiple properties zoned MF29 residential on the block to the north and block to the south, but there are none zoned MF29 on this block. So you can see here the green uh, properties are the MF29 properties. In terms of review, on March 3rd, the Planning Commission uh, held the public hearing and recommended approval of MF18 zoning. So it was not MF29 that they recommended, but rather MF18. They recommended that with a vote of seven to four. Multiple residents spoke in opposition to the request uh, that was initially filed by the applicant at, the, at this hearing. The minutes from the meeting, of course, are included in your packet. The recommended MF18 zoning would allow for a maximum of seven dwelling units on the subject site, and that is based on the amount of space uh, on the subject site and the density that that zoning allows. On March 7th, the District Advisory Board recommended denial of the application 7-0. Multiple neighborhood residents spoke in opposition to the request at that, at that meeting. A report from the meeting, again, is attached in the, report, in the staff report. On March 14th, the Historic Preservation Board, the city's Historic Preservation Board, requested a brief explanation of the case and voted to recommend denial of the application 5 to 0. Valid protest petitions have been received for the requested zone change. They totaled 40 over, just over 40% of the protest area. This exceeds the state threshold of 20%, and so any rezoning approval will require six of seven votes from the council. In terms of council actions, it is recommended that city council adopt the findings of the MAPC and approve MF18 zoning uh, for the property. Again, this will require, will require six of seven votes because of the protest. Alternatives include the following. You can modify the findings of the MAPC and approve the request for MF29 zoning, which would require, again, six of seven votes because of the protest. The request can be denied with two-thirds vote, which would require five of seven votes, or the request can be returned to the MAPC with a simple majority vote, four of seven votes. And with that, I'll take you through some of the images, and then I'll stand for questions. So this is the map of the zoning. Again, the majority of the area is zone TF3, you can see some MF29 uh, zoning nearby. This is an aerial image. You can see that there's a main uh, house and then there's an accessory structure that's in the rear of the property. This is the map from the comprehensive plan showing uh, residential is recommended. Here's a uh, rendering uh, or at least a, a drawing of the accessory unit in the back. This is what the owner was proposing to do showing uh, units in actually in addition onto that uh, accessory structure. This is the protest map, again, showing just over 40% of the area uh, turned in submitted protests. Here's photos of the house, the front of the house, house to the south, house to the north, house across the street, and again, back to the aerial. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Questions for staff. See none. With that, is there further discussion on this item? If there is none, then a chair recognizes Councilmember Ballard as this item falls into District 6. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Scott, for all your work on this. Um, I feel like we had some really robust conversations with the DAB, and um, I got many emails um, with concerns about the um, TF29. MF29. MF29, I'm sorry, yes. Um, so, um, based upon the review of the record, I hereby move to approve the rezoning application for MF18 designation. I find the following facts as they relate to the golden factors. As the property relates to the zoning, uses the character of the neighborhood, the subject property is currently a legal non-conforming use and the MF18 designation will bring the property into compliance and allow for the remodeling of the dwelling units. I'm, I am concerned that if the zoning is not changed to bring this property into compliance, 
any necessary remodeling may not occur. This property uses has remained consistent um, since following World War II. Since this property is in the historical district, any remodeling plans will need to be approved by the Historical Preservation Board, and I am aware of the over 40% protest of this matter, but I feel that the allowance of this MF18 zoning designation will allow um, for this property to be remodeled within the character of the neighborhood. Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. Everyone receives seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Specific Airport Marketing Services contract. All right. Good afternoon, Valerie Wise, Air Service and Marketing Manager for the Airport Authority. Jesse Romo had to leave for a phone call, so I'm filling in. So thank you for this opportunity um, before you for consideration and approval is a contract with Gretemann Group to provide creative services for the airport. I'm just gonna quickly go through this PowerPoint presentation. Um, in 2013, the Airport Authority changed our previous practice of consulting. Uh, we used to have a, an agency of record. We no longer have an agency of record. Uh, so that we, this contract is for creative uh, services. We also work with COP Media to provide media strategies. So it's a collaborative arrangement with the airport and COP and Gretemann. Uh, we issued a request for proposals back in January for specific airport marketing services. Uh, the services would include strategic planning, website management, creative design, creative writing, video, audio production, and contest management. We received three proposals and we interviewed all three. We had a special screening selection committee that unanimously chose Gretemann Group based upon their qualifications, experience, measurable analytics, their proven performance, the use of modern, modern marketing techniques, technology, staff resources, quality, innovation, and responsiveness. Our marketing uh, team, as I mentioned, consists, consists of Gretemann Group for Creative Development. We have used Gretemann for the last six years. Uh, typically, it's, it's about a five-year contract. In 2020, we did not do any advertising because of the pandemic and nobody was traveling. So we were ex able to extend their contract an extra year. And then we used COP Media for their media strategies. Uh, myself and the director of airports, we uh, were the marketing team. We meet on a collaborative basis to decide what is gonna be the most effective strategy based on the airport's needs. And uh, the marketing budget is $350,000. Uh, that comes out of the airport's operating budget. And there is no set amount for Gretemann. There's no set amount for COP. It's all determined based on what the strategy is. Um, Gretemann's compensation structure is based on a blended rate, which is $150 to $160 an, an hour depending on the project and the personnel involved. The new agreement will be effective upon execution and will run for one year with up to four one-year options. Our marketing priorities are focused on passenger development, increasing our passenger traffic, which in turn increases our revenue. Uh, more passengers using the airport, uh, gives us more revenue, keeps our costs low. That helps us to, you know, to, to um, enhance our air service. If we have strong market, our opportunities to add additional service are better. Uh, we also focus on increased, uh, increasing our passenger retention. In other words, keeping people from driving to uh, Kansas City or Oklahoma City or Tulsa. And then we also work to improve the airport's image and to improve the customer experience. Those are our priorities. Uh, we we um, place a lot of emphasis on pro on promoting new service. 
Uh, obviously, when we get an airline to decide to start a new um, route, it's important to increase uh, awareness of that route. The airlines very much appreciate that partnership, so we do focus on promoting new service. So we do recommend that uh, you approve the agreement and authorize the necessary signatures. I thank you, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just one real simple question. Are we going to keep that song playing, the Wichita? The what? The Wichita, the song? I don't think we have that in our terminal. <laughs> That's not ours. We don't do that, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. We have a PA of the mayor in our terminal. We can change that, though. Uh, <laughs> Councilmember Ballard. Yeah, I just have a question. Do you guys measure, like, any type of metrics, or, like, um, is there any, like, statistics or anything that you guys oh, can provide? I could talk all day about statistics. Um, uh, one of the things that we use are, well, obviously, our passenger traffic. Uh, we have had... Uh, increased growth every year since 2013 uh, up until the pandemic we've had passenger traffic increases we also have surveys of our customers and our cons our customer surveys surveys overwhelming overwhelmingly uh, show that uh, our advertising has been effective has influenced their decision to uh, book a flight we, um, we have um, catchment studies that we, we use. Our last one was in 2018 or 2019. It shows the retention rate. It shows how we're, if we're bringing more people back to our, using our airport as opposed to other airports, that has slowly increased. It was, I think, in 2018 or 2019, 84% in our primary catchment area. That's increased tremendously. Uh, can't, in 2000, I think there were, 35% uh, of our traffic was flying out of Kansas City. It's down to just 10% now. So, um, so we do have a lot of measurements to, to uh, uh, see if we're doing the right thing. And uh, when we work with, uh, with COP, with the media strategies, and with Greta Mendes, see what's gonna, what's going to, <clears throat> what is going to reach the most people and the demographics. And there's a lot of science that goes into what we do. The discussion, Councilmember Bubog. Thank you, Mayor. How many firms applied for the work? And, uh, three did. Three did. Mm -hmm. Were they all local or? One was not. Have we ever done it on an hourly rate like that? Is that how it's? Mm -hmm. is, is it's based it... on a project by project basis. What's the hourly rate we've paid in the, on past contracts? We didn't do anything last year, but the well, year we with the previous contract with Credman, it was one hundred and thirty-five to one hundred and fifty dollars an hour. And and that's blanket, no matter what the work is. It's not just creative. Or... It's it's for their creative. Now there's website management work that's going to be. They're going to use a sub, their subcontractor, which will lower that cost. They'll, that'll eliminate the agency fees. So with all the analytics you do, do you have a return on investment for advertising dollar? That's, dif that's difficult to do because you can't measure an advertising program based on, an, on a passenger uh, booking. There's just no way. A person could see an advertising uh, campaign or a program you know, last fall and they book this year. We, we can't relate that. But all, all we can do is see if we're seeing growth, uh, the feedback from our passengers, and our retention rate. I think you can. Further questions of staff? Councilmember Hoheisel. We've had quite a few, like Frontier has cut some services out. Um, do we have any plans to uh, retain some of these uh, flights that are they seem to be leaving a lot more than they are coming to Wichita now. I really need to have a workshop with you guys sometime. I, um, I would love. I would. Yeah, <laughs> that's, um, that's the word of the day is workshop. It's it's a it's a very difficult environment for the airlines right now as they're trying to recover from the pandemic. Um, they're faced with pilot shortages. They're faced with rising fuel prices. 
And so they're trying to just shuffle things around so that they can continue to, to, to serve our market and in some, in some way. Um, Frontier, um, Frontier left because one of the things was uh, crew, crew challenges, um, but they did under, underperform in our market. They, they had an 11.30 p.m. flight to Las Vegas that didn't do well. So part of it is that. The rest of the airlines are, are staying here. Um, they're, they're doing well. Uh, Southwest is shuffling things around a little bit because of crew shortages. Um, they're flying now just to Denver and to St. Louis. They've suspended the Phoenix and the St. La um, the Phoenix and the Las Vegas daily service for we don't know how long. But they're just you know they have to get the, the pilots back before they can go back to where it was in 2019. So uh, you know there's going to be changes, and the airlines are constantly looking at their schedules and making modifications. So from week to week, we don't know you know. If, if we're going to have seven flights to Dallas or six flights to Dallas or two flights to Denver, three flights to Denver, those things are changing rapidly. Um, there, we think that by next year things will slow down a little bit and smooth out, but it, it's a very challenging environment right now. I appreciate that. Um, it, it just speaks to a larger concern of mine about um, some of like our local tourism organizations. Are we getting the best bang for the buck in terms of who who we're giving the money to, how we're spending it, the clientele that we're attracting in. So, um, yeah, word of the day workshop, well, I wouldn't mind it Yeah, sometime. I will tell you that the more destinations that we're able to attract, the more tourism that we'll have. So, you know, marketing this airport, not only to our, re to our region, but marketing our region and its attributes to our airlines is also what I do. So, um as strong of a market as we have, and we show the demand that we have that that helps to attract more you know, more destinations. Okay. Appreciate it. Yeah. Further questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? Okay. We have another person. Welcome back. My name is Sybil Strom. I reside at 326 North Walnut. I have been to your airport. It was beautiful. Uh, I rode on American Airlines to Nashville, Tennessee. I even was uh, on the circle at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but that's something else. I really think that that airport has grown since I've been here. It does have food courts, and it does, but there's one thing I couldn't understand. When I went and got my ID, I was processed by a TSA guy. He didn't believe that my ID was an ID. That's the only thing I did not like. The TSA guy, or girl, I mean, started filling me. I didn't have nothing in, yeah, filling me. And I went to the, tried to go to a director and tell him that I didn't do anything. But it is beautiful, it's fantastic, and I see he's ready to go to bed. So, so I'm just gonna say, that's the only thing I, I really didn't like is the TSA guy or girl filling me. Thank you. We, we appreciate your input. Uh, again, this is about a marketing service contract for the airport. Uh, so let's uh, bring discussion back to the bench. Uh, further discussion on this. To be honest, I would like to take a deep dive into our uh, media strategy uh, I think there are some opportunities as we have been growing our own media uh, capabilities here at the city level uh, to figure out if there are some cost savings and ways in which we could uh, collaborate. Now, it is very late, and I don't think we can really have that discussion at, at this moment, so I'm going to make a motion to table this item. 
Is there a second? Motion has been made and seconded by Councilmember Bluebog. Uh, please, um, clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. May I make a? It, the motion has been made and seconded. There's not much of a. This is not for media strategies. This is for a creative contract. Right. Okay. So this uh, having received four yay votes to three nay votes, that motion does pass. This item has been tabled. Madam Clerk. General Aviation Apron Reconstruction, Wichita Dwight D. Eisenhower National Airport. Welcome. Thank you, <clears throat> Mayor and Council. Um, John Oswald, Airport Engineering and Planning Manager, here today to present the Eisenhower National Airport General Aviation Apron Phase 1 project. Uh, I think this is the clicker. We'll find out. Well, Okay, thank you. Um, general Aviation Aid for Payments are at the end of life, and some of these payments are as old as in the 1950s when this airport was first built. A majority of the payments will be constructed over multiple phases. This is phase one. Since that time, aircraft sizes and weights have increased and FAA regulations have changed. Phase one replaces old payment with a modern payment design for aircraft loadings today and also expands the apron to accommodate more and larger aircraft. It also improves efficiency, enhances airfield safety, addresses the change in FAA regulations. Uh, phase one's project has bid and is ready for construction, which would start next month, anticipated ending construction, weather permitting in late 2023. A supplemental agreement for consulting construction phase services has been prepared. Oops, too far. Thank you. Project funding of airport authorities receiving two FA grants. One's an entitlement grant, and the second is a supplementary discretionary grant. Those two grants total about 84% of the project budget. The authority funds as the balance of 14%, excuse me, 16% for a total budget of 23,023 million. $708,400. Per city charter ordinance number 228, the staff change order limit is $50,000 without airport authority approval. The duration to uh, instigate a change order approval uh, can easily result in significant delays to the project and have an adverse impact to the project schedule and cost. Uh, due to the size and complexity of the project, staff recommends an increase in the change order limits of 2.5% of the original construction contract amount, or $491,633. And increasing the staff authorization will not increase the project budget. Early June 2017, initial budget was established for $850,000. Uh, budget increase occurred in late November of 2018 for the design of bid phase services. That added to $921,900 to the budget. Today's request for construction and remaining project cost services is $21,936,500, bringing a, bringing a total budget to date of $23,708,400. Staff recommends the Wichita Airport approve the budget increase, the increase in staff change order authority, the consultant supplemental agreement, the grant applications, authorize acceptance of grant funds, and authorize the director of airports to sign all documents related to the grants. That ends my presentation. Uh, are there council questions? No questions for staff. Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, just you started your presentation recognizing aircraft have changed and yes, sir. gotten heavier. So this reconstruction, are you in? Will it be able to withstand the larger aircrafts now and anticipate potentially larger? Uh, yes, correct. Uh, we've recognized in that the FAA has a national design formula that takes the next 20 years of growth and expansion into effects into account. So yes, to answer your question. Okay. So again, just on the plane stuff. So we have triple sevens coming in with FedEx right now, but what you would be looking at is potential growth for our city to maybe have those coming in regularly yeah. and taxiing over to this space. 
triple seven seven forty seven. It would be unusual if a cargo airplane is on this side of the airfield. This side of the airfield is more of the general aviation side. This is projects on the east side of what we call the campus. The cargo facilities are on the west side of the facility and, and uh, size for both geometry and payment strength for cargo aircraft. And if you've been to our admin building, it's the payment just north of the administration building is the cargo activity. Okay. Well, I've I was just making sure, even like around passenger stuff, that the largest of planes. Were yes, uh, the, air, the FA's uh, design model includes an occasional oversized aircraft, okay. so it's uh, accounted for. Yes. Further questions for staff? See none. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Is there input from the public? See none. Discussion back to the bench. Is there further discussion on this item? If there is no further discussion on this item, then I will make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the project budget adjustment, approve the increase in staff change order authority, approve the supplemental agreement, approve the grant applications, authorize acceptance of the grant funds, and authorize the director of airports to sign all documents related to the grants. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open the roll. Members will cast their vote, please. I received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Resolution supporting a state-owned and operated mental health hospital in the, Witch in the Sedgwick County, Kansas region. Sorry, this is really late. <laughs> we did not plan a presentation. I think I, I had uh, checked with the mayor's office. This is, a, I think you all know the background um, of the resolution. It's uh, brought to you by REAP um, and, oh, excuse me, no, by the, by SCAC. Yeah. And um, it's consistent with your legislative agenda in support of this uh, facility. And, and that's an adequate overview. The, uh, <laughs> Uh, again, SCAT has requested that all the surrounding cities also do a resolution. It's just the express in, uh, opinion of the body. We have already expressed our opinion, but we want to be supportive of, of the smaller cities that surround us. Uh, so therefore, the resolution supporting a state-owned and operated mental health hospital in the Cedric County, Kansas region. Is there any discussion? See none. Is there any input from the public? I think everyone gone went home. So see none. Discussion back to the bench. If there's no further discussion on this resolution. Then I will uh, make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the resolution, authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open a roll and members shall cast their vote. Have received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Council oh, and Mayor? just a follow up. Excuse me, Madam Clerk. I will be, I, I believe with these um, resolutions, we try to get everyone's signature, so just be mindful that we'll be passing this around. It will likely be up at the front desk next to uh, uh, Sasha, so when you come in, uh, just please sign it so we can forward it on. Um, Madam Clerk. Council member appointments and comments. Okay, so we got lots of appointments. Let's do appointments first. Uh, Council member Tull. Thank you, and I have provided these to the clerk, so I'm going to read them quickly. Um, these are all reappointments for the District Advisory Board, Tracy Adams, John Baker, Chris Broderick, Sam Lindemann, Alicia, Alicia Sanchez, Faith Martin, Bruce Gass, Timothy Johnson, Jennifer McDonald, Roman Rodriguez. To the Airport Advisory Board, Charlie Fletcher. To the Animal Control Advisory Board, Stephanie McCurdy. To the Bic Wichita Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board, Monty Shaw. To the Board of Park Commissioners, Eddie Fonestock. To the Historic Preservation Board, Robert Potter. To the Library Board, Donna Douglas. To the Library Board, Chuck Charles Chuck Smith. To the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, John McKay. Um, to the Police and Fire Retirement Board of Trustees, Joseph Cooey, to the Wichita Employment Retirement System Board of Trustees, Robert Lancaster, to the Wichita Sedgwick County Board of Zoning Appeals, John McKay, and to the Wichita Sedgwick County Access Advisory Board, Christopher Ray. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Is, I'm sorry. Is it possible to put on hold the Transit Advisory Board and Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Board recommendations? Absolutely. I didn't do anyone for the transit at this point, but I would be happy it, is the bicycle board going to keep meeting? 
the, in the process? They are f during this period uh, until we until the council gives us direction on um, on the board. I didn't point anyone board. new for tra for for transit because mine resigned, but I continued with air, with the bike ped. But I'm happy to do whatever. I but think I, I misunderstood what your first set of appointments were. I thought you said trans trans. I did transit. say for the Wichita. Um, Wichita Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board. But before that? Um, that was Animal Control. No, I thought you said Transit Advisory Board. I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay. No, thank I'm you. not appointing anyone to the transit till we know what's going to happen. It. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Oh, we're still here. All right, um, Council Member Bry, uh, for, we're, we're going through appointments first, so let's try to get through the appointments. So, Council Member um, Fry. Thank you. Um, I have given these also to the clerk. Most of these are all reappointments to the Airport Advisory Board, Joey Elzey, Animal Control Advisory, Elaine Stephen, Board of Park Commissioners, Troy Palmer, to the District 5 Advisory, Lamont Anderson, Wendy Carter, Dennis Clary, a new appointment, Ashlyn Edmiston, uh, Jose Gutierrez, J.V. Johnston, Trevor Kurth, Nick Pinner, Tre Rios, a new appointment, Sierra Scott and Rachel Thomas Murphy. To the Diversity and Inclusion Civil Rights, Angela Breer. Wichita Employment, Employee Retirement, Stephen Coberly. Historic Preservation, Gary Bond. Library Board, Aaron Bach and Randall Johnston. MAPC, BZA, Mike Green. Police Fire Retirement, Dave Kane. And the Wichita Sedgwick County Access Advisory, Jill Kirshen. Councilmember Ballard. Uh, for my DAB, I'd like to reappoint uh, Linda Matney, Sergio Devora, uh, Scott Lucas, Bill Washburn, Zachary Gingrich Gaylord, uh, Mark Lee Baker, Gisela Pena, Elena Welch, Sean Rojas, Angela Martinez, and I'd like uh, my new appointments to be Tom James and Lisa Tatum. And I'd also like to appoint my ethics um, person is Gina Hayen. Council Member Bluebaugh. Thank you, Mayor. I just have um, like to appoint Jim Kelly. He's a new member of DAB4. Council Member Hoheisel. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, new members to my DAB um, Paul Davis, Chauncey Kemp, Noemi Ibarra and Geneva Chambers, and I would like to reappoint Mike Loop, Richard Ruth, Ron Tracy, Cindy Miles, David Capon, Emily Fogg, and Gerald Henry. Uh, to MAPC and BZA, uh, Cindy Miles, Historic Preservation, Elena Engel, uh, Library Board, Lauren Hirsch, and Shelby Peterson, and I will hold off on transit for now. And to add to the list of appointees, I will be appointing to the Mechanical Board, David Lyons, uh, Teresa Jordan, Randy Freeman, to the Board of Electrical Appeals, Benjamin Wilson, Curtis Mitchell, Jason Barr, and Steve Vossman, to the Cedric County Juvenile Justice Board, uh, Jose Zambrano, to the SSMID Advisory Board, Joe Johnson, Chad McDaniel, AJ Waleski, uh, Joe Samir, Deborah Frazier, Natalie Gosh, uh, Randy Dorkison, that can't be right, Joel Kelly, and uh, Don Sherman. And of course, I will be providing this list to our clerk with that. I make a motion to accept the dozens upon dozens of appointments we just made. Second. Motion to accept the appointments has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will open the roll. Members cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Now we are back on announcements for the good of the body. I don't think there's anyone online watching anymore, but I think it's worth noting and saying that uh, we do have the state of the city that will be at Century 2. It is going to, I believe, start at 6 p.m. I think is when a program is going to start, and that is um, on Thursday. 
uh, and all are invited. We ask that you uh, email uh, the information's on our social media. We ask that you shoot, shoot us an email because we do have limited seating, of course. Uh, so we want to RS, uh, folks to RSVP, but we still do have seating, and we uh, would love uh, folks to come out and get an update on uh, the state of the city over the past year. Further announcements? Come on, guys. Uh, Council, <laughs> Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, not an announcement. Uh, just want to re-highlight what we talked about earlier. Um, both the Mayor and Councilmember Fry brought up about the citizen-led naming process. Just want to make sure I said it again and at some point we talk about what amending that looks like. Councilmember Ballard. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, really quick, I just want to remind everybody that this Saturday is the grand opening for the new Evergreen Resource Center. Um, there are tons of activities. Ribbon cutting is at 10 a.m. Um, and I believe the festivities are from 10 to 2. So food trucks and all kinds of different things. So hope to see you there. Further announcements? Seeing none. With that, I make a motion to adjourn. Just wanted you to know we're going to find another date for your budget hearing yeah. <laughs> or your budget retreat. Uh, we're, work, we're working with your calendars right now. <laughs> we're not going to be able to squeeze it in tonight? All right. So with that, there has been a motion to adjourn. I see that Michael, Councilmember Holheisel has jumped on. Uh, apparently extend the meeting. Go I was ahead, just curious. I, did we have an executive session today? No, not today. Right. Okay. Right. Hold your tongue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, we do not. I will second the adjournment. Thank God. All right. So motion has been seconded. Uh, clerk will open a roll. Members will cast their vote. <laughs> Who's the? Johnson, I'm sure. Oh. Have received six yay votes. Oh, excuse me. Seven yay votes now. The motion to adjourn uh, passes. Thank you all. Um, Councilmember Holheisel, take your name off the board, please. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Everyone, particularly staff, this was a tough meeting to get through, especially since we only had a one 10-minute break. So, onward, y'all.